I grew up in a small California desert tourist town called Joshua Tree, home of the Joshua Tree National Park. Those of us that are older call it the monument, as it was that before it was national parkdom. I was in my early 20s at the time, which was approximately 15 to 16 years ago, and I was the only one with a car and a license. Growing up in a small desert town leaves you with limited options for fun, and we would always make use of the park. Occasionally, maybe once a week or so, a group of us would pile into the station wagon with beer, smokes, and a mixtape, and drive through the park late at night. An empty road, so dark and quiet, other than the loud group of guys in a red Mercury driving fast from one entrance to the other, was just the kind of vibe we liked. Hours would go by each time as we drove along the desolate road and stopped at various rocks that we liked to climb on. I cannot overstate how desolate it was, how alone we felt. No other cars, no other lights, except the occasional lonely unmanned roadwork sign when warranted. That's exactly what we thought it was at first, but I'm getting ahead of myself. This trip started like every other, except maybe more of us than usual. Crammed in that car, windows down as I chain smoked and drove a good 20 miles an hour over the speed limit, gravel was spitting up as we were driving along having a great time. Shortly into the trip, I saw a light. A blue light. Possibly. It was miles and miles ahead. But that's the thing about the dark. Dark like you get out in the desert. The light can shine for miles. I remember saying something about having to slow down at some point ahead. Must be some kind of construction sign left up, I thought. Had to be a sign. The light hadn't moved. We continued for a few miles to one of our favorite stops and got out. We climbed for a while, maybe 45 minutes or so. We drank a little, we joked a lot, the norm. Then we piled back in and continued. To be very clear, this light never moved and we'd already been about an hour into our adventure. A question that I kept thinking, though, was why would a sign have a blue light? It's very unusual. But we still figured it was a sign because it was so stationary. As we approached the light, I started to slow down. I slowed more and more as we approached the source. It wasn't a sign. It wasn't a car. It wasn't even a UFO. Standing on the side of the road, facing toward us, unmoving for over an hour at this point, was a man. A pale white man with a white beard, dirty old miner clothing, and an old mining helmet. He was holding a pickaxe, period appropriate for a time long before the park was anything other than desert with some lonely mines. His light was giving off this unnatural and bright blue light. His face was blank, but he stared at us, directly at all of us. We sped up, and as we drove by faster, his head turned to keep pace with us as we left. His light was visible, unmoving once again, facing us the entire trip out. It never flickered. It never moved. He wasn't translucent. But the saying, as white as a ghost, applied to everything about him, other than his clothes, pickaxe, and light. I remember looking at the car clock shortly after passing him. It was almost exactly 1 a.m. when we passed. We never saw a car. We never saw a horse. We never saw any way for this old, sickly, pale miner to have gotten into the park. There was no reason for him to be there. Any means of transportation would have been visible, if nearby. Worst of all, we estimated that this miner had to have been standing there, facing us, for at least an hour and a half, never moving. The eeriest part, by far, 
was how still he'd been the whole time, waiting, perhaps, to see us. Not once did that light flicker, as if he looked down for a moment or turned his head. He just stood there, staring down a road at a car full of idiots. Even when we were parked, headlights off and climbing on some rocks while balancing a beer in hand, he stared from miles away into the darkness in our direction. We would have been no more than darkness to any human that far away without our headlights. We never saw him again. However, a few years ago, I decided to check to see if anybody had ever experienced something similar. I found one other story of a couple that saw him almost in the same place that we did, standing there staring down the road late at night. Then I found another story of some people who were camping out in the dark away from the standard campsites, and they saw the silhouette of what they thought was a miner walking by very close to them. I wish we would have stopped. Even if it would have been the most horrifying thing ever, I wish we would have stopped because I honestly believe there was a ghost of a dead miner out in that park. And I would know for sure today. I wouldn't have so many questions. There are plenty of unexplained things that I've encountered in my life. But the visage of the miner still sits fresh to this day. This may be a ramble of thoughts, but after recently hearing about missing 411 and the like, I finally felt like I could offer something that my family and I experienced a few years ago that to this day gives me a shiver. Hopefully you enjoy this story. I've been camping, solo backpacking, and hunting my whole life in Oregon and felt comfortable in the woods, and I have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago, my wife, daughter, and two German shepherds went camping north of Mount Jefferson, Oregon. We found our campsite to be the perfect setup for us and our two dogs, who need the privacy, since they're intimidating to other dog owners and can be loud when spooked. It wasn't an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off of a U.S. Forest Service road that had flat ground, full trees, and a fire pit. The first night, my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours. It was maybe two feet away from my wife and I's tent. We made the male German Shepherd sleep with her in her tent. His name is Guts. That whole first night, neither my wife or I could sleep. We both heard footsteps, and they were heavy. Not like typical forest critters scampering around in the night. I was well armed because I was paranoid from having read recently before departing about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say, both my wife and I had two pistols and I had my rifle with me. The dogs are great at detection and that's why I felt my daughter could sleep alone because Guts is completely fearless and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night, which I ultimately decided had to be a deer or maybe some elk. Day two, morning. We go for a walk down the road and maybe 300 feet away, we see this circle area. I see this abandoned road where a rusted gate post was covered in vegetation. The gate was missing. Something of a blue color caught my eye, and Guts immediately takes off running down this abandoned road. My heart begins to race, because I think if it's another family camping like us, he's going to get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death. So I chase after him as fast as I can, and the rest of the family follow. He stops after 20 feet into the road, and me yelling his name. But I've covered just enough distance to see that there's nobody there but there's something really off about the sight. I yell, hello, is anyone there? Sorry about the dog. I got no response. 
My curiosity gets the best of me and I have to see what the site conditions are. As I get closer, I just know something is wrong. It had all the necessities for a campsite, including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table, everything. But every single item had been completely destroyed, smashed, and torn apart from what appeared to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles, puzzled why anybody would leave all of their camping gear behind, including a fairly expensive REI tent. I figured, well, someone left in a hurry and the animals got to the rest. It had to be the only logical explanation, right? Still, a propane tank and a cooler were flattened by something, and it certainly wasn't snowpack with tree coverage in that spot. As the afternoon rolls in, my daughter and I are playing ball at the campsite, and my wife goes walking maybe 70 feet north to do her business. I don't have a direct line of sight on her, but all of a sudden I see Guts make a mad dash straight toward her. Normally he would always be with me unless he's called over and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention and I knew something weird was happening. So I ran over there and my wife starts jogging at me and I immediately draw my pistol. Guts has completely continued running into the forest another hundred feet before I call him and he stops. My other dog, Leia, who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader, is not taking point. I've had her for now seven years and this was the first time in her life that she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was full hair raised and attached to us at the hip. Again, anytime we hike or play, Leah is up front, bossing everything in her path pausing to see where we all are and then continuing on. I asked my wife what had happened and she said, I was trying to pee and all of a sudden I felt all my hair raise. I knew someone was watching me. Then I saw Guts running toward me and I just got up to move toward you. We spent 10 minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails, no broken branches. Nothing to point to what and where something might have gone. We decide that we're spending one more night since it's too late to pack up and drive, but we'll all be in the big tent together. Before we go to bed, I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used a mint can and some coins and keys from our truck and zip tied it so that anything hitting the rope gave a little jingle. Very unsophisticated, but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent, our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the exact same thing that I have done with a rope that was so old and brown I didn't see it at first. It was broken and only a few pieces remained, but sure enough, it was tied at roughly the same height, about eight to 10 inches off the ground and even had a few rusted washers on it. I immediately felt that someone had stayed here before and had put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree that I am, maybe 10 or 15 years ago based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia has now reached a new height, but I had to make sure that the girls felt we were safe. And at the time, the only thing I could think of was when the evening came I made them sit in the truck and I fired a clip of my 45 into the dirt as a signal to whatever was out there that we were armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that knows that we have two wolves and are armed and are too risky of a target so we can sleep safely. That night we heard no footsteps and the dogs never perked up and barked. We left early the next morning Fast forward to today and I watched the Amazon Missing 411 Hunted documentary and I noticed the clusters smack dab close to where we camped that weekend and a flood of dread rushes at me as I think of that mysterious abandoned campsite with the ripped tent and the smashed cooler and cooktop. We've been camping since and have enjoyed the beauty of the Pacific Northwest, but there was something there at that place that possibly took or harmed someone else 
less than 300 feet away from where we camped. We all thank our lucky stars that Guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon. As an update, Guts is no longer with us. He has journeyed into the next phase, and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about him and how he likely saved us that night. He was a warrior, and his new brother, Geronimo, has his spirit. I'm really just telling this story as a way to vent, because I'm in a situation where I really just feel stuck. I've tried just about everything, so I guess I'm just gonna start from the beginning. This story is two years in the making, so I'll try to be as thorough as possible. In 2019, I graduated with my master's degree and moved to a relatively rural area for my PhD. Thinking we'd make an investment, my dad and I purchased a house. The intent was to rent it out once I completed my PhD. This house was only a block away from a dive bar where my dad was able to make some pretty good friends. He introduced me to everyone and everyone let me know that I would be so happy in my new house because my next door neighbor was the absolute nicest guy you could ever meet. So we met the neighbor and he did seem nice enough. He suggested that we exchange numbers just in case I ever needed anything. And I thought that was a good idea. What's the worst that could happen? A few days later, my dad left to go back to his home in another state, and I was left to my own devices. Literally the day after he left, it started. My neighbor texted me while I was away and let me know that he left a gift for me on my front porch. In this text exchange, he started using pet names like Sweetie and Cutie. I went home and he had left a hand-painted feeding dish for my cats in my mailbox. At this point, I wasn't that alarmed. He was just being nice, I thought. The next day, he sent me more texts with pet names, and I took the opportunity to make sure he knew that I was not interested in anything romantic. He replied back with a rambling text about how all a person ever needs is friends and he would just like to be friends with me. After that, he would send me texts frequently, everything from inviting me fishing to telling me that he left more gifts on my porch. I would often not reply or I would tell him that I was busy. I didn't want to be rude, but I also had no interest in any sort of relationship with him other than being neighborly. One night, I got a text from the manager of the bar down the street, letting me know that if my neighbor knocked on my door, I shouldn't answer. She then told me that my neighbor had walked down to the bar with a hatchet and told the bartender he was hearing voices that got louder as he got closer to the bar. He threatened to kill someone with the hatchet if the voices didn't stop. They called the police and the police took the hatchet from him but made no arrest. The manager of the bar picked me up and I spent the night at her house. She told me that the police said my neighbor was heavy into meth. After that, I tried to keep my distance even more, but things got weirder. One day I went out to my car and I found a dead squirrel in my driveway. The squirrel had very clearly been run over and moved to right in front of my driver's side door. I just stepped over it, got in my car and left. When I returned home, the squirrel was gone. Shortly after, I received a text from my neighbor that said, someone or something put a dead squirrel in your driveway. Don't worry, I moved it for you. I felt like this was a weird way to word this, and I suspect he's the one who put the squirrel in the driveway. Another time, I walked out of my house to see that he had placed an unspent shotgun shell on the bricks in front of his yard. He came out and told me that it was to serve as a warning for anyone walking between our houses. For the next couple of months, I did my best to avoid him. He would text me, inviting me over, and I would come up with an excuse or just ignore him completely. I wanted to remain cordial since he was my neighbor, but it was getting very annoying and I was uncomfortable. He would text me as soon as I got home, telling me that he was watching me come and go from my house. On Halloween, 
he handcrafted a large casket and wrote, here lies the last son of a bitch who played mind games, November 2012. I mean, what the hell, right? All this time, he's still sending me texts. Eventually, I got really fed up and I just stopped responding completely. Less than two weeks after I stopped responding, he threw a 50 pound flower pot at my front door. You know, those big concrete planters? Yeah, one of those. I called the police who advised me to get a stalking no contact order. A few days later, I was watching TV when a notification popped up that my neighbor was trying to cast a video to my screen. I declined it, twice. I filed another report with the police. During this time, I started the process of getting a stalking no contact order. I saw three different victim advocates who all told me different things. I went out of town for a conference and during that time, someone had attempted to break into my home. I had an ADT security system, so while they didn't succeed, I was aware of the attempt. After the conference, I came home to the entire world shutting down because of the pandemic. I was trapped in my home 24 seven with my stalker neighbor next door. Luckily, court proceedings for protection orders didn't stop. Right before court, he sent me a text telling me that he was sorry for what he'd done that he could tell when he saw me outside that he made me uncomfortable. Then he went on to tell me that he could tell my hair had gotten longer and I looked beautiful. I went to court and provided all of the evidence I had, the timeline of everything that had ever happened, the texts he'd sent me asking if I wanted a massage, the texts I sent him telling him that the way he was speaking to me was inappropriate, the text saying he knew he made me uncomfortable, I told the judge that I suspected he had attempted to break into my house while I was out of town. The kicker is he didn't deny any of it. Actually, he told the judge that he took full accountability for everything. He said he was in recovery and was trying to turn over a new leaf. He didn't oppose to the protection order at all. So in March of 2020, I actually received the stalking no contact order. Everything was pretty quiet for a while. I mean, he did some weird things, but that's because he's a weird guy. It wasn't anything that made me fear for my safety. That is until he started using again. At this time, we found an unspent shotgun casing in my flower bed. It was consistent with the one he had previously used to send a warning. This occurred a couple of months after I started dating my boyfriend, and I suspect it was a warning to him. After this, and for a variety of reasons, my boyfriend moved in with me. He moved in pretty quickly, but everything turned out fine. We're still together and happy as can be in our relationship. New Year's 2021, I was awoken to yelling. I turned on my security cameras and I got footage of him sticking his head out his window, screaming obscenities at my bedroom window for seven full minutes. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when your stalker is screaming threats and obscenities, seven minutes is a lifetime. He called me a harlot. He said, happy effing new year. He said he was going to blow up his house with his gas line. I called the police who responded. They told me that because he never said my name, they can't prove it was a violation of the protection order. The officer said, and I quote, there's nothing illegal about yelling in your own house they left without even speaking to him. All I could do at this point was do my best to avoid him. I parked on the street because my driveway is pretty close to his front porch. I got used to living with my curtains drawn. I always made sure my cameras were charged, all five of them. Yes, because of him, I spent over a thousand dollars on cameras. Every inch of my yard is covered. Since then, he's been seen by me and by other neighbors talking to people who aren't even there going outside and screaming nonsense. Things like, I have Cheerios on my necklace and other things. I'm not even joking. This basically brings me to last week. In the morning, I was getting ready for the day when I heard screaming. Someone is gonna die over this sweatshirt. I turned on the cameras. I got footage of him walking around the alley behind my house screaming. Are you effing proud? How about I get my shotgun? I'll get everyone all fired up. I call the police. 
Once again, they didn't charge him with a violation of the protection order. Instead, they gave him an ordinance violation for disturbing the peace. The police told me that it seemed like he's off his meds again, and that was that. They left. Last night, I was awoken to hammering outside my window at 1 a.m. He was cutting down his privacy fence, horizontally. I called the police for a noise complaint and they just told him to stop. As I write this, he is outside continuing to horizontally cut down his privacy fence. That means the privacy fence only stands about three feet tall now. This was the one thing that made me feel relatively safe about hanging out in my own backyard, and now that's gone. All of this to say, I'm freaking tired. I just want to live in a house where I can be sure that my neighbor won't try to kill me, where I can feel confident that he's not going to try to break in. My boyfriend and I are trying to buy a house and to move, but it's difficult. I'm a PhD student, so I don't make very much money. Renting won't work because I have four cats. Plus my partner's cat and dog, although we have a place secured for them if necessary. And finding a place to rent with so many animals is difficult, if not impossible. I refuse to rehome them. So maybe it's partially my fault that I'm stuck in this situation. My dad has agreed to co-sign on another mortgage and I've gotten a second job. We should be able to save up enough money within a few months, but until then, I'm stuck. I just don't know what else to do. I'm tired, I'm angry, so I figured I would tell this story to vent. This isn't even everything that happened. It's just something to give you an idea of what's been going on. I'm just so exhausted. So when I was about 15 to 16, my neighbor asked my sister, we'll call her Cassie, and I if we could stay at her large sensory house while she was on a business trip for two weeks. Having been close to our neighbor and loved her dog and kitty, we said, of course. Cassie slept in the master bedroom, and I stayed in the second bedroom upstairs, which is connected to the attic. Now, Cassie and I always loved creepy stuff, always watching ghost adventures every Friday night, and we shared a lot of personal paranormal experiences together. We would always open the small attic door and mess around, saying we should go in there. I'm glad we never did. One night, Cassie stayed next door while I was at the neighbor's. I was sitting on the couch with the dog and kitty next to me, watching TV. My neighbor has one of those alarm systems where if you open an entrance door, a little beep goes off. I heard the beep and didn't really react, expecting to see my sister or mom walk in to come hang out. After a minute of waiting to hear something or for someone to come in, nothing happened. I called out for Cassie, but no answer. I messaged my mom and asked if it was her, but she wasn't even home. What scares me is the beep goes off for any door, meaning it could have been the front door that was maybe five feet from me on the other side of the wall. I brushed it off so I didn't get too scared and continued watching TV. Except after about 30 minutes, I started hearing footsteps above me, which would have been the master bedroom. I look to my left and see the dog. I look to my right and see the cat so it couldn't have been them. I turned the TV down and listened some more, and it sounded like the footsteps just paced back and forth. I had my sister come over and spend the night with me that night. The next day, I went to my neighbor's right after school, and I saw the basement door was open. Odd, but I closed it and went about my day. I started to clean her dining room and moved chairs away from the table to sweep underneath it. I remembered that the broom was upstairs, so I ran up really quickly to grab it. And as I came back down to the dining room, one of the chairs was pushed into the stairway entrance, blocking me in. Again, I just brushed it off and pushed it back. Except once I started sweeping, I felt something almost rush up behind me, 
So much so that I dropped the broom and ran my butt next door to my parents. The last few days consisted of random stuff moving, doors opening, and lights being on while we were at school. When my neighbor got back home, she paid us, thanked us, but then asked if anything weird had happened. I explained everything to her and she sort of laughed and said, yeah, that happens a lot. I didn't want to tell you girls beforehand in case it would deter you from staying there. She also mentioned I slept in the most haunted room in the house, the second bedroom upstairs with the attic. I brought up the basement door, but that's where her vibe changed. She said that's the one place in her house she won't mess with because it just scares her that much. Needless to say, after those two weeks, I sort of avoided going there for a few years, at least. Then after I graduated high school and moved out of my parents, my neighbor offered a room in her house for me to stay, and I said yes. So after I moved in, she let me stay in what she called the piano room, which had a piano in it that came with the house. She took the piano out and moved it into the garage so I actually had room for my stuff. For the first few nights, I definitely felt weird vibes. Maybe it was just because I am biased and had weird stuff happen to me years before, but I always believed I could send supernatural stuff ever since a young age. Basically, the vibes were off. I would wake up in the middle of the night, hearing what sounded like piano keys, but just enough to wake me up, and that was it. A few weeks later, I got myself a cat. I still have her to this day, and she's my sweet baby. Anyway, she would react and stare at things that were invisible to me. And while I know that cats can be weird, I know animals are sensitive to the paranormal, so I got freaked out any time she would meow or paw at something that wasn't there. While my neighbor still lived in and owned the house, she was constantly away on business trips or stayed at her mom's house. At this point, her dog passed away and she had her cat at her mom's house, which is why she had offered me a room, so the house wasn't always empty. I would hear so many strange noises at night coming from the master bedroom and in the kitchen. I remembered a weird one from the kitchen. It's sort of hard to make a good visual, but I'll try. So the basement door was actually next to the fridge, but the door was blocked by my neighbor's dishwasher so that nobody could get in or out unless the dishwasher was moved. I'm standing looking through the pantry, back facing the basement door, and in the reflection of the pantry door, I saw the basement door open up ever so slightly. I swear it felt like a horror movie. I whipped around, locked the basement door, and went to my room. My neighbor and I ended up having many conversations about the weird stuff. She didn't go into a lot of detail about her experiences, but my mom said she told her a few and was genuinely scared and that I shouldn't ask her anymore. I also just remembered another one from a few years before I moved in. I was out sitting by our sandbox in the backyard and I saw out of the corner of my eye, my neighbor go down to her driveway and take her garbage cans back up to the house. And you know that sound of a garbage can dragging along a gravel driveway? Distinct for sure, right? Anyway, I heard the sound stop right by her garage. I looked up to wave, but no one was there. I assumed maybe she had gone inside or something. But then when I went inside for the day, my mom said that my neighbor was going to be home late and asked if I could take her trash cans up to the house. I froze dead in my tracks. I swore up and down that I heard and saw someone doing it already. But my mom chalked it up to the heat of the summer getting to me. That's one I'll never forget. Another thing I should mention that always seemed eerie to me is that my neighbor constantly tried to sell the house. A family would buy it, but would move back out so quickly. This happened for years and years. The listing price wasn't expensive either, especially for being a big home in a decent area of town. As I got older, I now think that the aura of the house is just off and it made everyone move out. Eventually, she ended up selling it again, and the current residents have stayed there the longest. I 
I thought this might be a good place to discuss the strange goings-on in my woods with a larger audience. I'd like to preface this by saying that I am highly educated and scientific. I've never been a believer in the supernatural, Bigfoot, or things of that nature. That being said, I'm at a loss for the things my family has encountered on my property over the last seven years, and I would love to hear your suggestions. Here's my story. Seven years ago, my wife and I purchased a property and 11 acres of woods in a rural part of northeastern Minnesota. The woods were connected to larger acreage, fields and woods, of about 160 acres, and although sparsely populated, the land is near a fairly busy state highway. There are some housing developments in the area, but they're three to four miles away, and the majority of the land all around our property is farm, fields, woods, and rivers. It's remote, but with towns so close that I wouldn't call it wild by any means. I'm mentioning this because I've heard many Native American legends of things in the deep northern woods of Minnesota and Canada, but the area in which we live is not that. Rural, yes, but not the endless north woods. As I said earlier, I'm not a believer in the supernatural, and I've never been afraid of the woods or the outdoors, even though I have a healthy sense of caution and respect for large bears, moose, wolves, other potentially dangerous wildlife. I'm also an avid hunter and mountaineer, and I've experienced many nights in the wilderness. I've had numerous encounters with dangerous animals and situations, so I'm not easily spooked. Knowing my state of mind is important to the story, because many so-called supernatural encounters can be explained by people with an already high level of belief, anxiety, or fear. But that's not me. Well, that all changed after the first few weeks of moving in. The house and land had been abandoned for a couple of years due to foreclosure, so a lot of work needed to be done to get it back into shape. Wildlife had grown accustomed to no human presence, and Black Bear frequently roamed the yard at night, along with many other woodland creatures. We also found a lot of animal bones scattered throughout the woods, and coyotes were abundant. One night during those first few weeks, we had a rainstorm, and I was worried about a broken downspout potentially causing a basement leak. It was about 10 p.m., so I grabbed my headlamp and headed outside to deal with the situation. Behind our house is a fairly large swampy area that divides the woods. I had my back facing this area while fiddling with the downspout, when suddenly I had this intense feeling of dread. It's really hard to explain. It was like my body knew that something was back there. It was very unusual based on the circumstances. Never having felt this type of fear before, I tried to stay calm, and slowly I turned around to point my headlamp back toward the swamp. What I saw was something I still can't explain. Eyes. Numerous glowing reflecting eyes staring back at me. These were not eye reflections that you would typically see with a deer or other animal, since they were at different heights. And when I pointed my headlamp spot beam directly at where you would expect a head to be, there was nothing there but weeds and trees. When I turned the headlamp off, they were still there, and glowing as if a light was being shined. They did not move. They just stared through me. Needless to say, I bolted and ran as fast as I could back into the house and explained it away as deer or raccoons, even though I knew it couldn't really be either. Later that summer, I was sitting out on our screened-in porch that partially faces the swamp and connected woods to the west. It was approximately 11 p.m., when I began to hear what sounded like a bear fighting with or attacking a cow. Since there was a small farm to the southwest of my property, 
I assumed that perhaps a cow had wandered into the woods and been attacked by a bear. I really didn't know if this was something a bear would actually do, but it was my only guess based on the sounds I was hearing at the time. It was clearly some kind of roar, like a bear, but then followed by a frantic sounding cow mooing thing. This went on for over an hour and it was perhaps one of the most horrible sounds I have ever heard. Even though it sounded so strange and almost supernatural, it didn't frighten me since I had this rational explanation in my head. Even weirder, this same series of sounds happened again the next summer. These first few years, I never really investigated the area of the woods that the sounds came from since it wasn't my property. A couple of years later, I had the chance to purchase this area and 70 acres to the west, which consisted of the woods that connected to mine, as well as a few tilled fields, more woods, and ponds. As part of purchasing this land, I spent a great deal of time walking around on it to get a good understanding of its value and layout. As part of my walk, I was able to get a much better look at the farm set up to the south, the farm did have cows, as I suspected, but to my surprise, the area that they were kept in was a long distance from my house, much too far for me to hear them, and the fencing was also extremely well built and electrified. Looking at it, there was just no way a cow was wandering off from that farm. I didn't really think about this fact until recently. After acquiring the property, I proceeded to put up tree stands at various locations along with trail cams in order to prep for the upcoming deer hunting season. One spot was the hilly woods where I heard those sounds many years prior. Again, I did not connect these two things until now. The area was very odd, as whenever I hiked through there, I always saw some new strange thing. One time, my son and I found an old game snare tied to a tree with what looked to be dried blood on the tree bark. Another time, we found at least a hundred-year-old tree with a barbed wire fence completely spiraling the entire trunk, growing in and out of it at different intervals. I've also found many tree trunks with very large scratches or claw marks, not resembling an antler rub. Perhaps a bear? We'd almost always find dead animal bones in this area, and even this winter, I found a couple of deer legs snapped and picked clean. My sons have found numerous animal skulls there as well. As I was saying, I put a game camera in this area since I had seen tracks and sign, and I wanted to get a sense of the best places to hunt. I've placed one there many seasons and have yet to capture a single thing on it nothing. My son has posted there a couple of times for hunting season and has mentioned the strange sense of quiet. He's used to the forest sounds coming back after sitting still for long periods of time, but in this spot, there are never any sounds. He has mentioned hearing something walking around, though. Another incident occurred one hunting season when I was entering this area en route to another stand, when I saw a violent thrashing in the foliage, moving fast and crossing from right to left, but moving away from my position. I, of course, encounter deer and bear all the time, so I'm familiar with how they move when they're spooked. But this was something different. Whatever this thing was made a high-pitched trumpeting, combined with a bellowing sound that was like nothing I had ever heard from an animal outside of an elk, which we don't have in this area. It wasn't bounding, and there wasn't the raised white tail or large dark mass to indicate a deer or bear. There really didn't appear to be a body at all, just whipping and falling leaves and branches along with the deafening sounds. A year after this incident, my son went out hiking in the woods to try to find me since I was out doing some forest management. As he walked through this area, he thought he spotted me coming through the woods, fast, but quickly noticed that the walk and clothing were nothing like mine. 
Whoever it was was also a lot taller than me, and he described him as extremely thin. He said the person he saw didn't notice him at all, and seemed to be walking in a straight line, like they had tunnel vision. Seeing someone in this part of the woods and their direction of travel didn't make sense at all. There really wouldn't be a reason to be there, or to be headed that way, as it leads to deep ravines and an uncrossable river. After he found me and explained what he saw, I quickly went over to investigate to see if we had a trespasser. I hiked for quite a while, but I never found anything or anyone. If someone was there, they either got picked up on the road or vanished. That same year, my son had a friend over and they went for a late afternoon walk in the woods. As it began to get dark, they made their way back by walking on the edge of the field that's next to this area of the woods. As they passed, they said that they saw a figure a little ways off in the trees. Whatever it was, it was near one of the hills in this patch of forest, and it seemed to be making some kind of hand gestures. It began walking slowly toward them. When they called out, Hey, hello? He, or it, stopped still and said nothing. It was at this point the boy sensed something wasn't right and bolted back toward the house. They rushed into the house and told me what they saw. I, of course, laughed it off as their mind playing tricks on them. My son described the figure as very tall, like 10 to 15 feet, but with skinny arms, and his body was dark all over. Not hairy, per se, but dark. They even thought it was an animal at first because of the weird way that it looked. He couldn't really describe it very well, other than gaunt or skinny and strangely dark. Me being the curious and protective father I am, was worried about it being trespassers or druggies or something, so I told them I would go take a look. They brought me to the area and pointed to where it was standing, and I headed into the woods. Since it was winter and there was snow on the ground, I thought it would be quite easy to locate the tracks of whatever this was, and find out where it came from or where it went to. When I got to the spot, there wasn't a single track or disturbance in the snow, there was no way an animal or man could have been in that area and not left tracks. They had either made it up, or their minds had played tricks on them. Or so I thought. To this day, my son and his friend still swear that they saw it clear as day, and I can definitely attest that their fright was real. My wife has also experienced strange thrashing sounds and other feelings of dread or being watched in this part of the woods, and generally refuses to go over there anymore. All of this brings me to today, where I had a sudden realization that all of the strange sounds, sightings, bones, and events seemed to all be centered around this one area. I am just at a complete loss as to what it all means. It's all too strange to really bring this up and discuss it with people I know around here, but I wanted to share my story and see if anybody in this community might have any theories or ideas on what we might be dealing with here. I'll continue to investigate on my end, but I would love to know what you think. First off, I just want to say that this has been ongoing for years. We were literally 13 to 14 years old when stuff started going down. I'm 18 now and I have a lot more common sense, or I would like to think so. So please try and look at this from a 13 year old's perspective and try not to judge our actions too harshly. Also, this gives more context to the adults in our lives not believing us. I have ridden horses all my life, but have never kept them close to home. When the opportunity came to keep them five minutes down the road from my house and with my best friend's ponies, I was over the moon. 
Little did I know what was to take place over the following years. I will start this with a backstory. The horse I owned at the time came from a rescue that I volunteered at for five years. I was sitting down one day drinking a cup of tea with the owner of the rescue center, as we usually did after a hard day of mucking out fields and dragging barrels of hay to the 40 horses and donkeys that lived there, when she told me about a farm that was just down the road from my house in a little village that we'll call Trophy. She said that her father had built that farm and that he'd be turning in his grave if he found out who owns it now. Immediately, I was intrigued, so I pushed for more info. She told me that the man who owns it now is Elliot, who is a pig farmer. He murdered his brother-in-law, who was asking him to pay back 150000 in debt. Apparently, he ground him up in a meat grinder and fed him to the pigs. He then moved those pigs two to three hours away for long enough so that when the police eventually tracked them down, any DNA would have been long out of their system. He was actually charged for murder, but ended up being acquitted by the judge due to lack of evidence. What's ironic is that he moved those pigs without a moving permit, which is illegal and suspicious as hell because moving permits are not that hard to get a hold of. So in the end, he got punished for the illegal transport of livestock and not for murder. She told me that although he was eventually found not guilty, everyone in the village knew that he did it. Now that we've got that out of the way, we'll go back to the farm that I would be keeping my horses at. I had known the owners for a while, as I used to ride one of Annie's horses, my best friend that I mentioned earlier. Nothing particularly scary happened while I was riding for her, except once. We had decided to ride down a different trail that day, one that went past an unfamiliar farm. We didn't know who owned it and we weren't sure if they were friendly, so we proceeded with caution. All seemed fine as we were riding through the fields until the path came to a stop. There were gates and guard dogs in the way. We assumed we must have taken a wrong turn so instead of passing through the gates, we decided to carry on through the fields and around the outskirts of the farm. Unknowingly, we were now trespassing. The horses started to feel extremely uneasy beneath us. Mine would stop and shoot forward. Annie's started backing up into the brook that ran alongside us. Annie was hanging off hers, deciding whether to throw herself off before they both ended up in the ditch when I looked toward the farm. A man was stood completely still staring at us. I honestly thought he was a scarecrow at first and I had no idea how long he'd been there. He disappeared after about 30 seconds of making eye contact with me. For some reason, it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. There was something so unsettling about him. A few minutes later, we finally got the horses under control. That's when we heard gunshots behind us. Guns are illegal in my country. Only licensed owners can have them. The only reasonable explanation was that somebody was scaring birds off their crops or shooting bunnies and they hadn't seen us coming. We went into a flat out gallop. We were terrified because if they really didn't know we were there, we could have been caught by a stray bullet. All the while we were looking back to see if any birds flew to confirm our theory. They never did. That shot was meant for us, to warn us to stay away. Later that night, we looked back at the map to see where our wrong turn had been. The gates were where the trail carries on, but who in their right mind would go past a bunch of snarling guard dogs? At any point, that man could have redirected us. Shooting toward us was pretty psychopathic. We didn't tell anyone that day, as we thought we would get in trouble for trespassing but that's only where the problems began. When I brought Eric to the farm, things calmed down. There were odd scenarios that played out. Sheep were stolen, our ponies were let out, and a white pickup truck would be seen prowling the area often. But again, nothing too serious. That was until October of that year, when we would end up riding in the dark as the days were shorter in the winter. 
this particular evening, we were just goofing around and laughing like 14 year olds do when we heard an owl hooting. It was coming from one of the fields that the scary farmer owned. I began imitating it, joking around and not really expecting a reply, but it did reply. I found this hilarious and Annie began joining in. This carried on for about five minutes, which in hindsight was definitely a red flag. Any owl would have stopped replying within the first two or three calls, realizing that it wasn't speaking to one of its own. This one always replied and sounded louder every few calls. The longer this went on, the less owl-like this thing sounded. There was a moment where the noise almost sounded strangled and that was when Annie turned to me and said, that is not an owl. We realized that we had just led whoever was in that field right to us. They could now pinpoint exactly where we were. We turned our flashlights off and ducked, trying to be quiet, which is difficult when you have a 1200 pound animal squishing through the mud underneath you. We decided screw it and we galloped the rest of the field back to the farm. What we didn't realize was that the weight of the horses had left deep hoof marks in the soil, leading straight back to us. We were freaking out as we got back, but the adrenaline began to wear off and we ended up laughing about it while untacking the horses. We were about to lead them to the field when we heard the crunch of broken glass being stepped on from one of the old greenhouses opposite the stables. It was pitch black except for the dull light coming from behind us so we couldn't see anything. Immediately, we turned all the lights off, picked up a pocket knife that we used to cut hay bags open with and hid behind the stable door. We waited for 10 minutes with no phone signal to call the police, but didn't hear a thing, scared to even breathe in case it made too loud of a sound. I decided to be brave and make a dash for the horses who were tied up outside thinking that if I could jump onto one, I could get out of there quicker than whoever I might see. My eyes had adjusted to the darkness, so I could kind of see into the greenhouse. I shouted back to Annie, there's no one here, we're just being paranoid. Again, we laughed it off, trying to shake the terror that we had just experienced. It was only the next day that it became very, very real. The next morning was hot. The ground had baked and preserved the hoof prints we left from the previous night. However, there was something else in between them. Massive boot prints leading from the field we had heard the owl in all the way back to our farm. That was where the nickname Farmer Bigfoot came about. We told our parents, but they decided that we were just making drama out of paranoia and didn't believe us. And that was that. These boot prints started appearing a lot. We would skate on the ice where the fields flooded over in the winter. We noticed the prints a few times, stopping on the edge of the field where we would skate and then continuing in the opposite direction. We didn't ever see anyone watching us though. I lost Annie's phone in the fields one night. We went looking for them in the dark. The next morning, footprints. Farmer Bigfoot footprints. Our trail started getting blocked off. First, a huge tree. I'm talking a couple hundred years worth of trunk and branches was brought down onto our trail. It was then set on fire after we cut ourselves a path through it. When we weren't being deterred, they seemed to give up. Until 2018, when huge mounds of rubble started being dumped on our trail. This time, the trail was basically inaccessible. We spoke to a man who lives on the corner, who told us that he didn't want to name the farmer who was behind all of this, but that we should report it as it is illegally blocking a bridle path. We tried to report it, but the council won't go near him because he's too scary of a man. This guy told us that we were being watched and to be careful. Now this freaked us out. But us being stupid kids, we stayed from 5 p.m. till 9 p.m. clearing a path through the rubble. We also wrote F.U. in stones just for effect. 
The next day, there were three more piles of rubble and our path was covered over. We were at a loss, so we decided to talk to one of the neighboring farms that keeps horses. Without telling us a name, she said, you have to be careful messing with him. Around here, he's known as the man who makes people disappear. And that's when it clicked. This whole time, we'd been messing with Elliot. Farmer Bigfoot was Elliot. The same Elliot who fed his brother-in-law to the pigs. No wonder the council wouldn't go near him. Again, we tried to tell our family, but nothing came of it because they thought we were just being dramatic. Things continued happening. Bones were left on top of the rubble piles. Again, I'm guessing this was to scare us. A whole herd of sheep were stolen. The horses kept being let out. The owners of our farm would never say who they suspected, but we all knew who it was. The white pickup would turn up almost every week. We started leaving breadcrumbs on our Snapchat stories, thinking if it was weird enough for people to screenshot, we'd have multiple witnesses if anything happened to us. We told friends that if we disappeared, make the police look at Elliot. We were terrified. It quieted down after a while, until September of last year. We had just ridden, and I was leading both horses back to the field on my own. It's down a dirt track about a two-minute walk from the stables. I walked through the wooded area on the track, and immediately this smell hit me. It was vile, and I knew what it was immediately. Death. Literal, rotting flesh. It was enough to make you gag. I put the horses out and immediately ran back to Annie to come and investigate with me. The farm owner, we'll call him Ryan, overheard me and went into the house to grab a flashlight. Annie has a weak stomach, so as soon as the smell hit her, she threw up. It was so strong and so disgusting. Ryan soon joined us and said, someone has definitely been in here. That just added to our fear. Annie had recovered from her vomiting fiasco and rejoined us in a search. Ryan then said, I really don't know what we're going to find out here, girls, but I don't think it's going to be an animal. Our fear meter was now at the max, but morbid curiosity drove us forward. After an hour of searching, we decided to unstack a pile of wooden pallets. And that's when we saw bags of white flesh. They were clear Ziploc bags. Maggots crawled inside the bags, but there were no holes, implying that whatever meat was in there had been rotting for a good while before it was cut up and put in the bags. It was the most surreal experience. After more vomit from Annie, we decided to call it a day, reassured that Ryan would now deal with whatever the hell this was. We assumed that he would have called the police. We got home and cried to our parents, but again, they dismissed it. How the hell are we being dramatic when we just found chunks of rotting flesh in the woods? Anyway, Brian is hands down one of the loveliest men on the planet. We always felt safe around him. But what we found out days later was extremely questionable. He didn't call the police. He buried the meat. He didn't throw it out he buried it. What the fuck? We assume now that it's because he's old and vulnerable and he didn't want to get involved in anything that might put him or his family at risk. I still have no idea why Annie and I didn't phone the police. I'm guessing because we didn't want to cause trouble for Ryan. And no one else believed us, so why would the police? This is unfortunately, I guess, where my story concludes. I know, how unsatisfying. I'm no longer at the farm, but I still have horses. My parents now believe everything I told them. I think maybe because I've kept telling them for the past five years. In hindsight, they wonder why the hell they didn't move the horses out of there. Annie and I are still best friends, and we reminisce from time to time about how we were stalked by a murdering farmer for nearly three years. We will never know what that meat was, or if Elliot had anything to do with it, nor will we know why he followed us all those years 
trying to stop us from riding down our very own bridal path. But honestly, I'm not sure I want to know. This happened in Fresno County, November 2015, around 3 o'clock in the morning. I am a medic on an ALS unit, and I was working my normal 1900 shift. I was dispatched to a Code 3 cardiac arrest for a side hanging at around 3 o'clock. The call info only had that the patient was a 34-year-old male hanging and the sheriff and PD were on scene. The location was in the more desolate farm properties in the valley. No street lights, just dark, cold, and engulfed in dense fog during the winter. Rolling up, I see a man dressed head to toe in black. Black shoes, black pants, black long sleeve shirt, black beanie, I mean everything. He was in handcuffs, sitting on his hands, with two officers surrounding him, a female, and two very young kids by the house's front door. There was a broken rope noose on the ground underneath this oddly large, wicked-looking gray skeleton of a tree. The man had a small laceration and a rope burn on his neck, but he was very much alive. When looking at him, his eyes had little of the white and were black. He was quiet until I sat him on the ambulance gurney. The man was sobbing, trembling, and screaming that he can't take it anymore. As I was putting on our leather restraints on his wrists, I noticed that he had deep, horizontal cutting scars along both of his wrists. He was only trembling now, as if he was scared. All I could feel was cold. This man was clearly struggling and decided that night he would give up and end it all, leaving his wife or girlfriend and two children behind. So far, just a sad story, right? Well, this is where it gets freaky. I have never seen anything like this or heard of an experience like this ever before. Three years later, it still gives me the chills every time I think about it. On the way to the hospital, a few good miles down the road, we made a wrong turn, got a little lost and took a back road. He was quiet and trembling. He wasn't fighting the restraints. He almost seemed to feel safer in the back of the ambulance. While I concluded assessing, I got this bone cold shiver down my spine. I looked out the window and saw this house. Mind you, there are acres between every single house out here. Well, this house was like the others. It looked normal but next to it was this big tree or bush, and in a separate tone and position was this old four-door sedan, parked. The car looked out of place and was clearly separated from the house and the tree and bush. It was like the car was its own place. It was really odd and creepy. I can normally see into the car's cab and see the headrest of the driver's seat from afar, but this car was pitch black on the inside, almost as if the darkness was coming out of the windows because it was the deepest and darkest black I've ever seen. All I saw inside was this deep black and two neon dark blue eyes staring back at me, a little above where a tall and very large man's eyes would be in a car. Immediately, I felt the back of the ambulance get colder, and there were goosebumps on my skin. At first, I thought it was a security light, or a reflection in the car. But as we passed the house, the car turned on, pulled out, and started following us in the ambulance. The neon blue eyes were still there, and the cab was still as dark as ever. The car followed us miles to the highway still with those eyes staring, and the deepest, darkest black in the cab. Even with all the streetlights, I could not see into the car. 
I was almost mystified by this and nearly forgot about my patient. All I knew was that I did not feel welcomed by these dark blue neon eyes. It was almost threatening and felt as if it wanted my patient. We were on the highway and this car was still following us, over 20 miles now. The neon dark eyes were still there and I still couldn't see into the car. It got colder. I started to feel as if it noticed to be watching and was watching and focusing on me now instead of my patient. The car then sped up and pulled up next to the ambulance in the next lane while we were driving and looked directly at me. I was very literally five feet from this car and I could see nothing through the windows. All I could see were those eyes. But they weren't looking ahead. They were looking directly at me. In that moment, I said quietly but out loud, go away. You are not touching this man. This man is my patient. And if you want him, you'll have to come through me. I'm stronger than you, and I will not let you have him. After I said that, not even a moment later, the car and my ambulance split off. As one went onto one off ramp and the other, I don't know where it went. It was no longer cold in the ambulance and my patient was no longer gray in the cheeks, but now his cheeks were pink and normal. It wasn't until after the call and when we got the patient inside the hospital when I realized what had just happened. I truly feel that whatever those deep neon blue eyes belonged to was not human and that it wanted that man. I've never believed in the paranormal or demons or spirits or anything that wasn't hardcore science until this. I haven't had an encounter like that again and I hope I never do. I don't know if that man is still alive or what his outcome was, but all I know is what I experienced and saw that night. And it was horrifying. Last January, I was between jobs, and I had just recently had a daughter, who was at the time about five months old. My husband had been working through my pregnancy, but lost his job. We were living at my mom's house. I have an education in psychology and some experience as a counselor, so I was looking for the best I could get. But the best I could find right away was a job working as a paraprofessional in the special education department of an elementary school in a nearby suburb. The position was unique to the virus times, being that they needed someone to just sit around in the computer room while the kiddos did speech therapy over Zoom. Don't get me started on how terrible virtual speech therapy is. But anyway, my job was to just walk around the school back and forth between classrooms and the computer room, picking up kids, taking them to the Zoom room, sitting there for 30 minutes to an hour depending on the kid, taking them back, Picking up the next batch, I was overqualified, we'll say. Some days of the week were scheduled tightly, and other days of the week, I routinely had just two appointments. The school was a ginormous horseshoe shape, housing 700 elementary school children. I was located all the way at the far back on one side of the pre-K wing, it could take 15 minutes to walk all the way across the building and back when the kids I was picking up were in the older grades. Every day I would make this walk. In the middle of the school, across from the front office, I would always notice, and try to ignore, this strange rag doll with construction paper over its face, showcased in a display case. No bad vibes from it, but it just seemed out of place and random. It was there the entire five months that I worked there, never changing or having anything added to the case. Onward. Well, weird things happened in the computer room where I worked. The doors in the school use a key to lock from both the inside and outside. 
the doors do not lock automatically. You absolutely 100% have to manually lock them with a key. We are technically supposed to lock rooms when we leave them empty throughout the day, but no one ever did. So I just left my door unlocked when I went to get the kids. I would go get a kid in pre-K, so they'd literally be like two classrooms away, less than a minute to pick them up and walk back. My door would be locked by the time I returned. Sometimes I would be gone longer, but sometimes that's all it would take, just 60 seconds. I messed around with the door in my free time, trying to figure out how it was locking. The only conclusion I could come up with was that somebody was manually locking it when I was gone. I asked the janitor, because he was always around, and he said no, he'd never done it. I asked if it could lock itself, and he said no, it's not possible. So I came to the conclusion that somebody was messing with me, trying to teach me a lesson for not locking my door or something passive aggressively. Well, I don't play that, so I texted my boss, the vice principal, and I asked her to come talk to me when she had some time. I explained the situation to her, and she said that she was sure that nobody would ever do something like that. She also said she would have maintenance look at the door. That was the end of it. I come back after the weekend, and the door is broken, like off kilter on the hinges so it won't even shut all the way. I guess locking on its own won't be a problem anymore. The school did have security cameras in the halls. I wonder if they had any video of me pushing the doorknob down to check that it was unlocked before walking off, returning and having it being locked. Anyway, after that, there was a day where I went to get a kid out of his classroom in the pre-K wing by my office, but they switched up the schedule that day so the class wasn't in there. I shrugged it off, went to go pick up the other kid that also sat in there for this block, and then came back. There was another paraprofessional watching her own kids in the playroom nearby. So I asked her if she knew where the other class would be right now. She said she didn't know, but that she thought she had just seen a kid run in there. Maybe they were going in to use the bathroom. I said, okay, and I went back into the empty classroom. I have the other little kid with me at this point. There's a bathroom at the back of the class, but it's open. I walk over there, confused, and check the room. I even look behind the door, and there is no kid. I shrug my shoulders at the other little one and begin walking back toward the exit of the room. The bathroom door slams shut behind me. The other little kid jumped out of his skin. I tried to remain calm. The other paraprofessional nearby sees us out in the hallway, peering into the empty classroom presumably looking very puzzled and a little freaked out. She asks if the kid was in there. I said, no, but the door slammed behind me when I was walking out. I trailed off, looking down at the kiddo with me, who was looking back up at me with his eyes as wide as ever. Probably just the wind, I say. The other para kind of looks at me crazy, but shrugs it off and keeps about her business. The kid I was with, I kid you not, whispers, it was a ghost. And of course I say, no, no, I'm sure it was just because I messed with the door. You know, the obvious. Incident blows off, a couple of weeks pass by, and I'm in the empty computer room working on art for the walls. It's Wednesday, so it's an early day for pre-K, and all of the littles have gone home, while the real teachers are in a staff meeting. Someone knocks at my office door. Mind you, the door no longer shuts all the way, so I figure they don't want to barge in. I get up from my desk five feet away, and I open the door. Nobody is there. I look down the hallway, and nobody is there. I go sit back down, more annoyed than anything, and it happens again. At this point, I'm kind of fed up. I do practice witchcraft, and I've been doing so seriously for more than 16 years but I have no mediumship abilities or anything like that. I don't deal with ghosts and spirits in my practice, but that's the reason that I'm not scared at this point. I ask the janitor if the place is haunted. Man, this guy doesn't skip a beat. And he says, oh yeah, Rodney? 
Rodney, yeah, that little boy. He died in there. They named that doll across from the office after him, you know? What the heck? I asked my supervisor to confirm this and she said, Oh yeah, no one ever told you about Rodney, huh? I'm like, yeah, well that could have been in your ad. So at this point, I've become acquaintances with the school librarian. I ask her about what's going on. She says all kinds of people have had weird experiences. Night janitors have had things move on their own. One time, the top principal had an alarm go off, showing somebody was down in the basement at 3 a.m. But none of the outside doors had gone off and nobody was on video in the school at the time. I guess another time over spring break, the doll across from the office got ripped up in his display case, his head laying on the ground, which is why he has a construction paper on him now. No one on camera and nothing on the camera of the doll. Another staff member never believed in ghosts until she saw a little boy run into a classroom and then promptly disappear. That's about the extent of things that happened to me there, but I became fascinated. Some staff knew of the ghost, some had never heard anything about it. Mostly, staff who worked on my side of the building had experiences. The other side of the building seemed like a whole other world, totally normal, no ghosts over there. I became the weird ghost girl, I'm sure, always asking people if they'd seen anything. I am not the person to pretend like nothing's going on so as not to stir the pot, no way. Of course, I'd never let the kiddos hear me. No one other than the janitor ever seemed to have heard of anybody dying at the school. But people who had heard of the ghost or had experiences, did have their theories. One day, I asked a paraprofessional from another school in the district, because at a meeting, she mentioned that she herself had attended that elementary school where I worked. She didn't know anything about a ghost, but she did say that while she attended, a boy died at the school, in the wing, where I work. He had the flu and his heart gave out. It's actually a really very sad story that I'll just spare you, but she could corroborate. She said that they hung a drawing of him up in the hallway to commemorate him. Sure enough, among the plaques, there's this framed picture of a swimming hole and a mountain in memory of Ernie, not Rodney. I found a much better job and quit during summer vacation, but I did tell Ernie or Rodney or whoever in the silence of the computer room in the last week of school that if he wanted to, he could cross over, that he didn't have to be stuck at the school. I even had a sacred place out in the country where I believe the veil is thin and that he was welcome to come there with me. Like I said, no psychic abilities here, but I did drive out there on the last day and I put down a birdhouse for Ernie. I really hope that he's doing well. This is a true story of events that have taken place in my home. My brother-in-law tragically took his life in the barn of our family farm. Without going into detail, his death has caused a lot of friction, anger, and sadness for the family he left behind, with a big point of contention being his widow. She decided to have him cremated, but never laid his ashes to rest or had any memorial for him. Needless to say, my husband, the decedent's brother, has had many sleepless nights over this loss, including disturbing waking dreams. This tragedy took place in early March of 2020, and by late March, I began hearing and seeing some strange things. One early evening, while watching TV in our first floor family room, while my husband was upstairs and my mother-in-law was next door in her in-law apartment, I heard something that sounded like three faint knocks on the glass door that leads to our mudroom. I got up to see who was there, because it's common for other family members, such as my sister-in-law and her kids who live farther down on our farm, 
to come by unannounced. There was no one there. I thought it was strange, and I went upstairs to tell my husband that somebody stopped by, but they must have left before I answered the door. I thought about it a few times while I sat back down to watch TV, but I just dismissed the knocks. A few weeks later, my husband woke me up in the middle of the night, not knowingly, but by talking in his sleep and knocking on our headboard three times really loudly. As time has passed and I'm trying to recall what he said, the exact words escape me, but he said something about his brother. It was almost as though he was talking to him. I lightly shook my husband to wake him up and to tell him what he had just done. He didn't believe me or remember doing or saying anything. As I tried to go back to sleep, the three knocks stood out to me because I had heard three knocks that one evening. Only a few nights later, I was feeling a little sick and I decided to sleep in our guest bedroom downstairs so I wouldn't get my husband sick. With the virus going on and everything, I didn't want to take a chance. I usually fall asleep early, so I was asleep by 9.30 or 10 p.m. Around 11.30, something woke me up, and when I opened my eyes, I noticed something shining on the wall, a reflection from somewhere. I kept trying to focus my eyes, because sometimes the light from outside comes into that guest bedroom, and I wanted to understand what was making the reflection. I got up and opened the bedroom door a bit more. It was ajar already, and I saw a flickering coming from the dining room. I was startled and I got a bit scared at first, but I decided to go into the dining room to check it out. Two slim white candlesticks sit on our mantel on either side of the Picasso that hangs above the fireplace. One of those candles was on and flickering. This had never happened before, and I started to think that maybe this was a sign from my brother-in-law. My husband was still awake, so I went upstairs and told him what I had seen. He was interested to hear the story, thought about it for a second, but then just dismissed it. I did not go back to sleep downstairs that night. I slept in our own bed, sickness and all, because I was a little frightened. I told my mother-in-law the next day what had happened, and out of the blue, she recalled that a few days ago, she got a knock on her door around 3 a.m. She got up and opened the door because, as I said, it's not uncommon for one of the family members on our farm to do something like that. Although, 3 a.m. would have been uncommon, but still, no one was there. She didn't even think to tell anybody about it, but when I mentioned the knocking before, it gave her a bit of a chill. We talked for a bit about what the significance of three knocks could be. I said, three brothers, my husband, his middle brother, and the oldest, who was the one that was deceased. My brother-in-law also had three children. Days and weeks passed and nothing happened. Until one evening, down that hallway to the guest bedroom, the overhead light turned on by itself. I saw it turn on from my seat in the family room. This time, I didn't bother to tell my husband right away because he hadn't seemed to care much about these strange things that were happening. I got up and I turned the light off. Because I was thinking that it was my brother-in-law, I was no longer scared, but frustrated a bit because I didn't know why he would be doing these things for me to see when I wasn't even really related to him or all that close to him even though he lived right next door. The next night, I was getting ready for bed in the bathroom down that hallway and I noticed out of the corner of my eye a flickering. It was about 11.30 p.m. That same candle was flickering again. I went upstairs and woke up my husband to tell him. I took a video of it when I saw it this time and I showed him the video. He came downstairs to see for himself. He thought it was strange, but he didn't want to talk about it, and he went back to bed. Nothing happened again for a while, probably a month or two. Then, one afternoon when my husband and I were watching TV together in the family room, he said, Hun, 
The hallway light just turned on by itself. I said, see, I told you this stuff was happening. After that day, my husband began to think that his brother could be trying to contact us. He called his other brother and told him all of the strange things that had been happening. That brother dismissed everything and tried to talk my husband out of believing that it was their brother. My husband still believed it despite what his middle brother had said. I saw the hallway light turn on again by itself a few evenings later. I saw the candle flickering a few more times, one night around 8.30 p.m. and the other times around 11 or midnight. Over the past year, my husband woke up three times having these strange waking dreams of talking to his brother loudly in his sleep. Once, my husband sounded like he was having a full conversation with his deceased brother about his nephew passing his driving test. I recall that he said, he's going to fail? And you know what? The next day, our nephew did surprisingly fail his driver's test. The last occasion I heard a knocking on was January of last year. It sounded like it was coming from the laundry room, which is near that glass door where it all started. But this time, it was only one knock. In February of last year, I started to think that having the ashes and doing something to honor my husband's brother was a must to stop my husband from crying most days and everyone feeling overall terrible about the situation. My husband, his mom, and his brother all needed closure, as did I. I spoke with the family member who had control over the ashes and she was not agreeable to giving some to me to make a necklace with. You can make these necklaces with a tiny vessel for ashes. I wanted to do it for my husband's birthday. I was devastated. But to our surprise and comfort, two days before my husband's birthday, he was presented with a beautiful engraved vessel on a chain containing a tiny amount of the ashes to wear as a necklace. It wasn't a gravestone or funeral service, but we were all really relieved and happy to honor him and put some of the hard feelings to rest. I still wondered why I was the one who saw or heard most of these things, but I do feel sometimes that I'm a bit of an empath. I react so strongly to my feelings of sympathy and empathy for living things to the point where I cry, get physically ill, or can't sleep, thinking about these things that bother me that I can't control like people in pain or animals dying. I also thought about why most of these things were happening downstairs in that hallway and dining room. And then I remembered, the dining room used to be their parents' bedroom, and there used to be a different way to enter the staircase to the boys' bedroom upstairs, which was in that hallway area years ago. I think my brother-in-law's spirit was in our house, and in his peaceful spirit naivete, found his energy in places that seemed familiar as a child. His parents' room, the door where he'd come in for milking the cows, or trying to make his way upstairs. I never thought there was any evil or scary intent. I believe my brother-in-law knew some things were left undone, unsaid, and that his family was suffering from the unfair loss of him, and was trying to put our minds at ease. Once we got the bit of his ashes, everything felt much more at peace, and our minds are now at ease. I don't think we'll see or hear anything else, except maybe a little reminder of him from time to time. The hallway light still flickers every now and then. I studied at a university in Malaysia. I was away from my family, thousands of miles away. This started very early on when I moved there. Our campus was away from the city. As international students, we would be stretched thin for money to get to the main city. So most of my time was spent in my hostel room. One night, around seven or eight, two friends and I were coming in a borrowed car when the car suddenly stopped. We got out to see what was wrong. 
As soon as we got out, the car started on its own. We thought it must be some kind of mechanical issue. We didn't know anything, so we sat back in. The car stopped again. My friend kept turning the ignition, but it wouldn't budge. We decided to get out and push it. Like I said, we didn't know anything, and the car felt like it was a cement block. The friend driving got out to help, and as soon as he stepped out, the car started again, with the hazard lights flashing and the lights on full beam. We started freaking out. None of us wanted to sit in it now. We waited until a few cars passed, flagged one down, and asked the people to help us. Somehow, we got to campus and just went to our rooms that night. I couldn't sleep. I kept feeling like somebody was in the room with me, moving with me, looking at me. I kept looking up suddenly to catch someone, but there wasn't anyone there. In the morning, I asked the others, but they didn't experience anything. So I shrugged it off and come nightfall, I started to feel uneasy again. I played music in my room, but it didn't go anywhere. I showered, I prayed, I tried to sleep, but still the feeling doesn't go. My bed was up against a wall and I slept facing the wall. The whole night I could feel someone standing behind me, looking at me, willing to turn. This keeps going on for a few days, to the point that I play a TV show in the background and I would wake up after five or six episodes had passed. No matter what I did, the presence didn't go. And then, something happened. One night, I'm struggling to sleep, when I feel something or someone pulling my sheet away. I scramble to hold it, but my body is paralyzed. I can only blink my eyes. I lie there as the whole sheet is pulled off of me, trying to recite something, but then being unable to. That's when the whispering started, like multiple people whispering in slow, angry whispers. I couldn't make out anything. I even wet the bed and then lay there paralyzed for I don't know how long. My phone's alarm went off and I could finally move. This became regular. Then I would have episodes of paralysis and hear these whispers. My grades declined and I was exhausted. One evening, I just picked up my stuff and went to sleep in my friend's room, who was almost always high. He looked at me as I came in and said, who are the other guys? There was no one. I called him a bloody stoner, rolled up and went to sleep. The next morning I wake up for class and he's getting ready too. And he brings it up again. He says, your new friends are weird. They just sat there all night beside you, staring at you, didn't even respond to me. I just looked at him and it did not look like he was joking. At this point he was sober too. I quietly take my classes and call my dad afterwards. He tells me to take one of those small ayatul kursis, some lines from the Quran, and stick it outside my door. So I do that. And that's when the shit hits the fan. I don't want to change my room because it's a long process. I'm angry now because this is my space being invaded. I have the ayatul kursi and I've lost my patience. That night, I sleep soundly until there's a knock on my door. I'm still not sure if everything that happened was real or if I was in a trance. I got up and opened the door and there's a man standing there. I'm not sure if he was old or not. He was very tall with his entire body covered in tattoos. He had no eyes. I'm not sure what they were. He just points to the paper stuck above my door and makes this guttural sound that rocks my literal bones. He keeps pointing at it with this weird scream coming from him. I don't know if anyone else heard it. If it was a dream or what really happened, I just know that I removed the paper and he came in. I remember waking up the next morning in my bed, angry at myself. I started finding these small things in my room, dead birds, old bones of small animals, broken combs, 
sometimes burnt paper. I would just throw it out because now it was a fight with them. Then one night, I decided to stop sleeping facing the bed. This is my room, my space, and I'm not letting them bully me anymore. So loudly I say in my native tongue, something that means do whatever you can, I'm not going anywhere else. I pray and I go to sleep. I wake up in the middle of the night with all of my room lights on and I see something that I will never forget. It's the same man offering a Muslim prayer in my room in the wrong direction. He's doing all the same motions. I can hear the sounds, but he's facing the wrong way. I don't know how long I lay there, barely able to breathe and unable to scream until the man sitting there turned around and stretched his arms toward me. But they weren't arms. They were these long black snake-like looking things like they could strangle me in a few seconds. In my heart, all this time I was reciting something. I could feel my tears on my pillow and I lost all memory after that. I woke up in the morning with scratch marks all over my body, like a bunch of cats had been let loose on me. My bed sheet smelt like old blood. That was it for me. I couldn't go on like this anymore. So I contacted my cousin who put me through to somebody I could talk to. That night, I decided to go sleep in a mosque. It's common in Malaysia for guys to wear a, I think he called it a dhoti, but I'm not sure, over shorts if you're praying. I prayed, I used mine as a sheet, and I went to sleep in the mosque's courtyard. It's hard to believe the next part, but I'll leave that up to you. I woke up in the same exact place that our car had gone bust that first night. I woke up to these strangers, shaking me awake, asking me if I was okay. Someone suggested calling the police. Some turned out to be my seniors, and I got a ride back to the hostel with them. After that, I started sleeping with different friends until the scholar was put through to me. He came and spent a few hours in my room, and after asking around a bit, we learned that the student before me who lived there used to practice black magic in the room. He even used to write with his own blood on the walls and administration just painted a new coat on top of it. I don't know what happened to that room or who got it. I was shifted to another one, quietly, on the condition that I would never speak about it. And that was it. No more sleep paralysis or whispers or visits or scratches or waking up in new places or the smell of blood. I still have dreams about it. And to this day, I don't look into mirrors for too long. This happened in mine and my husband's first house several months after our oldest son was born. We had lived in the house for almost four years before he was born, but had never experienced anything like this before. It's actually the only time I've ever experienced something that I would consider to be paranormal. My husband claims his grandma's home was haunted growing up. Either way, this experience shook the both of us in a whole new way. We had finally decided to move our son into his nursery, for the first six to seven months, he had slept in our room in his own bassinet, but we decided it was time to get him adjusted to his crib and his room. So we gathered the strength and made it happen. We had dug out the baby monitor that my mom had gotten us months prior to set up security, if you will. Granted, this was 1997, so they weren't anything fancy, but enough to help us feel better about our choice to move our son into his room. In addition to the baby monitors, we had put up one of those moving night lights in his room, the ones where the lampshade would project the pictures onto the wall, moving ever so slowly. This one was made up of friendly sea creatures, and our son loved it. The first night that we actually slept separately from our son, we both woke up at the same time. My husband looked at me, and I looked at him, and then we listened to the monitor for a minute, but it was quiet. 
It didn't appear that our son had woken us up. So, what had happened? I almost just went back to sleep, calling it jitters. But my husband sort of grabbed my arm, not hard, but firm, and he whispered, What the hell? while looking straight ahead. Following his gaze, I could see that each of the four drawers to our dresser were pulled open. I turned on the light and we both hopped out of bed. It was around 2 a.m. and we weren't sure what was going on, so we didn't speak with our mouths, just with our eyes. My husband grabbed his military knife and motioned for me to follow him. I did and he handed me another smaller knife, which I held tightly, continuing to follow him, me against the wall, him in front of me, walking toward the baby's room and leaving no blind spots as we did. When we got to the room, my husband opened the door swiftly and with force, but quietly. It was just our son, fast asleep, no one else. My husband tells me to stay with the baby while he checks the house. I ask him to please call 911 and he tells me that he will as soon as he gets downstairs. He tells me he's going to shut the door so, when he does, I set the knife down, pick up my son, and sit. I was just rocking him, back and forth, staring off at the fun sea creatures dancing all over the walls. It was comforting. After sitting or rocking for a while, I started to feel a bit warmer. Not like a fever, but best described as how it feels when somebody sits really close to you. You can feel their body heat. While feeling this, I'm looking down at my son, debating if he looks or feels warm, but he looks comfortable, still sleeping ever so soundly. Suddenly, a mitten on my son's left hand flies off in a way that it might if someone had ripped it off of him hastily. He wasn't moving his hands, and this hadn't woken him up, but it certainly got me up. I was now standing, breathing a bit heavier, and wondering where the heck my husband was. Moments later, my husband opens the door. It scared me at first. I just really wanted the sound of footsteps approaching to be his footsteps. When they were indeed, I was so relieved and I hugged him. And I told him rapidly that we had to get out of this room. He wasn't whispering any longer, telling me, okay, let's go back to our room or even downstairs. He started to shuffle us out saying the police were going to send someone by. He said he checked everywhere in the house. No one could possibly be inside. He seemed to feel better, but I was still afraid. We made our way to the family room, which was on the first floor, center of the house, really. You could see the whole area from the top of the stairs and from two of the bedroom doorways, our room and the baby's room. From where I was sitting, I could see the nightlight reflecting off my son's walls. So I watched them again, this time, I was wary of the room, though. I couldn't help but wonder what the heck I had actually experienced up there. But I just tried to keep my cool while waiting for the police. My husband asked me what I was staring at. I said, our son's room. Then I told him what I had felt in there. At first he sort of smiled, but then in all sincerity he said, maybe it's a ghost. I said, excuse me? He didn't elaborate, probably because of the loud knock on the front door. The police were here now, waiting for one of us to let them in. Long story short, there was no guy, no person, no nothing, at least not in our house, and not the surrounding area the officers had checked. It was a quiet night in our town. I wasn't having it though, at least not that night. I told my husband we should go get a hotel have our parents and such search the place again tomorrow. He said he would stay at the house, but that he would send my son and I to his mom's house. By the next night, maybe it was even two nights that had passed, my husband had convinced me to come home. We were on the phone, and he told me that the home was fine. He had decided that we had just overreacted. For a bit, I guess I agreed with him. When he picked us up from his mom's house later that day, I asked him what he thought about the mitten incident, the one that flew off our son's hand. He just smiled again, and I asked what he was smiling about. He just thought I had nothing to worry about. He said, 
Think of it like a guardian angel or something. No harm has come of this thing, right? I told him he couldn't be serious. That if he thought our house was haunted, we should go, now, back to his mom's. Then we, somehow, just sort of found a way to laugh it all off. By the time we pulled into our driveway, I was very excited to sleep in our bed, happy to be home, and I actually felt sort of silly for making such a fuss. My husband put our son down in his room, and then joined me on the couch with the baby monitor. I remember laying there, sort of nodding off as we watched some late night TV. Above the TV are the two bedroom doors. My peripherals are on my son's bedroom doorway, but I'm only keeping it there in the event something about it changes. I was nodding in and out for a bit, before I'm wide awake, sitting straight up. My husband says something like, Whoa, what's wrong? But I just turn his head to the upstairs, and he sees the same thing that I am. The fun sea creature light is spinning, rapidly, or at least it's projecting as though it is. I tell my husband to go turn it off. Just as I do, we hear the sound of something falling. We know it came from our son's room, because we heard it externally, but also through the baby monitor. He hopped up and ran upstairs. He heads into the room and he's gone for a minute. When he comes back out, the baby is in his arms and also the diaper bag. He calmly asks me to grab our bags, which were still by the door, and to follow him to the car. We get settled and he tells me that he's running in just to grab some of his overnight stuff and to lock the doors. Then he's gone. So I do. I lock the doors and turn the headlights on, just wanting to illuminate all of that darkness. My husband dashes outside, he's got a handful of stuff, and without a word, he buckles in and starts to back out of the driveway. We start heading back toward his mom's house. I hadn't even asked what had happened up to this point, but about five minutes in, I had to know. He was checking to see if the baby was asleep, as though he could actually understand what we were about to talk about. It was sweet, but also a little unsettling, because he, my not-scared-of-anything husband, was terrified. He said, we're gonna stay with mom for a minute and then figure the rest out. Maybe sell the damn place, it's too small anyway. Sell the house? He just looked uncomfortable, trying to get more out of him, but having a hard time with it. He finally said, it opened up his drawers. When I went up there, the light was going nuts and his drawers, they were wide open. We can't stay there. And so we didn't. Sure, we got our stuff, but we never stayed there and we didn't bring our son there anymore. In the end, we had the place blessed, handed over the keys and haven't really looked back other than to talk about remember when, which isn't exactly frequent. Basically, I don't miss that house, not even a little bit. Back in 2013, when I was 28, I was traveling through Jujuy, a remote northwestern province of Argentina for school. We traveled through a few remote villages along the Andes Basin, which consisted of crazy dramatic rock formations. The first village was called Purmamarca. The place we stayed at did not have electricity. It only had cold running water and no Wi-Fi. I must admit it was pretty awesome living off the grid and actually conversing with friends and telling stories by the fire. Now, fast forward two days. We arrive at the village of Tilkara, a couple hours north. The hostel we stayed at was quite a bit more modern, yet still pretty rustic. Tilkara was yet another beautiful dust bowl of a village, surrounded by colorful dramatic mountains and alien geography. When I say alien geography, I literally felt like we were on another planet while driving through it. This place did have TV, Wi-Fi, and warm water. We did a lot of exploring that day, hung out with llamas, visited ruins, things like that. 
That night, we had a traditional Argentine asado with our group around the fire in the common area, outside. My roommates, two girls from Illinois and one girl from Germany, all turned in early for the night at around 11. I stayed out for about an hour afterward, hanging out with my teachers and talking. They were drinking Fernet, a nasty, minty Argentine drink that I had tried previously and will never touch again. The following day was going to be a long one, since we were hiking up a mountain, so I did not partake in libations. I started getting tired, so I decided to turn in as well. My roommates were all laying down watching TV, and as soon as I got in, I got ready for bed. Shortly after, we all decided to call it a night. I fell right asleep. Later, I randomly woke up because I had to pee, and I checked my phone. It was 5.37 a.m. As I set my phone back on the nightstand, I suddenly felt something staring at me from behind. The pull of the gaze was so strong I could feel it through the blanket. It was almost like a magnetic energy. I could feel anger and negativity emanating from it. I felt frozen in place for a few seconds. I managed to turn and peek over the blanket to see a dark figure standing at the right corner of the end of my bed. The figure was about six feet tall with really broad shoulders. I couldn't make out any distinguishable features like eyes, etc. Its body was black but seemed to consist of static. The static was like that of a TV channel where the signal is out, black and dark gray instead of black and white, and it moved a lot slower. It just stood there, not budging at all. I laid there for what seemed like an eternity, frozen, too scared to move. Suddenly, I felt the same pull from my left side. I turned, and I saw a similar figure, but slightly shorter, standing at the foot of the German girl's bed. The one and only small window in our room was above our bed, casting light straight ahead so I know it was not a trick of the light. Multiple times I have thought maybe I was dreaming, but I couldn't have felt more awake. If I was dreaming, it was the most realistic lucid dream I have ever had. I laid there staring at both figures, casting my gaze from left to right, until I did what any normal person would try to do to protect themselves from scary things at night. I pulled the covers over my head. I'm not sure why I was not more proactive, considering the fact that there were two strange beings in the room, but I didn't budge. I waited for what seemed like another eternity. The entire time I had to pee like a racehorse, eventually the presence of whatever beings were in the room gradually faded, and the embarrassment of possibly peeing the bed forced me to peek up from the covers to see if the figures were still there. They were gone. I waited for a few seconds to see if they were somewhere else in the room, but when I didn't see anything, I got up, raced to the bathroom, and turned on the light. I peed while peeking my head out the door to make sure nothing was there, and afterward, I ran to the bed, hid under the covers, and fell asleep with the light still on. The next day, I woke up and still considered that maybe the entire thing was just a weird, bad dream. The two girls in the bed across from me asked why the light was left on in the bathroom, and I proceeded to tell them what had happened. The German girl was taking a shower at the time. Their response was to laugh at me and jokingly ask me what kind of drugs I was on and how much I had to drink. Granted, I was not much of a drinker. I hadn't had anything to drink that night, but I could see how they came to that conclusion, considering that I was hanging out a little later with people who were drinking. After the German girl got out of the shower, the other two girls, who were still laughing at me, told her about how I had seen a ghost last night. Her face instantly drained of color. She looked over at me and said, you saw them too? I asked her what she had seen and where and she said that she saw two guys in our room and pointed out the exact locations where I had seen them. 
I asked her what she did, and she said that she saw them, and then tried to just go back to sleep because she was so scared. The general consensus of the girls in our room was that the two men in our group creepily came into our room last night, but I didn't believe that. The body shapes and sizes were not consistent to either of them, and I just couldn't see them doing that in general, but who knows. I told my teachers and the hostel owner of my experiences. The teachers also laughed, but the hostel owner brushed it off and said that it was quite normal and that people saw things there all the time. Just another night in Tilkara. Apparently, that region is quite popular for UFOs and is also on an indigenous burial ground. So, they may have been aliens or angry native spirits or something else. It wasn't so much that I could see these beings, but I could feel them. Their presence was one of the strongest things I've ever felt in my life. I felt them before I saw them. If I was ever skeptical of otherworldly beings before, this experience completely changed my mind. Whatever they were, I have zero doubt that they were something from beyond. Beyond where? I have no idea. What's really weird is that when I returned to the United States, I found myself often waking up at 5.37 a.m., multiple times a week. I had never had this happen before that. To this day, it still happens. I write in a daily journal, and I have now typed out this experience from 2017 to 2019. I hope you enjoy it. So in November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace, and stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but for the sake of the story, I'll skip that. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going, a week after I left the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity ward, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think too much about it. However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the entire week that I was there, and for about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior with no incidents, but onward from week two of coming home, the following happened, based on my journal entries. November 22nd of 2017. Whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th. The first unusual cold spot found. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment because the heater was there, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room. It was never cold there again. December 11th. The baby mobile's battery drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries lasted a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours was eventually moved to my mother's house, where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter starts to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. 
I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home, everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th, while outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses that from day one of being there, she felt like someone was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th, we decided to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away, in an upright position. This is when my husband believed me about what I said happened while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues. October 29th. A doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it or leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard no one in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal. Basically, the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th, our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealing with hauntings, so she replies with, hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th, our friend L asks to use our apartment to host a party for an MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One who has never stepped foot in our apartment prior commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when nobody was in there. June 29th, my mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed the cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was over. The house felt still, like it was frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof outside our stairs. Context, I lived in a multifamily home. The stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in Old House, I told her why and that we were not moving back there. She replied with, Good, Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. I used to work as a guide and then as a backup, and even as a field director for several wilderness therapy programs for troubled kids in Arizona, Utah, and Idaho. They were all good jobs, but where I worked in Utah was in the West Desert, south of Dugway. 
It's possibly the ugliest and creepiest part of Utah. Tons of sketchy stuff happened to us out there. This story happened in 2005. The groups were camped in a really nice area for that part of the desert. It was called Indian Canyon. This spot was so nice, in fact, that in the late 1800s or 1900s, some enterprising pioneer family had built themselves a little homestead with a one-room cabin and a small barn and a cedar pole fence around the perimeter of that little farm. All of that, of course, now was a crumbling rotten ruin. The cabin, it seemed, had burned down well over 50 years ago, and what remained of the barn was poking out of the grass in two or three foot shards of gray wood scattered all over the nearby vicinity. This week, I was also camped in Indian Canyon, but farther down the road. I was manning the infield emergency response vehicle, or the ERV, better known as backup, a new position that I helped invent when I took a list of things that had gone wrong in the field to the directors and explained that because of the horrible response time and spotty satellite phone service, the only reason we weren't shut down or the people weren't dead was because we were lucky, not because we were prepared or efficient at responding to emergencies. Now we had radios and someone listening to them 24 seven, never more than a few minutes away with a vehicle. That's how it worked in theory, anyway. One of the boys' groups was camped at the mouth of the canyon in the foothills, about two miles away from me. The other, just a mile beyond them. The girls were close, too. I was camped somewhere in the middle of the canyon on top of a small ridge that had a little jeep track side road branching off of the main dirt road running up the canyon. And the girls were just a couple of ridges over, maybe a mile away, though to drive to them might have to go back out on the main road and take a different jeep trail up to their spot, maybe a five mile trip. I was about a mile and a half below the staff training group that was being held by my then wife, Jessica. There were going to be several groups of parents coming out to visit their kids later in the week. So both the boys groups and the girls groups, all on that side of the mountain, had all elected to stay put for a few days and work on building backpacks and gathering fire sets and a lot of other primitive skills. The training group had been in the field for almost a week and they were getting ready to split up and go join the student groups for the last several days of their training. This left me with less to do than normal. I didn't have to find new sites for groups or drop anyone's water or food. Everyone was well taken care of and no one was moving for several days. I decided to build a sweat lodge next to the creek, up near where the new staff were camped. I found the perfect spot, well out of sight of the group, on a little smooth sandbar right by the water. I got to work. I harvested some long willow saplings that were bendable enough to weave a frame with, and arranged them in a ten-foot circle digging down a foot and a half for each one to anchor it into the sand. I bent them into a dome at least four feet high and 10 feet across and wove the branches together with supporting crossbars until I had a structure that I probably could have stood on without breaking. I walked down to the truck, which I had hidden in some pine trees a quarter of a mile away and hauled a large bin of tarps and cowhides and plastic sheeting, along with my fire set and some other gear, up to the lodge. As I was walking back to the creek, I remember feeling like someone was following me, but when I stopped to look, I couldn't see or hear anything. It was a beautiful day for July. The morning had started out with some high, wispy cloud cover, but that had long since burned off and the noon sun was high overhead. It wasn't yet too hot, however. I was high enough in the mountains that the oppressive heat that I knew was slowly baking the kids' groups in the desert below wouldn't reach me for another couple of hours. I set to work placing hides first on my little domed frame. I covered those with some tarps and plastic sheeting and secured it all so that I had as close to an airtight and waterproof shelter as possible, 
with only a small arched opening for a door. I secured an old military poncho over the door so that once hot rocks had been placed inside of it, it could be sealed shut and the sweat ceremony could take place. I wanted it as hot as possible. There wouldn't be any children involved in this one, so we could go as hot as we wanted. I took the extra time around the base of the lodge to bury all the edges of the coverings deep in the sand. This was as sturdy a shelter structure as I had ever built. It was nice. I spent a good hour gathering sage and juniper and covered the floor of the lodge with a thick padding of the fragrant plants. I did this in part so that it was a soft place to sit for an extended time. But mostly I did it because I was intending to invite the new staff down to do a sweat ceremony later to help some of them prepare to meet actual students for the first time. And frankly, a group of unwashed men and women who hadn't showered in a week in July, all crammed inside a sweltering homemade dome tent sweating buckets, is a smell that should not be endured without as much sage and juniper as possible. If it was really bad, which it was likely to be, I would rub some of it into my shirt and then pull it up over my nose and breathe through that. I went hunting for lava rock. I found an outcropping of some small rounded boulders, perfect for heating on a bonfire and then rolling into the lodge. And I proceeded to gather three onto a tarp. It was heavy, almost too heavy for me to sling over my back and carry but I managed to make it back to the fire pit I had dug with all three. I left them there and went to gather more. I made this a smaller load because it's not like I was in a hurry. I could take more trips. When I got back to the fire pit, one of my rocks was gone. I just stared at the small depression in the sand where I had placed it minutes before and then looked around for signs that someone Possibly one of the staff from the group had come and taken it. No tracks. I looked around again and spotted it by the edge of the creek, 20 feet away. I had that feeling again, like I was being watched, but I couldn't see anyone in the trees. I walked over and retrieved my stone, the heaviest one I had carried, and put it back with the others. Maybe it had rolled there? through flat, soft, dry sand? Unlikely. I gathered a bunch more rocks and none of them went missing. And then I built a fire. As I worked, that weird feeling came back. Only this time it felt more ominous, like it was mad at me for being there. I stood up, determined to walk out into the woods and find whoever it was. The radio, which I kept on and strapped to my belt, had been silent all day, but suddenly it crackled to life. Brian, in the boys' group, was doing evening check-in a little early so that they could do their day hike without having to stop and contact me. After we talked, I felt more normal again. I cooked some rice and beans for dinner, and as they cooled off, I piled my stones probably 30 of them, into a cairn in the center of the fire, and then just piled on all the dry wood and brush I could gather. I took my knife out of my sheath, because that feeling was back, still worse this time. As soon as my fire became almost irresponsibly large, I saw someone moving fast through the trees, straight toward me. I tensed, then relaxed. Will, a seasoned staff working in the training group with Jessica and Katie came running down the creek. He stopped when he saw me and my sweat lodge and my 10 foot tall flames and broke into a huge grin. I thought it was a wildfire, he said. Some of the new girls are panicking. Nope, just an epic sweat lodge, I said. I was planning on inviting you all down for it when you called in but I'll consider this your check-in. If you guys want to, you're all invited to come sweat. It'll be ready in about half an hour. Perfect, he said. They're just finishing up dinner. I'll go let Katie in just now and we'll be down. He turned to walk away. Hey, Will? He turned back around. 
Did you guys lose track of any of the new guys today? Or did one of you three come down this way? He thought for a moment and said, No, I don't think so. Why? That's nothing, I said. I, I just thought someone might have come looking for me when I was out gathering rocks. Some of my stuff was in a different place than I remember leaving it. That's all. He looked at me with an odd expression. Weird, he said finally. I'll ask everyone, but we've kept pretty busy today, so I don't know when someone would have had time to come down this far. It's okay, I said. Don't stress it, I was just wondering. See you in a few minutes. The other two kids groups radioed me shortly after Will walked off. It was more like an hour before the staff group finally trudged into my sandy clearing. Some of them looked excited, and some of them looked confused at my dome of plastic and sand, and at my pile of glowing red boulders on the still blazing fire, and at the stack of blue five-gallon water jugs that I'd hauled down from the truck for the experience. We thought we were going to die in a forest fire, one of the new girls, Carol Sue, said accusingly. She looked extra smelly. I pulled some essential oils out of my possibles bag. A possibles bag is just a type of leather purse we make on the trail. We call it that to disguise the fact that we're grown men who carry around purses. Put some of this on your wrists and neck. It will help you keep a good frame of mind in the sweat. How many of you have done this before? A handful of them raised their hands. Inside of the circle of the lodge is a sacred place. We will do four sessions, going longer and longer each time. We will dedicate each session to a different part of our lives, our histories, our families, our struggles, and our choices. Try to only speak from the heart about these things. It will be very hot once we begin pouring water on the rocks, and the heat will make it very difficult to speak anyway so only speak if it is important. Katie and Will were already rolling the superheated rocks into the lodge, using some long willow poles I had made. I gave Jess a side hug. The trainees didn't know we were married, and we had found it best not to let kids or people new to the wilderness group know, because it could have become a distraction from the experience if they got caught up in our personal lives. So side hug was all. As far as they knew, we were just co-workers. I took out a dried sage smudge and lit it on the fire and did the ritual smoke cleansing for each of them as they entered the hallowed ground. I made the last minute decision not to go into the sweat lodge. That last boys group had a student that was a little bit of trouble and I was worried I would end up having to take an emergency radio call about a runner in the middle of someone's heartfelt speaking about their issues with their family or their past. Also, the smell. Also, something just felt off. This was a perfect spot and a perfect time for a sweat lodge ceremony, but it felt not wrong exactly, just off somehow. Instead, I whispered my choice and that maybe I would join the next session to Katie as she was the last to enter. And I sealed the door up behind them, burying the edge of the poncho in the sand like the rest of the construction. I stood by the fire for a minute or two and felt hot. So I walked in the water down the narrow stream about a hundred yards and just looked at the stars that were slowly becoming more and more visible in the darkening twilight. I stood there for at least 10 minutes, enjoying the changing sky. I heard a twig snap somewhere to my left and the crickets went silent. There was definitely somebody away up there in the trees. I stared hard and could not see anybody at first, but there was a small dark shadow under a pine, maybe 30 or 40 feet away too dark for this early in the evening. Was that a girl in the shadow? It looked like a small Native American girl with two long braids and some kind of headband. I called out to her, but she didn't move. She seemed to be glaring at me. 
and the longer I stood there, the worse I felt, like the warmth from the air around me was being sucked away. So I took a deep breath, and I did what I always do in the woods when something unknown scares me. I ran at it. Whoever was there took off fast, and I chased them. I lost them quickly enough, I'm not a runner, but I was sure they had been headed in the direction away from my little creekside sweat lodge. I must have gone an eighth of a mile, almost to the road, when I heard all the staff at the sweat lodge scream behind me. My blood ran cold, and I turned on my heel and sprinted back up the canyon. I almost missed the sweat lodge clearing when I came to it because nothing that I saw made sense. The fire was out, not even a glow. The sweat lodge was gone. The tarps had all been pulled and ripped off, and they and the hides were flung out in a wide circle on the ground in the bushes and in the water. The frame was uprooted and folded over on its side to one side of the sandbar and all the new and experienced staff were sitting stunned in a circle on a padding of sage and juniper around a pile of cold rocks. What happened? I yelled as I ran up. After a moment, Katie answered. We were just sitting here, starting to pour water on the rocks to heat things up, and we started talking a little bit about what it means to know your personal history. The walls of the sweat lodge started shaking, and we thought you were outside trying to get in. It stopped for a minute, and Jess called your name, but you didn't answer, and we had just poured some more water on the rocks when the whole lodge went cold, like really cold, and it sounded like a massive windstorm blew in and ripped the whole thing off of us, frame and all, and threw it into the trees. I didn't know what to do. So I grabbed my bag and got out every flashlight I had. We started checking each other for injuries. I lied to them through my teeth and told them that it was a microburst windstorm and that they happened sometimes in Utah and that they were lucky nobody got hurt and so on. Amidst the skeptical looks from the three who knew me, I got Jessica and Will to start taking the stunned newbies back to camp. But Katie stayed. Katie, who had been with me through so many other unexplainable things out here, knew what I was doing. She could tell I wasn't saying something. The fire is out. Like, it's out cold. And it was a thousand degrees 20 minutes ago. And the rocks that were glowing hot 20 minutes ago feel like they've been sitting in the creek, she said. What are you not saying? I took a deep breath. I just tried to chase down a Native American girl who apparently can run unnaturally fast in the dark. Katie sat down hard. I looked at her, but she didn't say anything, so I continued. Today, while I was gathering rocks for the lodge, I felt like someone was watching me the whole time, and I swear I'm not making this up, but I set down that really big rock, you know, the first one you rolled into the circle? And I walked away for a few minutes. When I returned, it was over by the creek. Like someone came and moved it, but there were no tracks and it couldn't have rolled there. And then after you all went into the sweat lodge, I walked down to the creek and heard something in the trees. It took me a minute to spot her, but she was hiding in a shadow under a tree. I think I chased her for maybe 30 seconds when you all started screaming and I ran back up here. What Katie said next made me sit down too. Did she have two braids and a headband? I nodded slowly. Early this morning, like three, Jessica woke everybody up and said it was going to rain and that we needed to build a shelter. There were no clouds last night, I said. I know, said Katie. But she woke us all up and insisted that we needed to build a shelter and she wouldn't drop it until we all moved closer together and put up some tarps. I like to see the stars if I wake up, so I moved in close just in case, but 
I didn't get under a tarp. Neither did Will, or Josh. He's one of the new guys. Well, this morning, just before it got light, I had a really disturbing dream where I felt like I was awake in my sleeping bag and was staring up into the trees above me. And there was this little Native American girl with two braids and a blue-gray headband up in the tree over my face, just staring at me. I knew I was dreaming, but I couldn't move or wake up. I was only able to move when Josh, on the other side of the shelter, yelled and sat up. I thought it was just a horrible dream, until I talked to Jess about the rain last night. She admitted to me that she hadn't been worried about rain, but that she had been dead asleep when she felt somebody reach into her sleeping bag and shove her head to the side. She panicked and laid there and pretended like she was still sleeping, but they knelt over her face for a few minutes. She said she was terrified to open her eyes. When she felt them leave, she waited for a few minutes and then woke everyone else up. I was wondering why she slept in the middle of everyone. Now it makes sense. I was quiet. Katie spoke again. Before breakfast, I asked Josh why he yelled and sat up. I was grateful he did, but was curious as to why. He told me that he'd had a horrible nightmare about a little Native American girl, and when he thought he woke up, he saw her running at him. He yelled and she jumped over his head and took off, and that's when he really woke up and sat up. He was surprised that I had heard him yell. He thought he was still asleep at that point and he dreamed the yelling part. I didn't tell Jess or Josh what happened to me, and I didn't tell them about each other. But at breakfast, Will told all of us about this horrible dream he had about a little girl dying in that cabin when it burned down. We all freaked out. It's all we've been talking about today. Half of the group didn't believe us, and Carol Sue, the loud annoying one, has told everybody that we're just trying to haze the new guys. Even Josh, who's a new guy, is in on it, apparently. And then the sweat lodge thing happened. With what you just told me, I don't think any of us were dreaming. We were quiet for a long time. I think we should move camp down the road tomorrow, I finally said. I'll clean up this mess in the morning. Katie just nodded and stood up. Oh, and Katie? It's probably a good idea for everyone to be under the shelter to sleep tonight. And also, maybe don't light another fire. I'm guessing the one at your group site is out too. She sighed tiredly and walked off into the dark. I just sat there for a while and then slowly made my way back to the truck. I didn't feel like anyone was watching me anymore but that didn't stop me from sleeping in the cab with the doors locked for the rest of the week. When I was a teenager, my family moved into a new house in Ohio. Well, it was new to us. As soon as we moved in, my mother started saying that she felt the house was haunted and that she could sense a presence there. She said she heard somebody call her name and felt somebody put a hand on her shoulder. One time she woke up with somebody holding her feet down and she couldn't shake off whatever it was so she started screaming. She also heard muffled voices. We didn't believe her at all until both my sister and I started experiencing strange things. My first experience was when I was reading a book in my bedroom at 3 a.m. I'm a night owl, so this wasn't that unusual. Everyone should have been asleep, but suddenly I hear very heavy footsteps right outside my bedroom door. They were too heavy to be my mom's or my sister's, so I just assumed that my dad was walking around, checking up on us. I sprinted to the door, and when I opened it, I was shocked to discover the hallway was dark, and nobody was up. 
Our attic had several feet of fluffy insulation covering the entire area. There was nothing stored there, but at times you could hear steps coming from the attic, running up to the side of the house. They always ran up to the side with the driveway, as though they were trying to see who arrived, and this happened almost every time that somebody would pull up to the house. In the daytime, it was almost cool, but in the nighttime, it was terrifying. There was always something clicking loudly under my bed and in the closet at night, and I always tried to convince myself it was the air vents. However, all the air vents were on the other side of the bedroom, and they never made clicking noises. I sometimes saw an outline of a person standing next to my bed if my head was covered with a sheet, but when I pulled the sheet off, nobody was there. I heard sighs, as though somebody was standing right behind me. And one time, I heard a whisper that said, Come play. I prayed a lot, and that usually helped. I would also ask them to quiet down, and that helped as well. One time, my boyfriend and I were doing homework in the basement and heard the garage door open, and voices of my parents in the kitchen. We ran up to say hi, only to discover an empty house. Another time, my boyfriend stayed overnight in our house and he slept in the living room. In the morning, he asked if we were all playing a joke on him at night, as he kept hearing a ball bounce on the stairwell leading up to the bedrooms on the second floor and in the kitchen. But every time he got up to see what was going on, no one was there. I don't think we even owned a ball and we certainly didn't play with one in the house. One time, my mom heard a baby crying outside of our house at night. We lived in a safe and perfectly normal suburb. There was no reason that a baby would be in our backyard. Another day, a lid flew off of a cooking pot and got halfway embedded into the kitchen ceiling. It wasn't a pressure cooker. It was just a regular lid and pot. Another time, we left for a family vacation and my boyfriend was asked to take our paper in. He said that he was in the house and decided to make my bed for me. We had left at the ungodly hour of 5 a.m. and I never got to it. He said at first he got a juice and felt like somebody was breathing down his neck in the kitchen. He kept turning around to find nobody there. Then he walked upstairs and while he was making my bed, he felt something grab his legs from under it. He got freaked out and ran out of there and he refused to enter the house again. He just diligently hid the papers behind a flower pot outside until we returned. One night, my sister woke up to a black caped figure standing silently in her room. She said there was also a bright orb near her window. Her windows faced the backyard and trees, and being on the second floor, there was no possible source of light from cars and things like that. She covered her head with the blanket, and when she looked out, the figure and the orb were still there. She went back under the blanket, and after some time, they were finally gone. One day, our cat disappeared without a trace, and we never did see it again. Not sure if that was related. My dad was one person who never experienced anything. No voices, no steps, no TV and radios blasting out on their own. He is hard of hearing, so that could be a factor. But one thing he can't explain is waking up at 4 a.m. next to a lit tea light candle that he swears burnt out at midnight. The candle was right in front of his face, and he's extremely sensitive to light, to the point where he covers any electronic lights with napkins because they disturb his sleep. It eventually got so bad that I refused to sleep in my own bedroom, as I could feel someone move around the room at night and I slept in my sister's room. My dad decided to call a medium, and the guy said that there were five spirits in the house, a boy, an old lady, a couple, and a very angry man. He gave us a giant candle with a cross and said to burn it in the bedroom of the youngest child, which was now also my bedroom where I slept in a sofa chair. The candle was in a big glass jar and was hefty. All night it kept shaking, and the glass kept making clicking noises against the counter that it stood on. 
We were also to tell the spirits that this was our house and that they needed to go to the light. Things improved after the visit and shortly after I moved out to attend college, where I slept for years with the lights on, although I never experienced any paranormal activity in my apartment there. After college, I never stayed in the house for longer than a few days, always sleeping with the lights on, as that creepy feeling remained, although nothing notable happened anymore. Eventually, my parents sold the house. This is my favorite paranormal story, so I wanted to share. When I first moved to Orlando, I got a job at a local company and I needed to find a place to live. At the time, I was renting a room from a nice older couple. However, I was also getting married, so I needed to find a place for both of us to live. Those who live in Orlando know how expensive it can be, and I'm not much of an apartment guy. So finally, we found this nice little house. And when I say little, I mean little. Anyway, the landlord gave us a great deal. He didn't really want to spend any time fixing the place up because it wasn't worth it. After all, it was really small and really old. They had just moved his wife's mother to an elderly home and he did fix the electrical and plumbing. I agreed that I would paint and fix things up so long as the basics worked. He was a really nice landlord and we got along great. A few weeks after we moved in, the wife came by and let us know that they would be away for a bit. It turns out her mom passed away a few days prior and they were taking her back to the old country, as she put it. I felt bad. I didn't know she was that sick and we moved into her house. After that, nothing seemed out of the ordinary, but the air about the house did change a little, or at least I thought it did. Shortly after, I got married and we settled into our daily lives. I was working on the front porch one day when I found a small brooch under one of the rotten boards. It was pretty nice, so I brought it inside and placed it on the mantel. I figured I would give it to the landlord the next time I saw him, figuring it was most likely either Lillian's, his mother-in-law's, or his wife's. That was when things started to get weird. The first thing I started noticing, or more to the point, my wife noticed and blamed me for, was that the keepsakes from our wedding got moved around. They were never where she'd left them. I told her that I had nothing to do with moving them, but her being her, she wasn't having any of it. So we moved them back. A few days later, we come home from dinner and there they were, rearranged again. I looked over at her and said, okay, how did I do it this time? The brooch was still there in the same place on the mantel, but everything else had been moved around. This happened a few more times until my wife finally just got over it and left them wherever they were. One day, I was dusting and I came across the brooch on the mantel. I looked at it and a breeze went by. I tried to tell myself it was just the fan, but that got me thinking about all the odd things that had started happening. I started to think that maybe the events were Lillian's doing. I asked my wife what she thought and she said that I was crazy. She said, do you really think the ghost of the old lady that lived here is haunting the house and moving our wedding stuff around? I said, well, yeah. She gave me that look and walked away. Anyway, the following weekend, the landlord came by to mow and I went outside to give back the brooch, thinking maybe that would change things. His wife was in the truck reading a book and I walked over and handed the brooch to her. Well, she turned about 10 shades of white and looked up at me and asked where I'd found it. I told her that I found it under the porch when I was fixing the floor. She said that it had been her mother's. And one day 
She, the daughter, the wife of the landlord, had been outside playing with it and had lost it. Her mother, Lillian, was very mad at her for having played with it and for losing it. She smiled and the color returned to her face. She hugged me and then I walked back to the house. As I walked up to the front, I looked at the house and noticed that in the front window, there was a shadow behind the lace curtains. It looked like a person. As I walked closer, I tripped over a rock and when I got back up, the person wasn't there. I went into the house and looked around, didn't see anything. So I moved on, thinking it was a trick of the light through the lace. A few days later, I get home and my wife starts rambling, asking if I smelled the flowers. She also thought we had mice or rats because she kept hearing movement. I told her I didn't smell the flowers. I kind of poked her a bit about it and I asked her if it sounded like little feet or footsteps. She looks at me and then says, footsteps. After that, the events get more frequent and interesting. I'd be sitting on the couch and I would see out of the corner of my eye movement or a change of light, not quite a shadow, but almost going from the kitchen to the bathroom, which is a straight shot. There isn't any light that can move way back there. There were other things like strange sounds of things moving in the kitchen or the back bedroom, a lot of footsteps. The whole house is hardwood floors and it really carries I decided that Lillian was still here, even after the brooch event. Maybe she was happy that I gave it back to her daughter, but it was still her house, so I figured she was well within her rights to live there too. And besides, I loved the way she messed with my wife. She's so easy. It even got to the point where sometimes I would talk to Lillian. I never got a response back, and that was before cell phones or voice recorders were as high tech as they are now. I'm not sure who she messed with more, me or my wife. We stayed in that house for six years and had two kids there before we moved on to another city. Shortly after we moved out, the landlord called and asked if anything strange had happened to us while we were in the house. I told him that his mother-in-law was still around and that she was super cool. He then said that's what he thought because they were in there repainting and running ceiling fans and they both had run-ins with something strange. I told him that she was good to us and that we miss living there. I hung up the phone and that was the last time I ever heard from him. I found out a few years later from some friends that the house was torn down and a new house had been put up in its place that was way bigger than the original. I was a bit sad, but then I thought that Lillian might not like that very much and I hope she rearranges everything in the new house and drives the owners crazy, like she did my wife. My boyfriend and I are camping at the Fort Pickens campground in Pensacola, Florida. Last night was a full moon and around 9.30 or 10, we went for a walk down to the beach with our husky to look at the ocean and check out the moonlight. We sat there for maybe an hour and just talked about life in general. But toward the end of the conversation, we started talking about how the ocean can play tricks on you and how strange the energy can be sometimes. We were swapping stories about how we've seen people who we thought might not really be people before. And I understand that when you talk about things like that, it puts you in a very specific headspace. All night, I tried to justify what happened to us as a trick of our minds and us hyping ourselves up. But we both saw the same thing at the same time, and there's absolutely no way that it wasn't real. We started walking back to camp, and it was maybe a quarter mile from the beach down the little boardwalk thing to the main road. Once you get to the main road, you see the entrance to the campsite, and there's a small parking lot there, a stop sign, a picnic table, 
and a building that looks abandoned and out of business. This building is one story tall and doesn't have any signs out front, and I don't believe the doors and windows are shuttered, but they're definitely not accessible. I wouldn't even be able to press my face against the window and try to peek in, because it's kind of boarded up around it. I was sitting on this picnic table while Shane was standing and telling me a creepy story about something he saw in the ocean when he was 11 years old. We were there for maybe 10 minutes, and we were talking about his story. I was trying to debunk it and figure it out with him, when all of a sudden a girl comes walking out of the campsite area towards us and stops at the building. We both thought nothing of it because we had already seen two people walking that night, and we knew people were active because it was a full moon and wanted to make the most of the campsite. But this girl walks up to the abandoned building, and it looks like she's trying to peer in the windows or open the doors on the right side of the building. I almost even remember her standing on her tiptoes. She obviously doesn't get in, and then she decides to walk all the way across the length of the building, right in front of us to the left side. This is when I started to get uncomfortable, because she doesn't look at us or address us, even though we're both loudly standing there talking. And the way that she was walking, all I could see was her side or back profile in a long brown ponytail. I know it doesn't really make sense, but it's just like, how can somebody walk from right to left in front of you and you don't see the side of their face? All I saw was her hair. It's not like she had her head turned either. It just doesn't make sense. So she rounds the corner on the left side of the building and doesn't come back. At this point, I'm actually invested and I'm kind of grilling the location she went to the whole time. I don't take my eyes off of it. I don't really know how to explain this, but it didn't seem like she walked back behind the building. It seemed like she was right there, just waiting for us to do or say something. There's a little edge, like a ledge on the side of the building that looked maybe three or four inches wide, kind of like a gutter hanging off. And I swear on my life, it's like she went behind this little four inch ledge and flipped herself sideways and was just frozen watching us. Shane has this spotlight for hunting that he uses as a flashlight and he shined it on the little ledge area of the building that she went behind. We kept seeing something low to the ground on the side of this ledge and it made us think that she was just standing there doing something. So Shane shines his light in that direction and yelled, Yo, what's up? Are you good? After this, he kept his spotlight pinned where we thought she would pop out. And after a delay of four or five seconds, we literally saw her spring out of the shadow and leer forward facing right. She had her back hunched over so she wasn't standing as tall as she normally would be. I can't explain how scary it was to be sitting there watching this whole thing take place and once we shine the flashlight, have this person's face pop out from the side of this building. It would have been less scary if she had never come out and we had circled the whole building and nobody was there. Her movement was incredibly unnatural. It was as if no human being would respond with their body language that way after having a flashlight shining on them. It was like she couldn't figure out what to do and showed herself only because we made her and then couldn't get all the parts right in the meantime. Almost like she was scared of getting caught for doing something wrong, not scared of us. The way she popped out, her face was turned toward us and she had her arms kind of sprawled out, almost like a praying mantis. I know this sounds ridiculous, but there's literally no other way to explain this. The best part about this whole thing, though, is something that neither of us figured out until we talked about it later. We never saw a face. It was just smooth skin or clay colored, rounded, with no eyes or facial expressions. I want to say that I personally almost saw divots or pits where the eyes should have been, but there was nothing substantial there. We were still trying to figure out this encounter, so we weren't super quick to get scared at this point. 
We honestly thought that it was our minds playing tricks on us, but I think since both of us saw it, we knew that was probably unlikely. This is where the story starts to differentiate a little bit. After she pulls her body back behind the ledge, Shane turns off his flashlight when I asked him to because I felt like we were being rude. At this point, she's back behind the ledge and the light is off, and I see her extended body about three feet off the ground. It's like she's crouching and reaching at the same time, like she was going to take an over-exaggerated step and almost tiptoe off like a cartoon character or something. She leaned forward one step to the right and then pulled herself back behind the ledge. She stands up straight and then starts walking back to the right side of the building in front of us. Shane has his flashlight on her the whole time. And now she just says, oh, I just wanted to change without having to go all the way back. But it's like all the way back to where? She literally just came from the campground. She could have changed right there if she was heading to the beach or something. Was she going to swim at 10.30 at night? It just didn't make any sense why she needed to change in that specific spot. The strange part is I specifically heard her talk about changing, but Shane heard her say something about having to pee. I'm not sure if one or both of us just misheard her or if Shane just assumed that's what she was doing, because that's what I thought at first too. But as she walked from the left of the building across to the right and back down the trail toward the campground, she kind of scurried away quickly, as if she was embarrassed. And the crazy thing is that I didn't see her face the entire time she did this. It was like when she walked across the first time. All I saw was her long brown ponytail. After she slowly walked down the road back toward the campsite, Shane and I were talking about how messed up that whole interaction was and how we needed to get back to our own site. He told me that this person had a short, blonde, bob-style haircut. He couldn't believe me when I said that no, she had a long brown ponytail because he hadn't seen that anywhere on this person. There's no way that either of us could have mistaken these two specific haircuts and colors for the other. It's almost like she was showing each of us what she wanted to. As we walk back to our campsite, we walk past a handful of good dark trees that I, as a female, would definitely have peed behind or changed behind if I needed to. This building was so far out of the way, and I would never think to go to the distant right side of it by myself late at night in order to change clothes. It just didn't make sense, the choices that she made. And trust me, we've spent enough time in the city that if we were in New York or New Orleans or Denver or wherever, and we saw somebody doing stuff like this, we probably would have just chalked it up to the person being high and just laughed it off. But this is a random, quiet family campground where everyone's super happy and peaceful. Of course we tried to justify that maybe it was just some drunk chick being sloppy and not knowing what's going on. But even that doesn't hold any weight in comparison to those body movements and that smooth face that we saw staring back at us. Nothing about this person's body movements were natural. Not when she came slinking up. Not when she didn't notice us sitting there. Not when she looked in the window. Not when she walked across the building or dipped behind the ledge or peered out or crouched down or replied to us. And definitely not when she scurried off. This is one of those situations that left me with tears in my eyes. I was absolutely shaken, but I was incredulous at the same time. I couldn't believe that it really happened to me. It's like I almost couldn't even be scared because it had already happened. And I just had to sit there and process that we really saw what we did. We talk about NPCs sometimes and joke about people making us uncomfortable and maybe not being real. And we really believe that sometimes we cross paths with angels. But this was something else entirely. This was something that seemed like a lower form or something less intelligent than us that was just pretending to be human. I feel like I should add this as a side note, but I'm Native American and I'm super familiar with all kinds of witches or bad medicine or shapeshifters. And in a lot of our stories, these are humans who are incredibly intelligent and powerful, 
and have this human urge based on jealousy or anger or evil to target individuals and appear as another living form. I'm telling you right now that nothing about this encounter felt like that. This didn't seem like something smarter than us. It didn't seem like something with an emotional intention. It didn't seem quick or cunning like it wanted something from us. It was the exact opposite end of the spectrum. It seemed like it was mimicking or mocking human movements. I have no idea what its intentions were, or why it was here of all places, or why it presented itself to us that night. But I guess I just have to move forward with the knowledge that this definitely happened, and I don't have any answers. The reason that I'm writing this now, and not before, is because I was only reminded of this the other day. I was driving to the store with my son, and he wanted me to listen to a song. I don't even remember the words. I just remember that the tune brought me back to a place. A place that I had tucked away in my memory, in hopes of forgetting. Now, I can't get that old lady's mouth out of my head. This happened in 1987. I'm sure about the date because of the Whittier earthquake. It just so happens that at that very moment, I was painting a wall in the dining room a different color. That's when it hit. I ended up streaking paint across the wall as I ran over to hold our overly large fish tank from falling off of this stupidly flimsy stand we had it on. This took place in Hacienda Heights, California. My boyfriend at the time wasn't really welcome at my mother's house because she couldn't shake this bad feeling about him. So, being young and dumb, I moved out of her house and into a place that I found down the street with him. I wish I had listened to her. It was a small one-bedroom bungalow. At first, we were getting along just fine. But it seemed like things changed as the months passed and we started fighting more and more. I thought it was odd that I, Susie Homemaker, didn't even want to make that house a home. It was just a weird vibe, and it got darker the longer we stayed. As you walk in the partial glass front door, on the left, there were two white windowpane doors on the built-in bookcases on both sides of a fireplace, then the dining room, and in the back was the kitchen. The bedroom was on the right. We couldn't afford a bed frame, so our full-size mattress was on the floor, under the window, and that was the only thing there besides the clock. There was an uneasiness in that bedroom that I couldn't put my finger on. I felt very depressed in there. Oh, little things happened throughout the house from the moment we moved in, but we just laughed it off. Until it was no longer funny. It seemed like when we were at odds with each other, it intensified in a dark way. Oftentimes, my boyfriend would just leave and I was alone, sometimes for days, and I thought that he did it on purpose because he knew that I was scared to be there alone. At first, I was fine, not scared of anything, until one of those nights. I was sleeping and I was jolted up by an extremely loud bang that left my ears ringing. I jumped up, and at first, I looked out the front window, thinking that it was something outside, but the streets were still. I checked the house, but there was nothing out of place. The next night, it happened again, louder than before. Only this time, I glanced at the clock before checking the house. It was 5 o'clock a.m. on the dot, and my room was freezing. I tried to get back to sleep, but I heard muffled wails of a woman. I literally had to lift my head from the pillow to listen, but nobody was around. The next day, my boyfriend came home and with a few words and some hand-picked flowers, all was stupidly forgiven. I told him what had happened, but he shrugged it off, telling me that it could have been a backfire or the pipes, and I bought it. One early evening after dinner, we were going to watch TV on the couch in the living room, and I excused myself to go to the bathroom. 
I kept hearing him yelling out things to me, but I couldn't really make out what he was saying. I opened the door and looked at him. He turned absolutely pale, and he was crawling backwards on the couch with wide eyes. Then he leaped up and ran into the kitchen, looking around and checking the back door. He came out, saying that the door was locked from the inside. After he calmed down and I could understand him, he told me that he was talking to me in the kitchen. He asked me why I was putting a granny house dress on and was asking for snacks, and he was getting a bit upset that I didn't answer him. I had no answers. There had been a few times where we both saw what looked like a teenaged boy sitting on the front stoop, sometimes holding his head in his hands, but when we approached him, it was like he was never there. I pointed out faces in the glass panes of the bookcase that looked like they were talking to us while we were watching TV. They were just reflections, but they were reflections of something that wasn't in the room. Their features were outlined by the flickering light from the TV. But after a while, the faces became more defined. In the beginning, my boyfriend thought I was making it all up until he saw it for himself. We heard banging on the bathroom door, like somebody was banging with their fist, even when we weren't in there, and an older guy's voice saying, ah, come on, sending us running outside a couple of times, then feeling stupid sitting outside, so we went in and stayed spooked for the rest of the day. I called the landlord to ask him if something had happened there, or if he could make it stop. But before I could even open my mouth, he was asking if I was calling to complain about something he had no control over. In the background, I heard his wife say, Is that the young couple? They want to move, do they? Well, there goes another one. It sounded like this had happened to them a lot before, and that really got my blood boiling. Why would they rent this place to us without even a heads up? Realizing that they would be of no immediate help, I just hung up on him. I couldn't move, I had no money, and my mother for sure wouldn't let me move back in as long as I was with my boyfriend. We lived there for at least four months when our relationship started to spin out of control. He was being forceful and demanding and drinking a lot more. One night he asked me to pick him up, so I did. And somehow, I ended up with a broken arm because I didn't want him to drive my car drunk. I had to beg him to shift gears so that I could drive to the ER because he was tired. And after the hospital, I was exhausted and I just wanted to sleep. So I went to the bedroom while he opted to lay on the couch and watch TV. The next thing I know, he's grabbing his stuff, saying that he's not staying there anymore and walking out leaving me there alone with a broken arm. Wow. I remember that it was a warm night, but it was raining. So I laid on the couch with only the screen door closed so that I could hear the rain. The lights went out, which freaked me out even more. So I put candles on the coffee table and one on the bookcase and sat back down on the couch. I was too afraid to sleep in the bedroom. I sat there and saw those faces, and one was an old lady. She was frowning, and her mouth was moving like she was trying to over-enunciate to tell me something or yell at me. Her face got bigger, like she was coming closer to the glass, and then back. She kept waving her finger at me. Her gray hair was straight and put back with a headband. Her mouth was just going on, opening and closing, and the candlelight glistened on her bottom teeth. Her teeth looked a little, I don't know, long and old, if that makes any sense. Then there was a middle-aged man who didn't look directly at me. He looked aggravated, but not at me, more like at everything and everyone. And then a crying teenager. His face was so full of despair I could make out the words, please, and no, no, no. And then he put his hand on his face. Looking at him brought tears to my eyes and my heart felt so very heavy. It dawned on me that this was the kid on our doorstep. 
I must have sat there for hours with the blankets up to my nose until the lights came back on and I finally fell asleep. The next morning, I walked down to the corner store and I called my mother, who was happy to find out that I was ready to come home. Before I handed the keys over, my mother had some words with the landlord. He told her that he had the place blessed before I moved in and that he was really hoping that it had worked. He also told my mom that he bought the place already haunted. All he knew from digging was that it was two bungalows together, but one burnt down. But the one that I was renting was the one where an old lady lived, whose grown son had come upon hard times due to his alcoholism. He lost his wife and couldn't keep a job, so he and his teenage son moved into her place with her. His son was so unstable that he found a gun in the house and ended up shooting himself in the bedroom. His grandmother had died from a heart attack not long after. He didn't know what happened to the man. Talk about a roundabout. I don't know why that tune, or maybe the light reflecting off the rain on my windshield made me think about that old lady's mouth, but it did. Now I understand a little more as to why I hate reflective things in my home. This story might be a bit long, but it's something that happened to me years ago and I'm still very curious about what it could have been. When I was about 13, I was in a relationship with a girl that I visited pretty frequently, almost every day after school if I could. Due to me visiting her so often, I got to know her and her family, as well as her home. They were very kind people, but just a little off. At the time, I wasn't a very religious person. However, my girlfriend and her family were Satanists, When I first heard that, I thought it was a joke, but soon I realized that they were being serious. I wasn't too surprised or bothered by it. She later told me that the house was haunted, and me being the biggest skeptic kind of just brushed it off and showed interest so we could keep talking. After a while, I started to notice things in the house that were a little bit unsettling, but I was quick to dismiss them. I figured anything had a logical explanation behind it, so why try to claim that it was something paranormal? At first it started with small tapping sounds. To be honest, at this time, I thought it was just the house settling or creaking due to the wind. We live in Florida, so it wasn't too hard to believe that some weather could have caused the house to make noises. That's what I believed, since it was the most logical explanation. That was until we heard scratching coming from inside her closet. We thought it was her cat at first, especially because he would constantly bring her into the room and she liked to explore. We also thought maybe she had snuck in and we had closed the door on her, oblivious, and it took her until just that moment to try to get out. Obviously, we got up and opened the closet door, but nothing was there. This was very peculiar, but I shrugged it off and figured that maybe it was a mouse or a rat in the walls. She pointed out, though, that there were scratch marks all over the closet. They weren't high up. If anything, they were about level with a common cat or a small dog. But like I said, the cat wasn't in the closet. It wasn't even in the room. Needless to say, I was weirded out. I wasn't scared, but I was starting to believe that something wasn't right. I don't know exactly what was wrong, but I was starting to feel off after this. Weeks go by and even months go by. Some minor things keep happening. Mostly just the scratching, which has pretty much torn up the paint in the closet entirely at this point. But also other things like the cat acting strangely and a weird sense of unease when you're in certain parts of the house, particularly the restroom, the garage, and the master bedroom. I just assumed that it all had a rational explanation, of course. I wasn't sure of what it was, but I was stubborn and dumb. One day, though, something was especially creepy. 
so creepy to me in fact, that I had actually started to question whether or not there are such things as gods, demons, ghosts, etc. Something that will stick with me forever. One day, my girlfriend had invited me over, so I asked my mom and she dropped me off. I noticed that there weren't any cars in her driveway, which wasn't really weird since her family did work often or were out shopping a lot. My girlfriend opens the door after I knock and lets me in. First thing we did was head to her room to watch Third Rock from the Sun. While we're sitting in there, we make some small talk and go to the kitchen to grab some food. And then we go back to her room to keep watching TV. At some point though, hours later, we end up shutting off the TV and just start talking. Out of nowhere though, we hear her older sister yell her name from right outside her door. We assumed they were finally home from wherever they went and we went out there to check up on them. Weirdly enough though, we didn't see her. We checked everywhere around the house and didn't see her at all. We even yelled back but got no response. We chalked it up to us maybe hearing something else and just assuming that that's what we had heard instead. Like maybe there was a noise and we thought we heard her name. Like I said, stubborn and dumb. We head back to the bedroom and sit down but this time we leave her bedroom door open just in case her sister really did call for her and attempted to do it again. After a few moments, we hear her sister call for her name again. However, this time it didn't seem like it came from behind the door. It sounded as if the entire house had called her name. Not only was it so loud and so clear, but it didn't change its tone or pitch. It sounded like it was a repeated audio recording from the last time she had called for her. Once again, we quickly bolt up and search around the house as fast as possible. We thought if it was her sister trying to play some kind of prank, we would find her, but we didn't see her. We couldn't even trace where the sound had come from, so we checked in all the areas where somebody could easily hide. Being dumb, we once again said it was probably nothing to worry about. About an hour or so goes by and we hear her dad's truck start to pull up to the house. We check out the window to watch them and the rear passenger door opens. It's her sister. We were baffled to say the least and wondered when and how she had left so quickly. We met them at the door and asked her what it was that she had kept calling for and how she'd gotten out and ended up with her family. She looked at us with confusion and concern. What she and her dad told us makes me anxious to this very day. She said that she'd been gone since six in the morning doing some shopping. We immediately tried calling her bluff, but her dad doubled down and seemed to get a little bit annoyed by this and told us that they were indeed out shopping all day. Right after he told us this, we told her sister that we had heard something that sounded exactly like her voice calling for my girlfriend and we tried finding whatever it was, but we came up with nothing. Something about this must have really alerted and worried her sister, because after we told her this, she immediately went pale and looked sick. She told me that she would like to speak to my girlfriend in private real quick and brought her to the back porch. I went back to my girlfriend's room and just sat on her bed waiting for her to come back. After about five or 10 minutes, she came back and looked a little concerned while also downplaying what had just happened. I asked her if everything was all right. She said, yeah, she asked if we had gone into her room. I told her I did and she got mad. She told me though that if we ever hear her voice while she's not home to not go in her room. I guess right above her bed is an attic and she told me how one time she was sleeping, she'd woken up in the middle of the night and saw the attic right above her bed was cracked open and she saw her own face staring back at her from inside the attic. This story is entirely true and something that has stuck with me for years. I'm 24 now and though it's been a little over 10 years, it still feels like it happened yesterday.
I don't have many memories of my father because he died when I was just eight years old. However, I do clearly remember the night several years later when he let us know that he was still around and watching over us. First of all, you need to know something about my father. He was fascinated by the supernatural and by the possibility of some sort of existence after death. After it became clear that he would soon lose his battle with lymphatic cancer, he told my mother not to worry. He said, if there's any way for me to reappear after I die, to let you know that I'm okay, then that's what I'm going to do. I'll visit you and the kids all the time. It's gonna be so cool. My mother said her response to that was a pointed and succinct, don't you effing dare. It wasn't that she didn't care what happened to him after he died, or that she didn't want him watching over us. She just knew that she wasn't going to be able to emotionally deal with that situation, and she promised him that that's how she would react. My father followed through on his promise. The story my mother told us was that she was in their upstairs bedroom a few months after his death, thinking about him and crying because she missed him so much. Then she suddenly had the distinct feeling that she was being watched. She turned her head and saw my father standing outside the bedroom window on the balcony, clear as day. He looked healthy and alive. He was wearing a bright blue suit and gave my mother a look that said, is it okay if I come inside? My mother said she stared at him for a moment in total shock. She deliberately blinked her eyes to make certain that she was really seeing what she was seeing. And when she opened her eyes, he was still there, smiling and waiting. That's when my mother followed through on her promise. She closed her eyes tightly and said out loud, I can't handle this. I'm sorry, but I need you to go away and please don't ever do this again. After about 10 seconds, she opened her eyes and this time he was gone. This next part of the story takes place a few years later and I kind of have to set the scene for you. I took a bad fall while playing soccer and the impact totally destroyed my shoulder. I broke it in two places and every ligament and tendon was torn. The reason that this is important to the story is that my shoulder hurt so bad I couldn't easily walk up the stairs to my bedroom, which was across the hall from my parents' bedroom. I was temporarily sleeping in the guest bedroom downstairs and my brother had the bedroom we shared all to himself. That bedroom was right above the guest bedroom. In the hallway outside the guest bedroom, there was a sideboard with shelves on top and drawers below. And on those shelves was an old mantel clock. It looked a lot like somebody cut off the very top part of a typical grandfather clock, and it was small enough to fit neatly on the shelf. The clock had to be wound every so often with a special key, which was kept in one of the drawers below. And when it was properly wound, the small pendulum would swing back and forth to keep the clock going. My dad loved this clock, and while he was alive, he made sure to wind it so that it never stopped. After his death, though, my mother never wound the clock again, and it eventually did stop. So this clock had been completely silent for years. Late one night, I was trying to go to sleep, but the pain of my injured shoulder was terrible and it was keeping me awake. Plus, as a kid, I had terrible anxiety. Even with the bedroom door closed to help me feel more secure, I wasn't comfortable sleeping in the unfamiliar surroundings of the guest bedroom and being the only person downstairs. Just as I was finally feeling like I might be able to sleep, I heard something in the hallway outside the bedroom door. I was immediately freaked out and wide awake because my mother and brother were still upstairs. The stairs in this house were very squeaky and I knew for a fact that I had not heard anybody walking down them. It sounded as though someone or something was messing around with the sideboard. First, I heard a drawer open and then shut. After that, I heard a loud click followed by a strange sort of grinding sound. Then there were a couple of more clicks, and suddenly, the clock that hadn't made a sound in years started ticking. 
That sound I heard before wasn't grinding. It was winding. Someone took the key out of the drawer, opened the clock, wound it, and started the pendulum. Apparently, they also put the key back in the drawer where it belonged, because that's where we found it later. At this point, 11-year-old me was not only wide awake, but I was also scared as hell, and hiding as far beneath my covers as I could go with a broken shoulder. After all, when you're a child, covers are magical and repel all things evil, right? The next thing I heard was somebody walking up the stairs. Then everything was quiet for a short while. Soon, though, I heard footsteps moving around all over the upstairs. I even heard someone directly above me open and close the creaky sliding closet doors in my bedroom. After that, I clearly heard footsteps come down the stairs, someone open and then close the door to the guest room where I was struggling to breathe inside my cover cave, and then soon after, the footsteps returned up the stairs, and finally all was silent, except for one thing. The clock continued with its relentless tick talk, tick talk. Eventually, sleep caught up with me, and I didn't wake until my mother came to check on me in the morning. While we were eating breakfast that morning, my mother looked at me and paused for a long time. Finally, she asked, were you up and walking around last night? I told her I was not, and then I described to her all the noises I had heard. My mother told me she heard noises during the night too, and had searched all over the house to see who it was. It was her walking all around upstairs, opening and closing the squeaky closet, coming down the stairs, opening and closing the guest bedroom door, and then going back up. So who made the other sounds we both heard first, we wondered. And why was that clock ticking? Suddenly my mother's eyes grew wide. Oh my goodness, she said. Last night was the anniversary of the night your dad died. I think it must have been him, trying to let us know that he's still watching over us. And with that, we both went to look at the clock, which was still ticking. Thanks, Dad. Message received. We love you too, and we miss you. I am Puerto Rican, and I live in Brooklyn, but when I was young, I often spent summers in my grandmother's house in Yauco, Puerto Rico. She had a lot of land deep in the mountains, so deep that roads would go off into the wilderness through narrow mountain passes where cliffs were just a few inches off the tire driving in pitch black. If a car came in the opposite direction, either they or you would have to drive in reverse until you found a place to pass each other. It was scary. The property has been with my family for a long time, and my family has been in Yauco as far back as anyone can recall. I used to spend a lot of time with my great-grandfather, Papito, who farmed the land and took care of some cows. He was very old, and he was nearly 100% Taino indigenous Puerto Rican. From him, I would hear stories about the Indios who lived in the wilderness when he was young, who were not culturally assimilated into colonial society after hundreds of years of Spanish occupation. My family would often hide and harbor the culturally wild Puerto Ricans, culturally indigenous, because if Spanish locals found them, Los Matan, they would kill them. I had my first brush with mortality there at age six or so, crushing the jelly bean sized eggs of salamanders I found in the brush and watching the pink underdeveloped hatchling run for cover on instinct. My grandmother told me that what I had done was very wrong and I instantly knew why. I was filled with cold shame and I cried. Papito told me about strange flying discs he would see coming to the mountains and submerging into the lake. He told me about the spirits in the valley that you could hear them, and to be careful walking around the roads of the mountains at night on my way home from his house to my grandmother's. He taught me how to control a bull with its horns and how to ride it. 
He did a whistle only he could do when he wanted to gain the attention of an animal on the mountain that made them either follow him, go where he directed them, or just settle down. He told me about the legend of Diego Salcedo, which took place there in Yauco. When he was almost 100, Papito was dying, and all of our family came to see him. He was a link to an old time, and so many people in Yauco knew him. They all went to his house. Uncles, aunts, cousins, people from nearby, all gathered at his house on the top of the hill. I was too young to be present for his passing. I sort of didn't understand what was going on at the time. I was sent down to my grandmother's house to wait for the proceedings to be over. The sun was going down. The mountains were like shadows rising around me. Walking alone, I started to hear animals all about, crying out. Wild dogs all over the mountains. Chickens were making a ruckus. The pigs in the lower valley were screaming almost like humans. The cows were howling in a way that I can only describe as similar to Cat Stark from Game of Thrones when Rob died. Every single non-human thing in the mountain with an earshot was wailing in a fashion that I've never heard before or since. As a little kid, you can imagine how frightening that was, especially because I was all alone. I hid in the house, looking out the window, waiting for my grandmother and listening to the animals cry. I was especially sensitive to sound then, as it had been a time in my life where I was often sick and constantly on the medication amoxicillin, which I was allergic to. It created this sort of overwhelming extrasensory sound experience. At some point, all the animals stopped making noise, and I was thankful. Before bed, I asked my grandmother what had happened, why all of the animals were making that sound. She told me that Papito had just died, and that all of the animals on the mountain had realized the powerful being that protected it for so long was gone, that they had seen his spirit pass, and it was sensible that this change would affect them very deeply. My grandmother's perspective was that the animals just know these things. I couldn't sleep. I went outside, late at night, curious and scared out of my wits, thinking about the spirits that may be out in the darkness of the mountain wilderness, thinking about that terrible, painful lamentation that was embodied by animals crying like people. I went close to the edge of one of the small nearby cliffs that hung over the endless darkness. I squatted and listened. I heard a sound that scared me, a feral cry in the darkness. I don't know what dog it was or if it was a dog at all, but it was certainly too close and I was by myself. It howled and yelped and I regretted coming outside. I was sort of frozen there, afraid to move but afraid to stay. I wouldn't dare call out for my grandmother. I would be scolded for coming out and wandering around at night. She probably wouldn't hear me anyway. A moment later, I heard that whistle that Papito used to do, out in the darkness. The howling stopped. As a child, I didn't think, that couldn't be Papito, he's dead. Like any adult in their right mind would think. I just thought, it's Papito. It had to be. No one else could do that. No one knew how to whistle that way in my family, and it was only us for miles around on the mountain. Where the sound came from would have been impossible for any person to be. Not even during the daytime could they be there. It was deep inside of the wilderness on the severe cliffside, but I knew he was there just the same. I'm sure that at that age, the line between life and death was blurred. Yauco is the area where the chief of Taino lived, it is also where the rebellion began against the Spanish, with the drowning of the conquistador Diego Salcedo. Many of the surviving Taino escaped into the mountains of Yauco and lived in secrecy there for a long time, hiding their lifestyle behind some of the more assimilated natives, like Papito. They say the Taino are extinct, but that cannot be. I knew some of them, and I am one too, if only a little bit.
First, a little background information that's important to fully understand the story. My mother's sister and her husband have a house in Colorado that has a finished basement. The basement has a fully furnished bedroom, bathroom, a sort of living room area with a couch and TV, and a little kitchenette as well. I grew up visiting my three cousins, aunt, uncle, and grandparents every summer from the time I was five up until two or three years ago. I'm 21 now. The basement became more or less the guest room, so that's where I would stay whenever I would visit, so that I could have a little space of my own. That and the fact that their cat rarely ever went down to the basement and I am severely allergic to cats. This particular event occurred around the time that I was 17 or 18, and my younger cousin, I'll call her Megan, was around 16 or 15. The night started totally normal. We all had dinner, listened to music, watched something, and then at around midnight, we all headed off to bed. Because of a different experience I had down there a few years prior, I was really nervous about staying in the basement alone. So, my wonderful cousin Megan took one for the team and had been staying in the basement with me for the duration of my trip. We had been chilling in the living room of the basement for about three hours, drawing and just hanging out, when it all started. I was in the process of explaining the premise of a show I had started when we heard what sounded like an old man clearing his throat coming from the bathroom. I knew it wasn't her since I was maintaining eye contact with her the whole time and her mouth hadn't opened at all. And she also knew it wasn't me since I was in the middle of speaking. And of course, neither of us are old men. We both paused and then confirmed that we had both heard the cough. Our minds immediately went to, there's a man hiding in the bathroom, since they had had some people in the past attempt to break in through the basement windows. I wanted to go upstairs and get one of her older siblings to check it out, but Megan insisted on checking it out ourselves. We went to the bathroom, turned on the lights, and saw that it was completely empty. There was, however, a linen closet, which had the door closed. She opened the door, and we saw what honestly looked like the shape of a man trying to hide under some blankets. Megan immediately reared her leg back and kicked the blanket with full force, only to discover that it was just some blankets spilling over the lower shelves that we had forgotten existed. As Megan tended to her now stubbed toes, we heard that same cough come from what sounded like the entrance to the basement. We slowly crept out of the bathroom, looked around the basement to no avail, and without a word, both started packing up all of our stuff, like our sketchbooks and my laptop. And rather than leave the basement, we just went to the bedroom and locked the door. There was a giant floor length mirror in the room which we used to bar the door. We did all of this in complete silence, some weird primal understanding going on between us that we had to be as quiet as humanly possible. As we tiptoed around the room, we heard what sounded like shuffling outside the door. At that point, I was still somewhat convinced that there was a living person in the basement with us since the sounds were so clear and the feeling of there being someone else down there was so strong. Megan settled onto the bed while I sat against the wall next to the vanity, charging my phone. We were texting each other rather than speaking, since that pressure of being silent was still incredibly intense. We decided to each spam text her siblings, trying to wake them up to come down to our rescue, but there was no reply. Megan even texted her mom, but still, nobody woke up. I texted my mom, who did wake up, but all she said was to call the police if we were certain that somebody was down there with us. While we knew that there was something in the basement with us, we didn't know if it was actually someone who had broken in, 
and neither of us wanted to risk bothering the police for something dumb. After about an hour, Megan's phone started dying, so we decided to switch spots. For some reason, neither of us really understood. We were so terrified of making any sort of noise that we made sure to walk on our tiptoes and take steps at the exact same time to minimize the amount of sound we made. At one point, Megan started smothering me with a pillow because I had an allergy attack and kept sneezing. With the both of us now situated, we tried to relax, still being kind of terrorized by the sounds of someone shuffling around outside the door and the occasional cough. At around five, we heard what sounded like a small animal fall into the grate that also acted as a window for the basement bedroom and begin running around. The rocks at the bottom were moving and bouncing off the window, and then it went silent. About 10 minutes later, it sounded like another animal had fallen in and the sound started up again. This cycle continued for pretty much that entire hour. The entire time that all of this was happening, Megan and I were terrified. It was like that feeling you get right before your car gets rear-ended or right as you're about to go down a giant roller coaster hill. Just plain fear, anxiety, and the subtle feeling that something is just not right. It doesn't sound like much, but for some reason, Megan and I were just absolutely scared out of our minds. We both understood that we were not alone in that basement, and whatever was down there with us was actively trying to freak us out. We were saved at around seven. The sun started to rise, and we heard my uncle get up to take the dogs out. Neither Megan nor I had slept at all, and we suddenly felt exhausted as the adrenaline that had been fueling us the entire night seemed to die out. The sounds hadn't stopped, but they had significantly decreased as the hours passed. Now, hearing her dad up and about, we felt a little bit safer leaving the comfort of the bedroom. We quietly and quickly moved the mirror back to its space on the wall, and then, on the count of three, unlocked the door and ran to the stairs. We didn't stop to look around or turn off any of the lights, even though by that point the basement was fully illuminated with the sunlight and the lights that we had left on when vacating the living room. We booked it up the stairs and came to a screeching halt in the kitchen where her dad was making coffee. We immediately told him everything and begged him to check out the basement, still not fully convinced that it wasn't a normal person. He checked and sure enough, nothing had been tampered with and the entire basement was empty. Megan made some ramen for breakfast since we were starving and just wanted something comfortable. And after eating, she went upstairs to tell her mom. I stayed downstairs, eating and trying to come to terms with what I had just experienced. Her mom didn't believe her at first, but when I told the same story and Megan almost started crying from not being believed, she changed her mind. My aunt was resistant to the idea that her house, specifically the basement, was haunted. But then, later that year, she experienced it for herself. The main thing I remember from this whole ordeal was the fear. It was so raw and intense and there was just this weird knowledge that we weren't alone down there and that whatever it was, was not good. Megan and my other cousin theorized that it was Theodore, the name they had given the resident ghost that stays down there, but I don't think so. Nothing like that has happened to anyone else ever again, and it's just not what we know to be Theodore's style. I don't know. I don't know what was down there with us or who. I don't know why they were there or what they wanted, really. But there was something with us that night, and it scared me in a way that I have never, ever felt since. Everything happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, 
so I'll give you the facts of what happened, and you can come to your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately, and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm originally from Russia, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, and I was really excited about his proposal. As we're hiking, it starts raining, like pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there are no more paths and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time, we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep into the woods already and it was pouring buckets. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and thought that it was pretty cool, so we kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. It is a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we thought nothing of it and walked forward. Within seconds, we heard this thing right next to us, which seemed strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud now that it could have been a few feet away. We start looking all around, even looking up into the trees, and absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound starts up right next to us again. It was like something was telling us to book it, so we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory. We made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird and decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately websites like most haunted forests in Illinois started to pop up. Turns out that the place was the site of ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprising since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently, it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left naked in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and he wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think it's a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks. And since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20 something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb. I come along thinking that at least I could try to keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and we drive over there. Traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn. So we get there at around 11 PM. We get out and head into the forest. Now there's no street lights anywhere near us except right at the edge of the road and flashlights can only do so much. So our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river into the actually deep part of the forest. As soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but this was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, saying that there's nothing out here, stops all of a sudden. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic one that I've never felt before in any forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly, we hear crunching coming toward us from the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. No one talks until we get to the other side. And Ryan says, I, I was just nervous because, you know, it might have been a homeless person and 
I didn't want to deal with that. Right. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked, along the side. And that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s, just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost... I don't know the right word for it, but vibrating, undulating, I'm not sure. But there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of the road killing drivers. But I was willing to risk it because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or no ghost. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around, and with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips, she nods. I was hit with that same feeling that I had gotten back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, my sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died, well, at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat and next to Ryan, and he just starts to chat her up, flirting, asking her where she's from and what she's doing. Typical. All this time, I'm turned halfway around keeping an eye on her because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's keeping steady eye contact with me the entire time, even when Ryan is talking to her with that slow, creepy smile, while slightly undulating, I still don't know what to call it, but it seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and she says, oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar, and she nods her head yes, except there's not a single bar anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home, and gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car along nothing but forest. My eyes literally hurt from keeping eye contact with her, and she just keeps smiling and undulating and giving off this feeling of dread. This feeling just keeps increasing, so eventually we drop her off at her street. There are lots of old looking smaller houses there. When I turn back to look at her a second later, She's completely gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs, her smiling face undulating from the shadows. This incident occurred during the summer of 1983, as I was about to begin my senior year in high school. My family lived in rural Pennsylvania, in northern Indiana County. Our farmhouse was built in the mid-1800s. In the early 1900s, an addition was added to the back that more than doubled the size of the original house. The original house was a four-square house, so-called for the four square rooms, two on the first floor and two on the second floor, with a staircase in the back. The house as a whole was sturdy, albeit a bit cranky. Every night in summer, I fell asleep listening to the pops, cracks, creaking, and groans as the house cooled off in the night air. The house was built on high ground next to the mouth of an ancient ravine that ran for over a mile deeper and darker and rockier as it went, down to the north branch of a little creek. The ravine was heavily wooded at the beginning. Then the trees got sparser to a few old ones tenaciously rooted into the eroded rocks and glacial till. It was dark and cool and damp down in there, even on the hottest summer day. And I spent many summer days down in those woods. I knew the plants, the trees, the birds, the deer. I heard much that I couldn't see, like the rabbits running through the brush and the squirrels high up scolding me as I walked. I could sense the ones that hid and made no noise, 
the bobcats lurking in the nocturnal critters and peeking at my back after I passed their burrows. Sometimes sudden waves of total silence would descend on the woods. The air would be still. The birds would silence themselves. I taught myself to stop at these moments and to observe. I knew it wasn't me that made the animals go silent, so I figured something, a bobcat perhaps, was close by. I never saw what it was that caused the silences, but I loved to imagine myself as a skilled tracker. Nothing of the sort, of course, but I will claim to know those woods. I also had a friend and companion that roamed the woods and ravines around with me, a big male German shepherd named Chap. Chap loved to run and roam and chase groundhogs. We prowled along through the woods for years. This particular night, I awoke suddenly, very awake and alert. The wind was blowing against the open window. Our room had the crank-out windows that were popular in the 70s, when the hose had been remodeled. The bottom of the window tilted out and the rain ran off. There was a low rumble off in the distance, the thunder of a summer storm blowing in from the west. I was laying on my belly, my face on the left side on my pillow, and my arms around and under my pillow. I listened to the rain. It was not unusual for me to wake up in the middle of the night. It's been a regular occurrence in my life since I was very young. By that point, I was 17 years old. I was used to my 3 a.m. ritual, though still very irritated by it. Across the room, I could hear my brother breathing. I could hear our dog lying on the foot of my brother's bed, sniffing at the rainy night air blowing in the window. Across the hall from our room, I could hear my dad's low, steady, rumbling snore. Then I heard something that made my eyes fly open in the pitch black room. From down in the ravine, off in the distance, I heard an animal call unlike any I had ever heard. It was a roar, an angry roar. To the best of my knowledge, the apex predator in those woods was the bobcat, but this was too deep too throaty for a bobcat. Then I heard it again, surprisingly closer, a lot closer. I listened for my brother's breathing, silence. He was awake. What was that? I loudly whispered. I don't know, he whispered back. There was obvious concern in his voice. Then we heard it again. It had to be no more than 75 feet from the house, down at the corner of the yard where the trail led into the woods and down into the ravine. First of all, it was no bobcat. It was not a dog. It was not a coyote, and it was most definitely not a man. Next to my bed was a softball bat. I still have it, as a matter of fact. That night, all I wanted in the world was to slide my hand out from under the pillow and reach down and grab that bat. But I couldn't move. Everyone in the house seemed paralyzed. I kept expecting to hear my dad throw his bedroom door open, but he never made a sound. Then, two things happened in rapid succession. There was a tremendous crash, like something or someone had run headlong into the house. Then there was another roaring, screaming howl, this time right next to the house. It was an angry, roaring shout, so loud that I felt like it was next to my face. I had never in all my life heard an animal make a noise that loud. It was like a V8 engine with straight pipes was running wide open throttle. At the same time, there was a throbbing, a low frequency growl that seemed to make the house vibrate. All I could do was close my eyes and try to scream, but nothing came out. I must have passed out. The next thing I know, it was morning. The sun was shining. The house was still there. I slept in, which was very unusual in my family. I went downstairs and my dad and brother had already left for the day. My mom stood at the sink, washing dishes. I looked at my mom wide-eyed. Surely she had heard what happened. She met my eyes and pointed to the back porch of our house a small side room that housed the washing machine, dryer, and coat closet. 
I walked to the back porch to see that the door that led to the outside had been ripped from its hinges and lay flat on the floor of the porch. In the coat closet, with his nose pressed as far back as it could go, laying in a puddle of his own urine, was Chap. He lay there, whimpering for two days before he finally came out again. I was given the task to fix the door. When it was up and repaired, I went to my mom and basically asked, are we just gonna pretend that nothing happened last night? My mom sighed with obvious exasperation and said something along the lines of, well, what would you like to know? You know what that was, your dad knows, I know, we all know. Not much to talk about, other than how scary it was, and frankly, I don't need to talk about that, thank you. And for my family, that was pretty much the end of it. I brought it up once not long ago. My dad just shrugged and said, I know as much now as I did that night. Me? I drive there on occasion, when I'm in the area. I stop on the old country road and listen a while. I listen to the wind and the birds, and then I drive on. I'm telling this story for 80% entertainment value and 20% feedback. This is entirely true. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm resistant to energies and vibes, though I do believe that there are others who are more tapped into their surroundings than I am in that regard. And I'm a cynic with most paranormal things, except Bigfoot. I believe in the Squatch, but we ain't talking about him. I live in the foothills of Western North Carolina, near the base of the Blue Ridge. I lived in the mountains for a few years and hated it up there. I despised the woods with a burning passion. Yet, just my luck, I've moved back in with my folks, in their cabin, surrounded by woods. The land my family owns stretches across about 15 acres of woodland. Now, these are the woods I grew up in. Despite my typical aversion to nature, I do feel pretty safe in them. I climbed the trees and splashed in the creek and played with stick swords when I was a kid. These woods are home, except for the area behind the backyard. Our cabin is positioned at the top of a pretty steep hill that slopes down for about a half mile before it bottoms out at a creek down in the woods. The halfway point between the house and the creek is this little patch of woods right behind the fenced-in area around the house. It's always in shade. No thick undergrowth, just trees. Carolina red clay, piles of leaves, the usual. But it feels really weird down there in a way that I can't explain. I feel very unwelcome out behind the house, and I'm not the only one. My parents avoid it too, even our pets, past and present, have always steered clear of it. I'm going to list some experiences that might get my point across better. A. I was about eight or nine, and one summer, I thought I'd try camping in the backyard. I set up my family's unused tent, loaded it up with an air mattress and a pile of blankets, copper, my beloved deer stuffy, and some comic books. I guess I wanted to be excited about it, but even before the sun went down, when my mom was helping me set up my little camping trip, I felt uneasy. The shady patch of woods around the backyard was just weird, but I was a kid, so I figured, screw it, I'm 20 feet from the house, I'll be fine. I was not fine. I got set up for the night, stayed up reading comics, felt like an outdoorsman, and it had barely gotten dark when I began hearing loud, 
rhythmic crunching in the woods behind the backyard, like something big was walking in circles around the undergrowth. We don't have bears in my neck of the woods. Besides, whatever it was, it was definitely walking on two legs. It never tried to approach the backyard, even as I sat there with copper, just listening to it. It just kept walking. I barely lasted an hour in that tent before running inside and getting into my own bed. B. My mom is an avid gardener and decided that she was going to put together four or five raised gardening beds in the backyard for herbs and veggies. This was when I was 11-ish, so naturally I was roped in to help. We spent the first part of the spring putting them together and getting them started. I began noticing that both of us would get really edgy and irritable back there. We're best friends and we never fight, but we would be snapping at each other, constantly raising that stupid garden. I also noticed for the first time that the woods behind the house are deathly quiet. Playing music or talking didn't make any difference. It was that kind of silence that presses in on you. And it's always like that back there. The beds actually thrived for a little while, but mom would always ask me to come with her when she tended to them. I thought it was silly at the time. When I got older though, she told me she just couldn't be down there by herself. She'd wait until I was home from school before checking on them because she too felt uneasy and unwelcome. Eventually, we just abandoned the project. The raised beds are still down there, by the way, just rotting away in the undergrowth. I haven't checked on them since middle school and I'm 23 now. C. Lastly, and in my opinion, the creepiest, was the time that I asked mom to cut my hair. We were poorer then, so rather than go to a salon, mom just gave me a twice monthly trim. It was late spring and warm, so she suggested we cut it in the backyard for easier cleanup. I was maybe 13 or 14 at this point. So we ventured down, I brought a stool, and I sat diligently while she cut my hair. Side note, my mom has always cut my hair, so she's very good at it. She doesn't make mistakes. This is important. As she worked and we talked, I noticed that the old familiar feeling of unease was back. We were not welcome back there. The tree stood still and shadowy, despite the brilliant sunny day. And I remember that it was cold, very cold. Mom finished up my haircut and I shook off the extra debris to let her admire her handiwork. She stepped around in front of me, angled my head this way and that, and said it looked good. Three things happened then in very quick succession. First, I felt this squeeze of pressure on my lungs, like I couldn't breathe. It was such a weird sensation that I just froze. All of the uneasiness of the atmosphere pressed in on me all at once. Second, my mom got this weird, vacant look on her face. I remember her smile fading and her eyes going a little glassy, like she was lost in thought. And then she reached out with the scissors, still making this empty expression and snipped a deep cut into the skin over my left eye. I freaked out, jumped down off the stool, and backed away. At that same time, the third thing happened. She seemed to gather herself again. She was almost in tears. She apologized over and over again. We didn't even bother to take anything with us as we ran back up to the house to treat the cut and stop the bleeding. I still have a little scar there and she's never forgiven herself for it. There wasn't even a hair hanging over that eye either. I had a pixie cut at the time. So, yeah, 
a few of the many weird experiences that make me avoid the backyard now. I haven't even been down there in seven or eight years, but now that I'm living here again, I just sometimes look into the backyard and feel that weird shudder of apprehension. So what's the deal? Why don't we feel welcome in a 50 square foot patch of land that we own? Why is it so dark and quiet all the time? I have no idea, but my parents and I, we just work around it and pretend it isn't there. These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors. So he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip, just the two of us. For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. Seeing grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. The first incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt large knives attached to each side of his pack, bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25 mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise so as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40 pound pack makes it a little difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent, save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates that predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet, as he was behind me, so I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me, trying to get Harry's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. Harry quickly swung me around so that I was behind him, and he just started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly toward us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, and he bolted toward the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My boyfriend said, it's probably just some falling branches, but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up, and at the same moment, my boyfriend stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me, and I turned around to look behind me. 
To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we had been standing was a large black-brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just a few moments before. Its back was facing us, and then it stood on its hind legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, but that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My boyfriend was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and have a snack. About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line toward the clearing, toward us. Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. My husband, being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick and the bear ran off. All I could think was just my luck, but that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Night two. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you, just to make sure everything is okay. There weren't many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently, over the three days that we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. However, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems, so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boots, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and Harry was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing, and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear Harry or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was until after we had left. There was no moonlight, so all we had was the illumination from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I had fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, but just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing some music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sounds. He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiety was not paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. 
It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. Aside from everything else, it was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. Thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, and it was definitely not a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. Harry's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. I don't know. It shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but I couldn't decipher what it was. The steps stopped, and then the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inward. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside, so I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent. What I saw made my blood run cold. Pressed into the tent wall was the shape of a human face. I could make out the nose and open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. Harry said, F that, and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back, and we heard fast footsteps heading toward the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals that we had left on the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. At least, we think it was mud. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry. This story was posted to Reddit by user Wernever Klimt, who tells about a theater with a ghostly reputation. Here's the tale. About 30 years ago, I spent several years working in movie theaters in Worcester, Massachusetts. My favorite was the huge old building that had been chopped up into four separate cinemas. It had been a beautiful theater back when it was built in 1926 as the Poli Palace. Though it had been semi-destroyed during modernization in the late 50s, there were still many original features of the building that remained. As a manager, I had been issued a big keychain that gave me access to the entirety of the building, and I spent countless hours exploring nearly every part of that building. Except the curtain loft, which would have required climbing an iron ladder up about 80 feet. No thank you. The building had attics and basements and crawl spaces. There was an area in the front of the building on the second floor that had two or three abandoned businesses that had been walled off. There was a music store and a ballet studio and maybe an office. There was also a bathroom. Everything looked like it was from the 1940s or 50s. Faded wallpaper with ballerina motif, a peeling mirror on the wall. In another section of the building was the old manager's office, 
with high ceilings and crown molding and a beautiful stained glass window that I believe dated back to 1912 and had previously been part of an adjacent theater. There was still an old safe in the office. I found a newspaper article in the public library from 1942 or 44 that detailed an armed robbery when two men had tied up the managers in the office and robbed the safe. One of those men was later executed in the electric chair for an unrelated crime. We used the old manager's office to store giant 30-gallon bags of popcorn. There was also a sort of crawl space under the box office that was accessible by lifting a hinged plywood panel and climbing over a four-foot wall. On the other side were the remains of a couple of basement rooms with broken concrete and bricks strewn about. In one of those rooms, I found an old flared Coca-Cola glass in perfect condition. I kept it for years. I also found a deck of cards in a handmade leather pouch with a snap closure, fashioned out of a buffalo nickel. There were also old dressing rooms with makeup mirrors and light bulbs. The paint was peeling off the walls in potato chip sized flakes. As you can surmise, the building was purported to be haunted. The head manager claimed to have had ghostly experiences, so I'll start there, I guess. When the building was remodeled in the late 1950s, the men's room in the basement was converted into the manager's office. One night, while closing up, the manager, my boss, made his way up to the stairs to the main lobby. As he emerged, something caught his eye. Way up by the ornate 30-foot ceiling, he saw an apparition floating there. It disappeared into the ceiling. Terrified, he ran back down the stairs and hid in the office until daylight. Another time, he was again working late. There were several arcade machines in an area of the lobby, and they were normally powered off when the last shows were in. As he climbed the stairs, he heard all of the machines making their electronic bleeps and bloops. He was annoyed that the usher had clearly failed to turn off the machines before punching out and realized that he would have to go do it himself. As soon as he opened the door though, the noises stopped dead. Looking across the lobby from where he emerged, the machines were all dark. They were indeed powered off. A projectionist claimed that he looked out of the booth window one night in the big theater upstairs while shutting things down and saw a face looking in at him. I take those stories with a grain of salt. I was always skeptical of those based on the sources, but here's my experience. I was obsessed with the history of the building and would research newspaper archives for articles about it. There were rumors that a stagehand had died there in an accident during the time that it had been a vaudeville theater. I was never able to confirm that. I had talked about the building to my mother, and she, in turn, happened to discuss it with a woman that she worked with. The woman claimed to be a psychic or clairvoyant, or maybe just that she would get feelings about things. She told my mother that she had been to that theater, and that she felt that somebody had indeed been killed there, and that his name began with the letter M. My reaction was, okay, sure, she sounds nutty. Sometime later, I was the sole manager on duty on a slow night midweek. I was alone in the office in the basement. The seven o'clock shows were in, and I was doing paperwork. The intercom buzzed. It was the box office cashier calling to tell me that I had a phone call. I asked who it was, and she said that she didn't know. I hung up the intercom and pushed the button for the main incoming line where the call was holding. The earpiece erupted with a loud, close squealing and static. I used the word close because it was so loud and distinct that I assumed that it was something wrong with the phone PBX in our building rather than the line itself or the caller's phone. It was just the impression I had. Hello? Nothing. Just more squealing and static. Hello, I repeated. Hello? A man's voice. Calm, flat, distinct. Then nothing further. 
Who is this? I was a bit perplexed. All of the noise on the line and the caller seemingly reluctant to speak. This is Mike. Calm, quiet, not shouting over the noise of the line like he couldn't even hear it. Quite audible and clear, then nothing but the awful squealing and static. I waited a few seconds for the caller to continue. After all, he called me. Presumably there was a reason. But nothing. Mike who? I said, feeling a little bit impatient. Mike is a common name, and there were two Mikes employed there at the time. One of them had a fairly high-pitched voice that sounded nothing like the caller. It didn't sound like the other Mike either. The line abruptly went dead. Silent. The squealing and hissing stopped. I waited. Nobody called back. I called Sandy, the box office cashier, and asked her if they had asked for me personally or just to speak to the manager. She said that the caller had asked for me by name. And suddenly, I remembered my mother's friend. A man's name beginning with the letter M. Mike. It never happened again, and the phone never made those noises again. No one ever confessed to some kind of a prank. And I never figured out who it was. For our next story, Redditor The Odd News shares a fascinating tale about a coal mine and the ghost he encountered within it. Here's the story. I was born in 1968. I am the son of a miner, a father, and a miner myself. I'm the father of two children. The incident happened to me in the mine where I worked a year or two before I retired. Everything started after an accident in the mine. That day, I went to the workplace as usual. In the morning, after having breakfast in the canteen, I got into the cage to go 260 meters underground. When I say cage, I mean an elevator. We mine workers preferred to call it a cage instead of an elevator because it was a simple device that worked with a large crane rather than a true elevator. Anyway, I went down to the mine. After working until the end of the shift, I started walking toward the bottom of the shaft. We call the place where we get into the cage the bottom of the shaft. As I was walking slowly, an engine passed by me quickly. What we called an engine can be considered to be a small train. It was a relatively simple device compared to the train, pulling only wagons weighing up to one ton at most. There were workers on the engine. Normally, they are forbidden to do this, but sometimes when the workers are very tired after work, they ride on the engine to avoid walking. I continued to walk slowly as the engine sped past me. Then, there was shouting coming from up ahead. Someone seemed to be moaning in a wheezing voice. I moved toward the direction of the sound in order to understand exactly what was happening. I started to look around carefully. When I approached the place where the sound was coming from, I saw that somebody was lying in the water channel on the side of the air door. Blood was flowing from the person, like from a faucet. At that moment, I went into like a short-term shock. In that chaos, we immediately carried the injured person to the lift entrance, that bottom of the shaft, and sent him to the hospital. I still couldn't get over the shock of that image. That day, the person that was injured in that accident died. This incident affected me deeply. My psychology was turned upside down. According to what I learned later, the accident happened as follows. While the workers were traveling with the engine, the air door did not open. Since the engine was also fast, the engine hit the door with great violence. The worker who was caught between the engine and the door was crushed badly during the impact. In the days following this incident, when I passed through that gate, it always seemed to me as if somebody was still lying in that water channel. I couldn't pass through there by myself. 
Since the hearth was not sufficiently lit, it was always very dark inside there. It was only illuminated by fluorescent lamps, which were very sparsely placed in certain parts of the hearth. Because of the effect of this incident, I was completely disenchanted with work. I didn't feel like going to work at all, but I had to. Anyway, one day when I was at work again, I was the last one left at the end of the work in the area of the mine where we were all working in. When I looked around, everybody had left. I sat down somewhere. Such a weight fell on me that it seemed like a lifetime to go from there to the lift area. I said to myself, I'll just rest a little where I'm sitting and then I'll go. My eyes closed for a while. I was between sleep and wakefulness. I saw a man approaching me from up ahead, holding a lamp in his hand. There's no work left at the stove at this hour. I guess he stayed later, like me, I said to myself. That light that was approaching suddenly disappeared. Oh my gosh, where did this man go? I thought. Then I just thought, let me sit for one or two more minutes. Maybe the man who just disappeared will come back and we can go to the lift together. Then my eyes closed again. I don't know how much time passed, but suddenly I woke up with a very severe slap. But what a slap. I thought my neck was broken. I immediately recovered and looked around me. There was no one. It was impossible for somebody to hit me and run away and me not see them. For this reason, I started running toward the lift in fear and panic. That day, I didn't tell anybody about what happened. One or two weeks later, I was the last one again. This time, I hurried up and went straight to the lift entrance. As I sat down and waited for the lift to arrive, I noticed that something jet black was coming toward me. It had a hand lamp and a hard hat, but neither of them was lit. It was slowly approaching me. I called out, Master, what's wrong? Did the lamp malfunction? He didn't answer. Instead, it just kept coming toward me slowly. I felt such a strong sense of fear, and I didn't know why. I wanted to get up and leave. I even wanted to run away, but I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. Although he was very close to me, I couldn't see his face or body clearly. It was as if the man coming toward me was not a tangible substance, but a shadow. A silhouette. Don't ever sleep on the hearth again, he said to me. I could feel the man's speech, not in my ears, but in my brain. He spoke to me almost telepathically. And then he disappeared. I had heard of such events from a few other people before, but I never believed it. At that moment, all those stories that I had heard went through my mind. I read all the prayers I knew. That black silhouette had not harmed me, but living that moment had further disrupted my already broken psychology. I couldn't get up from where I was sitting for another one to two minutes. After a while, I pulled myself together and walked away from there. When I told my friends what had happened to me, they didn't believe me. When I told what had happened to me to the imam of the village where I lived, the imam did believe me and said the following. They are the owners of the mines. As you know, according to Islamic belief, the souls of martyrs can choose to stay in this world instead of going to the hereafter if they wish. According to a saying of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, those who die under the rubble are considered martyrs, just like those who die in war. That's why we call people who died in the mines, mine martyrs. Most probably, that thing you saw in the mine was the spirit of a mine martyr, and it warned you. He wanted to protect you. After my visit to the Imam, and after that day, I never slept in the mine again. Firstly, I will mention this didn't happen in an actual castle, but instead was an old Victorian hospital or workhouse. The property still has the name castle in it, so I call it my castle story. 
So in South Wales, I want to say in around 2011, I can't quite remember, as I would have been around 10 or 11 years old, this was a family holiday with my siblings and our family friends, which we call auntie and uncle, etc., because we're that close. It also involved all of the children who were around my age. In total, there were about 10 of us. I have never really been somebody to believe in the paranormal, but I would say that this is the only thing that would lean me toward it. The people who own the property are a couple, one of which is the sibling of a family friend we are staying with, and they are lovely. However, I cannot seem to get my head around how comfortable they are with this sort of thing. I also forgot to mention that this was a weekend surrounding Halloween time, which only intensifies the creepy aspect of this ordeal. On the first night, I was the only one out of the 10 of us who was actually terrified of the house itself. There was no central heating, no internet, as you can imagine in an old Victorian building. It was just creepy. As we sat at the table eating dinner, the owner, who lives in a lovely cottage right next to the building, came over to make sure we had everything we needed and to wish us a good night. She could tell that I was very distressed and tried to see what the matter was. I imagine she already had a very clear idea. I refused to tell her and began to get really emotional just from the fact that I was so scared. My mom explained that I was terrified and that my mind was probably just playing tricks on itself. Our host then went on to say, there's no one here that will hurt you. The next thing she said properly scared me, and I can still remember the sense of dread that came over me, despite being told it wasn't negative. She went on to say, the only other thing here is the little girl, and she is ever so friendly. Can you imagine being that scared on Halloween weekend, and then you're told that the place in which you're spending the next few nights has a ghost girl in it? After she told everyone this, I have to say the mood definitely changed. Even the adults were a bit like, hang on a second, what did she just say? The host reassured us that it was nothing to worry about and that her daughters used to speak to her through the walls all the time. I remember the other kids my age were a bit worried at this point, so their dad offered to take anyone who wanted upstairs to walk around and let them know that they were completely safe. It goes without saying that I was the only one who did not go. Over the next few hours, everyone relaxed by the fire and then all headed to bed. I remember the layout of the house, like it's my own, despite being there for only two days almost 10 years ago. I had asked my mom to stay with me until I fell asleep, and then she would go stay in the end room with my sisters. They are marginally younger than me and embarrassingly, were managing to sleep on their own just fine. My mom did so, and I fell asleep fine. I remember waking up and feeling at ease, but I wasn't ready for what came the next night. We had a day doing tourist things, and I remember that this was actually Halloween day. So when we came home, we got dressed and did the whole trick-or-treat thing around the surrounding village. I remember walking back to the house on the cold, dark Halloween night, up to the old, bendy, spooky road you take up to the house, and being greeted by this black obelisk we were sleeping in. This night started like the one before. We got cozy by the fire, the adults had a drink, and then we headed to bed. I was woken up at around two in the morning when I heard the sound of scratching and tapping coming from the ceiling. It was one of those moments when you wake up suddenly and you try to get your bearings, but everything around you is just disorienting. The scratching was constant and horrific, so I plucked up enough courage to run down the narrow, dark hallway, which stretched the whole length of the house to where my mum was sleeping. I got in the bed and tried to forget what I'd heard. When I woke up in the morning, it was pretty much eat breakfast and say goodbye and then leave as we had quite a long drive home. I remember driving back, I was told two things. It was like the good news and bad news cliche. My mom firstly told me the reason I was woken up and could hear scratching 
was because the roof was so old the ravens had made their way in and had started to nest. I remember this settled me. However, what came next truly still spooks me. My mom told me she had asked a family member back home to do some research on the building to see what the history was, but not to tell her until we left. She then went on to say that the castle is actually haunted by this little girl who would often run down the hallways. Of course, it's up to you if you believe in that sort of thing. But she went on to say that on both nights, she heard consistent running up the hall every few hours or so. She went on to say that she would often come to check on me to see if I had gotten up, but I was fast asleep. She was in the same room as my siblings, so it couldn't have been them. I have absolutely no explanation other than it could have been the birds, but I highly doubt it. I proceeded to quiz her and say, are you absolutely sure that it was footsteps? And although I was young, I remember her being very genuine. It was footsteps. This might seem like a mixture of an older spooky place and a frightened child's mind, but I can still remember all of it as clear as day. I was told the girl was probably looking to play with my siblings and I, and that's why she was running around. But it still freaks me out to this very day. This story is 100% true and takes place in Cincinnati, Ohio, specifically Claremont County. I'm female, 31 years old now, and this happened in 2006. So at the time, I was 17 going on 18. My boyfriend will call Mark, my friend will call Amy, and her boyfriend, now husband, will call Neil, are the ones involved in this unexplained event. So for some background first, there is this abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods. You can only get to it by walking about a mile one way. There are abandoned cars, an ambulance, some tractors, and some other random vehicles, like a short school bus, and they're all covered in gunshots. There's not even a path to drive a vehicle back there. If there were, we'd be walking a mile one way to get to them, so... I'm not even sure how they got there or how long they've been there. My boyfriend and I had gone with two other friends previously to this encounter, and it was creepy, but it was nothing compared to what happened when we went with Amy and Neil. So on our previous trip, we went with our friends that we'll call T and J. T and myself went upstairs and we had a Ouija board. We just asked random stupid questions that I can't even remember. What I do remember is that it spelled out hooey and we thought that was funny. We said goodbye on the board and we were looking around the upstairs, which was really just an attic. We found massive kids' socks in the walls, like tons of them. It was really random and weird. We got startled when an alarm clock started ticking it wouldn't stop, so I smashed it to pieces, and that was that. We walked downstairs where the boys were and made our way back outside. We found a creepy well that was all covered up. And then, all of a sudden, we heard that alarm clock start ticking again. But I know that I broke it, so it kind of spooked us out, but nothing major. We saw an outdoor cellar that we had gone into, and there was a child's boot seemingly a girl's, with a bone inside the shoe. So we were like, okay, we're done for today. So my boyfriend and I were telling Amy and Neil about this cabin and what had happened when T and J came with us. So we decided that we were gonna go later that day. The day that this encounter happened, Mark, Neil, Amy, and myself all went to the lake, packed a cooler with food and stuff like that, and probably spent about five hours or so at the lake, just eating and hanging out. 
We left the lake and stopped at Amy and Neil's homes, dropped the cooler off, which was in the trunk of the car, and then went on our way. After getting everything out of the trunk from our lake trip, we headed to my boyfriend's parents' house, where we parked the car and began our hour-long walk. We had flashlights, and that was it. The walk there was very uneventful. We had to walk through two huge drainage tunnels to get to this cabin. We make it there, and it wasn't dark out, but it seemed different this time. I'm not really sure how to explain it, but it was just different. We did come later in the day than previously, so I chalked it up to it being that. Just like last time, when we get inside, I decide to go upstairs and I ask Amy to come with me. I wanted to show her the socks in the wall, and I also wanted to check on that clock that I had broken on the last visit that I heard ticking outside previously. As we start to go up the stairs, there was this big crash, like something had been thrown or knocked over. Amy gets freaked out, and then out of nowhere, she books it outside and back down to the creek, yelling at Mark, Neil, and I to come on. I go chasing after her, and she's in tears, having a full-blown panic attack. She keeps talking, but I can't understand her. Finally, I get that she saw someone looking in the window at us. We tell the guys, and literally nobody is around. It's just the four of us. Since she's so distraught, we decide to just go ahead and leave. As we're walking back down the creek bed, heading back the same way we'd come, Mark and Neil are just kind of kicking over these huge rocks. We stop and realize that there are huge rocks, I would say boulders, standing right up in a line on the entryway down to the creek bed. They couldn't have been there, not even 20 minutes prior, because we would have noticed them when we were on our way there. So this seriously freaked us all out. This is not normal, and it's not natural. So we pick up the pace and start to haul ass out of there. We make it to the first drainage tunnel, and we turn on our flashlights. Literally, none of them will turn on. Four flashlights that worked perfectly fine on the way there. And now none of them will turn on. We were like, what is happening? So 30 minutes later, we're back at my boyfriend's parents' house where Amy and Neil had parked the car. Amy gets in the car because at this point, she's just ready to go home and forget that this event ever happened. The rest of us are still outside the car. Suddenly, Amy gets out of the car, screaming and jumping up and down and flailing around. She's covered in ants. We were like, what the hell is going on? So we look and they're coming from the back seat, from the trunk. Neil opens the trunk of his car and laying in there is this huge, rusty, extremely old wool sock covered in ants. Now remember what I said earlier? We had been in and out of that trunk all day long and there was nothing in that trunk when we left their house from dropping off the cooler. Now there's a wool sock covered in ants that covered the car? This was too much for any of us to wrap our heads around. Needless to say, we've never been back there. And personally, I will never go back. It turns out that the man who used to live in that cabin was named Hubert, and he was often called Hui. My boyfriend had actually been to the cabin once before I ever went, and he found these journals there. The man, well, let's just say he did some pretty terrible things to kids. His journals went into detail about it. Obviously, I'm not going into detail here. But looking back at that first Ouija board experience, Hui makes a lot more sense. This was honestly the first and only time that I had ever encountered something to this level. Like I said, I'll never go back. Even to this day when I talk about it, I get goosebumps. I can't explain what happened that day. And I have no idea what Amy saw that scared her so badly in that window. But I do know that boulders do not stand straight up on their own in a line, 
And nobody could have done that fast enough. Nobody could have messed with the four flashlights either, because we had them in our hands the whole time. And no physical person could have put that dirty old ant infested wool sock in Amy and Neil's car trunk. It was locked. So I guess the lesson I learned is if you're ever wandering through the woods and you come across a random cabin, just leave it alone. You never know who lived there, what they did, and who or what may still be there. Unfortunately, I think we learned that the very hard and unsettling way. I didn't believe in ghosts for the first 22 years of my life until I spent three months living in a haunted cabin. I always thought that there was some reasonable explanation for hauntings. And honestly, sometimes I still do. Maybe this wasn't a ghost. Maybe it was some kind of weird gravitational energy messing with things. But I'm getting ahead of myself. My roommate and I, let's call him Derek, moved out to Colorado with meager savings into a small cabin that was pretty much out in the boonies. Our closest neighbors used their cabins as summer homes, so we didn't really have anybody nearby. That's what's cool about living in the mountains, though. There's a sense of total isolation that you won't get anywhere else. You can turn off everything in your living space and hear nothing but the breeze. No highways, no car alarms, nothing. It's very peaceful. But after the first week or two in this cabin, Derek and I begin to notice weird things happening. First, there was this eerie feeling that we would get. I remember Derek once joking with me that he didn't like being in the cabin alone because it gave him creepy vibes. There was one back room in particular where if you stood in it at night, you would feel like you were being watched. Sometimes I would come home from work and just have this sense of total dread and unease with no explanation. At the time, I wrote it off as me just being paranoid. You know, hallucinating stuff that isn't there because I wasn't used to the total silence and winter isolation. I started noticing things getting moved around as well. One morning, my car keys would be missing and I'd frantically search, only to find them in a weird spot like on top of our refrigerator. I thought Derek was just messing with me, but he kept insisting that it wasn't him. Soon, he started having his stuff get moved too, and he would get really irritated at me, thinking that I was trying to prank him back, even though he hadn't pranked me in the first place. One night we were sitting around playing video games, when something flew across our field of vision. We both looked at each other for a second, before realizing that we had both seen it. For context, the cabin was a typical A-frame, so for the most part, it was one big room separated into a loft and a downstairs, with the kitchen and our beds at one end, and the living room, TV, wood stove at the other. Whatever small object flew across the room had gone from the kitchen all the way to the front door. We examined it closer, and found out that it was a single green bean from our meal that evening. We kind of held it up and looked at it for a second. It had flown all the way across the house, from the stovetop in the back, all the way to our front door. We really didn't have anything to say about it. It was just super weird. The next morning, though, was when I knew our house was haunted. I was watching some TV in the front room, when BAM, the roll of paper towels we had sitting on our kitchen counter flew into the table and knocked a glass of water everywhere. The roll had been thrown with force, to the point where I thought Derek had tried to chuck it at me. I turned around to tell him off, but then I realized he wasn't there. He'd been in the shower the whole time, getting ready for work. I felt a chill go down my spine. Some force spirit, ghost, whatever, had thrown this thing across the room. Derek didn't believe me when I told him, 
and I couldn't blame him, but he soon came to his senses. The next couple of months were crazy. Everything from car keys to full decks of cards to box cutters would be thrown around our apartment right in front of our eyes. We'd hear weird growling sounds at night that sounded like they were right in the middle of our house. To be fair, sound carries strangely in the mountains, so maybe we were just hearing some nearby animals, but still. One time, my roommate stormed out of the shower, furious. What the heck? He said. Why would you turn the lights out on me in the shower? I told him I had no idea what he was talking about. But by far the most frustrating thing was how our stuff just kept going missing. I mean, it got ridiculous. One night we left our car keys in a very particular spot just to see if they had been moved in the morning. When we woke up, they were gone. But not just that, they had been tucked between the pages of To Kill a Mockingbird on our little bookshelf. It took us hours to find them. Another morning, I could not for the life of me find my phone. We tried calling it, and it would ring, sounding loudly throughout the house, but we couldn't pinpoint the exact spot. Finally, we tracked the ringing to the bathroom, but it sounded like it was coming from behind the wall. The vanity sort of hung there, so I thought, eh, it's probably in the wall seeing how weird everything's been. Maybe there's a hole or something. I took the vanity off its hanging nail, and as soon as I moved it, my phone slid out the back and clattered onto the floor. Derek and I looked at each other, and his face was totally pale. How is that even possible? The haunting got to the point of just being silly. We had a friend come visit, and as soon as she opened the door, my car keys were thrown in her face from across the room. She was like, wait, is the cabin haunted? We kind of joked that, yeah, things get thrown around sometimes and you just have to ignore it. She didn't want to stay there anymore. And that was the point where I asked my landlady if she could provide some history on the cabin we were renting. She got really defensive about it and said she had owned it for years and nothing weird had ever happened there. Long story short, we got evicted a couple of months later. I don't really want to go into it because it doesn't have anything to do with the story. But yeah, the uneasiness persisted until we moved out. Although in the last month of living there, the ghost chilled out on throwing objects at us. I still don't have a concrete explanation for all of the weird things that happened. But I definitely believe in ghosts and other things that we don't understand. I have had many paranormal, seemingly extraterrestrial, glitch in the matrix and skinwalker experiences. I think one too many for one person to have. The one I am going to tell you about freaks me out to this day. There is quite a bit of detail to this story, so I will try to make it as coherent as possible. The time was 2011, my final year of high school. Now, I am a Navajo from a small reservation in New Mexico, and the nearest city is 30 miles west. I attended a public school in that city. Therefore, I had to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning to catch the bus at 6, which picked up more kids along the way, and we would arrive with just enough time to get breakfast before class at 7.25. This particular morning seemed normal. My alarm went off at 5. I showered, fixed my hair, and was ready by 5.40. I would usually give myself 10 to 15 minutes to make some breakfast and pack my lunch. I did just that and decided to have Pop-Tarts that morning. I checked the time on the stove clock and it was 5.50. I popped the tarts into the toaster and went to my room to gather my things into my backpack. As I was finished with that, I saw that my alarm clock read 5.55 and I went to grab my Pop-Tarts. 
The stove clock read 556. We had a big clock right by our front door, and it also read 556. I checked the time often so that I could perfectly time my walk to the bus so that it showed up just as I arrived at my bus stop. Additionally, it was a winter morning and it was dark out. The sun didn't start to come up until about seven and I didn't want to be stuck in the cold dark for too long. Normally, when I stepped outside, there would be cars driving about, neighbors who turned on their vehicles to warm them up from a frigid winter night. But that morning, there was nobody, and that was a bit strange to me, but I didn't pay that fact any mind. Now, since it's the reservation, aka the middle of nowhere, where I lived, there wasn't much light either. Few residents had streetlights in the cluster of homes where I lived. Unfortunately, the route that I walked every day had no streetlights, so the only lights I could see in the near pitch black were the ones at my back from our porch light in the north, a neighbor's porch light who lived three acres away in the southern direction, and the far off lights of the city that lit the sky in the east. There were also the lights from the reservation clinic, which was about a mile south as well. I should also let you know that each home in a cluster of homes is set on an acre lot. My bus stop was two acres away. I would walk directly south to meet up with the only paved road, the highway, which met the dirt road in the east. From my home to that stop, it only took me a minute or two. When I stepped outside, nothing was astir, which, like I said, was really odd. However, I wasn't out there alone, because although it was almost pitch black, I saw the silhouette of a girl who caught the bus at the same time as I did, and at the same stop. Good, I thought, I'm not out here alone. I followed about 10 feet behind her. When we neared the stop, she veered off to the cattle guard, where she always sat to wait for the bus. I always sat on the porch steps of my uncle's house when the bus hadn't arrived yet, which was only about five to 10 yards from the bus stop. When I sat on those steps, I started to notice more and more things that were out of place. One of those was the fact that my uncle, an early riser who was always awake by five, who always had his lights on by the time I was catching the bus, was not awake. He wasn't out having his morning coffee as usual. No lights, no sounds from inside his house. I thought, maybe he's sleeping in today. Then the neighbor whose home was three acres away from mine, my uncle's next door neighbor, whose porch light was on, would normally have had their vehicle running, warming up by now, and their lights would be on showing that somebody was awake and probably getting ready for work. But there were no signs of anybody being awake at all, and the truck wasn't on. Well, maybe they have the day off, I thought, still waiting for the bus. The other girl's silhouette I could see from the city lights that lit the sky to the east, and she was still sitting there and waiting as well. I was a little bit unsettled, but I didn't start to feel really creeped out until I started to hear the howls and yelps from what sounded to be a pack of coyotes that seemed to be only across the main highway. Since I didn't have a cell phone at the time, I had guessed that I was waiting for about 10 minutes. Finally, I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. Where is the bus? It should have been here by now. I was on time and it was very unlike the bus or the bus driver to pick us up more than five minutes late. I decided to wake up my uncle and ask if maybe we had missed the bus. So I knocked on his door for a good three minutes to no avail. Then I just decided to walk over and ask the girl if she wanted to walk back to our homes together, since I was sufficiently weirded out by the events. As I neared her and where she sat, my eyesight adjusted in the darkness, and when I was within arm's reach, I saw that there was nobody there. I thought I was going crazy. My mind raced and I felt panic and queasy in the pit of my stomach. All the creepy skinwalker and paranormal stories that I had heard over the years began to run amok in my mind. But what remains from those stories was that I was always told to never fear any of it. 
You should never be afraid of the evil things that lurk in the darkness, because your fear is their fuel. I decided not to panic and run home. Instead, I just walked briskly back home, still able to hear the whoops and calls from the nearby pack of coyotes and trying to figure out what was going on. When I got inside, I went to my mom's room and asked to use her cell phone. Just as she was about to hand me her cell, she took a second glance at the screen and said, it's four in the morning. What do you need my phone for? Shock took hold of my body, and all I could do was stand there with my mouth wide open as she trailed her remark with, Are you awake? Have you been sleepwalking? I have never sleptwalked in my entire life, and my reply felt forced, like I had to convince her that I was awake. I ran back to the kitchen. The clock read 4 a.m. The clock by the front door read 4 a.m. And the alarm clock in my room read 4 a.m. I don't know anything about any of these types of sleep disorders, but I seriously think that there's no way for me to have gone through with my usual routine the way that I did asleep. Needless to say, I was sufficiently freaked out and crawled back into bed. So freaked out I didn't even take my shoes off. I fell asleep thinking of the whole situation, and ironically, I missed the bus that day. I told my third oldest sister, there are four of us and I'm the youngest, about what had happened. She was a little shocked at what she was hearing, and then she began to tell me of a dream she had before my experience. Now, her dreams we have begun to revere as visions of sorts, since she's had many of them end up coming true. Her earliest one, I remember, was when we were in elementary school and my dad called and said that earlier in the day he was in a small airplane and that they nearly crashed into the mountains near San Carlos, Arizona. She told us about a dream about being in an airplane in a heavily forested area, that the plane was about to crash but was able to land safely a few days before we got that call from our dad. Since then, she's had others, some she tells us about, others she doesn't. Before I tell you about the dream, I must also tell you about a weird incident that happened to said sister at my eldest sister's house. This particular incident happened the summer preceding the winter. I had a weird experience. My sister, the dream visionary, would stay over at my eldest sister's house to help babysit my nephews. They would stay up very late, and one night or morning, because it was around 2 a.m., they heard a sort of banging in the back of the house. My sister and the nephew went out to check. When they opened the door, they saw two horses, one white and one brown, kicking with their hooves and hitting their heads against the big garbage bins, which were knocking into the house. It was as if they were trying to get in, but for what, we had no clue. To add to that weirdness, my sister's house is in a housing development that has two entrances, and since it's on the reservation, those entrances have cattle guards. So how could those two horses have gotten in? Anyway, they chased the horses out of the yard and they galloped off to who knows where. Anyway, back to her dream. She said that she was asleep at my eldest sister's house and woke up to the same banging noise that those horses had been making that night in the summer. She said she got up and walked to the front window and looked out past the blinds and saw those same horses standing just inches from her on the other side of the window. Then she saw the two horses shape shift into people, an in-law and his son. They had menacing looks on their faces, and she says she felt that they were pure evil. She yelled at them to go away, and as soon as she turned away, she saw me sleepwalking toward the back door. She went to grab me to put me back in bed, but as she got closer, she saw that the back door was wide open and that the sun was beckoning me to follow him, to go outside. As I took a few steps out the door, she pulled me back inside, slammed and locked the door, and laid me back down. And that was where her dream ended. The story, however, gets creepier. After that weird time warp occurrence coupled with my sister's dream, my mom decided to take me to see a medicine man, 
to have a prayer ceremony. He said that it was a skinwalker who was messing with our family. He said that the skinwalker intended to destroy my mom's life, but that she was too strong, and that the harm it wished for her would then fall to her children, the weaker ones. And here I thought I was being pretty strong. Further, he said that the skinwalker impersonated the shadow of the girl who usually rode the bus with me, and was also the one who created the sounds of the coyotes. The skinwalker created an illusion to lure me outside, and that the skinwalker was someone within the family. After the prayer ceremony, he said that I should never repeat anything that he said, or even the events that occurred. I don't think a lot of people heed that, though. I don't know if he would call it a warning or advice from the medicine man, but a lot of Navajos, if you get close enough to them, and they're not super traditional, will tell you all about scary and weird skinwalker stories of their own. They're pretty common, and even the ones that caused them to have to get a prayer or ceremony done, they'll tell those too. And this story is mine. My family and I moved to Colorado when I was eight, so around 1997. We lived with my brother and his family for a while until my parents found a more permanent place to settle. We had a few terrifying experiences in this house. The short version is that his basement was almost certainly home to something very bad. But these are my stories about some of the experiences in the house that we moved into after leaving my brother's. I will give you as brief a description of the place as I can. My parents found this house almost in the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately, it is now surrounded by new housing developments and stores. But when we first moved in, there were just fields for miles and miles, and we had a gorgeous, jaw-dropping view of the Rockies. The land left adjacent to our property was Rocky Flats, the place where they stored nuclear reactors and who knows what else underground for years and years. They claim it's all cleaned up now, but we still get dragonflies bigger than my head in spring. And once I even saw a two-headed bull snake in the backyard. Anyway, my parents got a good deal on rent and the landlord was fairly agreeable. To an outsider though, the living arrangements probably seemed strange. Our landlord was basically renting out his basement but the house functioned like an apartment building. We had our own entrances and our own driveway and garage, but we shared the mailbox and address. The main drive into the top portion of the house was a huge circle that branched off on either side going downhill into our section of drive and house. On your way down, you would pass this little brick building with a glass window and a very old, very visible toilet and a bunch of junk. It read General Store on the front. When my parents inquired about this strange setup, the landlord said that the whole property used to be a gas station a long time ago, when the highway that ran in front of the house was the only way into the mountains. Later, the big hill eroded a bit from the weather, and we found an old tank and bucket stuck in the hillside corroborating the story. The rest of the area was farmland. A steep drop below us behind the house was a horse stable, and beyond that, a pasture, where a farmer would rotate Angus cattle throughout the year. All of this is just to give you a sense of the area. We were literally surrounded by nothing, and sometimes it was a bit terrifying, albeit beautiful. First experience. One of my first nights sleeping in the house, I had a very vivid dream. As a kid, I never really had vivid dreams, so this was something entirely new to me. I remember walking out of my room in my dream and coming directly into the living room. My mother was sitting in her chair, staring at the TV, but there was a circle of people standing right in the middle of the room, people I didn't recognize and who didn't register me being there. They were looking at something on the floor in the middle of the circle. When I squeezed past them, I realized they were looking at a woman, 
lying on the floor, presumably dead. She was wearing a long, mauve-colored Victorian-styled dress, and her blonde hair was long and covered her face. I say she was dead because she wasn't moving, and a good chunk of her dress was visibly stained with blood. The most chilling part of this experience, however, was that her body was floating about four to five inches off the floor. When I noticed this detail, I also noticed that the people around her were chanting. As soon as I noted these two things, I woke up. Second experience. This one will forever give me chills when I think about it, and I will never forget it. I don't remember how long we had lived there at this point. I remember it being a normal night. My parents had gone to bed and I was tucking myself in. I don't remember dreaming about anything else that night. And if my memory serves me right, I had fallen asleep instantly and went right into this experience. I'm laying in bed, eyes closed. I can feel my body is asleep, but my mind is awake. I feel eyes on me. I open my eyes and see myself floating above me, staring down at me in bed. Then out of my periphery, I notice another me crouched in the entrance of my walk-in closet, also staring at me. Both of the me's had glowing red eyes. I remember wanting to scream, and when I closed my eyes to do so, I opened them again, and now was on the ceiling staring down into my bed. Bed me was still there, but it too had glowing red eyes. Closet me was also still there. They were both staring up at me. I screamed in silence. They began to grin wider than any human should be able to. And then I fell. I woke up in that instance for real, drenched in sweat, still in my bed, feeling like I was going to vomit. I didn't sleep the rest of the night and I've struggled with terrible insomnia ever since. Third experience. Remember the cattle herd that I mentioned earlier? Well, I'm pretty sure they were mutilated. My dad used to look out our back door with binoculars just to watch scenery and spy on distant neighbors. One day, I came home from school and he hands me the binoculars and says, look at the cow pasture, tell me what you see. It took me a minute to center on the right area, but once I did, my jaw dropped. The field, which usually housed about 50 head of Black Angus cattle, was completely empty, save for two black lumps on the ground. Ever since we moved there, that field had never been empty. We couldn't see properly that far away, so that night my dad and I crept down the hill with some flashlights to get a closer look. The two lumps turned out to be two cows, no heads, legs, or tails, and the torsos that were left were completely hollowed out. It wasn't like something had killed them and then snacked on them over time, no. We had coyotes come through all the time. We knew what that looked like. And also, these coyotes avoided these carcasses like the plague. They didn't smell, there was no blood or viscera, and the cuts were surgical. Everything about it made us creeped out. The farmer that owned that chunk of land never came back with the rest of his cattle, and eventually a for sale sign was erected after the bodies had rotted away into nothing. Those are three of the experiences I remember best from that place. Don't get me wrong, it definitely had its beautiful moment scenery-wise, but living on what was previously known as Rocky Flats was definitely weird to say the least. When I was a kid, I lived in Clinton, Tennessee. Both parents worked full time, so I was often sent over to stay with my grandparents who had a plot of land in the vicinity of, but not right in, Mossheim, near Greenville. Both of them had been in East Tennessee for their whole lives, and that area for a good many years. 
They had been established at their home for some decades before this story and remained there a good time after. Recently, I had reason to return to that area in Tennessee after having spent the majority of my adult life in Minnesota. Being in and around the area, driving the same roads, made me reminiscent about my lazy summer days tucked away at my grandparents, learning to shoot on the same 22 with which grandpa had taught mom, feeding fish at a neighbor's stocked pond, or spotting deer and bear with binoculars from the back porch. When I relayed this to my mom, she in turn told me a story about a time that I scared my grandpa half to death, then lied about hanging out with Bigfoot. At first I had no idea what she was on about. Then I remembered exactly what actually happened with startling clarity. New context given by the experience adulthood provides. And no, this is not about Bigfoot or a cryptid. Before we start, some information about my grandparents' land. Their house was on a small hill surrounded by a grass lawn. The lawn gave way to a smallish hay field and then the wood line. Those woods lasted for a good half mile to either side of the home and a good several miles to the back. I hated the hay field because it was too pokey to play in, but I liked to hang out in a creek that ran behind it. To get there, I would walk to the edge of the property, just in the wood line, to avoid the hay. While at my grandparents, the only rules were that I stayed where I could see the house, so the house could see me. I was to take a whistle with me anywhere that I went. I didn't take the whistle, seeing it as a badge of my regrettably young age, and the best part of the creek was out of sight of the house. That was the only stretch where it got deeper than my knees, and thus the only part where I could swim. Naturally, I spent much of my time in that water splashing around, skipping stones, and being a kid. One day, I was playing in the creek when I noticed someone. It was a man, a stranger, on the bank watching me. He had long hair, a beard, and pale skin so dirty that it was stained. I couldn't tell his age and simply thought of him as old. I have no better guess now, as he clearly went through long years of hard living. He wore no shirt, no pants, only a wrap of dirty cloth around his waist that I thought of at the time as a Moses dress, thanks to some illustrated Bible stories. Around his neck there were multiple necklaces made from knotted tatters of cloth, fiber, and string. In those knots were various pieces of bones, flowers, a bit of dark glass, things like that. When I first saw him there by the creek, I was terrified, terrified, frozen still. The man, however, was smiling. He gestured from his squat with an outstretched arm, fingers down, in kind of a wave. I didn't react, startled and reeling. Then he splashed at me, still smiling. He did it again. I splashed back, and soon we were playing. We both threw water at each other. He jumped into the creek and stomped around with me, laughing all the while. He threw rocks into the water, and so did I. I pushed him, he pushed me back. We carried on for some minutes, until my grandma called for me. With her voice, a switch had turned off. The man stopped in his tracks, gaze fixed back toward the house. Then, as my grandma kept on hollering, he looked to me. He crept back to his side of the creek, barely disturbing the water, then slid into the brush, completely silent the whole way, holding my gaze. Once he was out of sight, I waited in the water until my grandma found me. She wanted to know if I was alone, and I said no. She became very tense, asking who was with me while looking around. I didn't answer. I didn't know how. Seeing no one, she pulled me back to the house without any more words, grip like iron the whole time. At the house, the real inquisition began. I didn't really have new words, the event and this reaction overwhelming my ability to explain. 
Such silence further irked my grandma and I was swiftly placed in a corner, held without bail, awaiting patriarchal judgment. Around an hour later, my grandpa came home from work. He was told about my churlishness and was ready to set into me again with talking. I told him about the man, hairy and old, dressed like Moses, about how we played and he disappeared. I remember that they digested this for a few minutes before sending me to my room, and I was happy to go, and happier still that Grandpa didn't yell like he usually did when I misbehaved. Later, I was brought out for dinner. I ate in the kitchen with Grandma, but Grandpa called me to the back porch. He was on the swinging bench, looking out over the hayfield turned red by the setting sun. He had kicked off his boots and put them next to his shotgun. I knew that that was odd for the gun to be out of the closet. Previously, we had used it to shoot bottles. Some I would throw into the air like they were clay pigeons. These escapades were accompanied with speeches about how the gun was dangerous and only for adults to use. He went through my story again, his tone deadly serious. Eventually, he asked me how hairy the man was really. I told him very, thinking that this was the right answer. He asked where, and I told him everywhere, like a bear. He ruminated on this, and I grew more nervous, worried that I was in trouble or causing trouble, just wanting the trouble, whatever it was, to end. So when he finally asked me to swear, in the name of Christ and on my mother, that I was telling the truth about everything, I said that I had been joking. He finally yelled then and sent me back to my room. The family memory became that I had hid by the creek and made up a tale about Bigfoot. At the time, everybody was upset with me, and I was forbidden from going back to the creek or anywhere out of sight. The enforcement of this rule, like the others, was lackluster. Even so, for a time, I didn't go there. In my memory, I stayed away for a very long time, but I'm sure it was only a few days that hiatus feeling interminable to my elementary-aged self. When I did start going back to the crick, I took a bucket of toys and a thick stick plucked from the woodlands on the way. I think I was conflicted about what to do if the man came back, imagining either impressing him with my toy collection or clubbing him, or both in turn. When he did show back up, he appeared next to me as I dozed under a tree on my side of the crick. I was once again gripped with terror. He was not smiling, his face expressionless as he lurked beside me, having watched for who knows how long before I smelled him. I scrambled away, leaving behind my stick and toys. Coming to my feet a yard out, I stood in the sun while the man watched me from the shade. Eventually, he crouched and started to look through my bucket. I remember becoming indignant as he examined my toys one by one, only to toss them into the dirt. It became too much and I started to lecture the man, telling him how he got me in trouble and he was a weirdo and he stank. At some point, he stopped looking through my things and calmly watched my tirade. Face still neutral, eyes analytic. Once I had concluded my lecture, I sat back under the tree to pout. I remember the man made a noise, a grinding kind of snort, and when I looked over at him, he was chuckling while he inspected the last few figures in my bucket. I wanted to laugh too, but I was more determined to stay sullen. Once everything was out of the bucket, he put one figure, Ghidorah, back into the bucket. He then stood to his hunched fullest, took the bucket by its handle, began to make his way back into the woods. I stayed by the tree until he turned, said something, not a word that I knew then or know now, and gestured with a forward sweep of his hand. At first I didn't comply, despite knowing that he wanted me to follow. After a few moments he yipped, clicked his teeth, and gestured again more emphatically. With this further prompt I did get up and come along the man making approving noises and putting on his smile again. We went into the woods. 
The man led, but he was naturally quicker and quieter, making it hard for me to keep up. Eventually he would stop where he lost me, knocking on trees with sticks and whistling arrhythmically so that I might find him in the vegetation. He never came back for me, opting instead to guide me forward with the noises. I became lost, having only a vague sense of my grandparents' place behind me. After some time, maybe 15 minutes, we came to a bald. The man had me wait there, indicated by patting the ground, before going into the tree line alone. He returned from a different direction, pulling a sled. It was made from half of a discarded plastic drum and lined with small pelts and smooth bark. On the back half, there rested the fly-covered carcasses of squirrels, possums, and other critters savaged into anonymity. On the pulling end, woven pouches were tied into place on it by the same eclectic cordage that made the man's necklace. He put my bucket on the sled and tossed Ghidorah in a pouch. He then called me closer, with a glottal noise and a beckoning wave. I saw the sled's pouches held many odds and ends, dried salamanders, mushrooms, metal bits, glass fragments. From one, the man pulled a square, made from bound together sticks just big enough to slip over my wrist. From another, he pulled a piece of fool's gold and a small shard of geode crusted with a bit of purple crystal. These he handed to me with an air of busyness and a few more utterings of nonsense. He then patted the ground for me to sit again. I did so without much bewilderment, understanding that we had traded the same as exchanging Pokemon cards at Rhesus. I did not much miss Ghidorah anyway, as he was a bad guy. The bucket was a loss. In retrospect, I think Ghidorah was chosen because its dull gold scales resembled something valuable. The bucket for its obvious ability to hold things. The man came back lapping his thigh. I did this readily. During the hike back, I tried to keep up and pay attention. I did so moderately well, having to be whistled over a few times. I did notice that our path was not straight. The man led me one way and then another, making turns unneeded by the lay of the land. We eventually came out by the creek, but from a different approach than we had left it. I could hear my grandma calling for me again, not from up on the hill, from far out in the field. The man would not cross the creek, but pushed me to do so. I did, but not to go to my grandma. Instead, I crept back to the house and around the opposite side. There, I laid in the shrubs by our front door, pretending to sleep when I was found. I swore that I had been there the whole time. When I was sent back to my room, I placed my fool's gold, crystal, and charm in my bedside table for safekeeping. The next day, I went back into the creek to pick up my toys. The man was not there. However, throughout that summer, he did visit me again, to sit under the tree or throw rocks at the water or yammer softly to himself. I would bring snacks and candy to share, and he would likewise give me stringy dried meat, which I ought not to have eaten, or honeysuckle blossoms, which I would still eat, taken from my old bucket. He seldom visited long and never splashed and whooped like the first time he did on that first meeting. At this point, you might be wondering why I've posted this to Backwoods Creepy and not Backwoods Weird But Wholesome, I guess. Well, that's because there are two more occasions that I want to tell you about. One gruesome, one awful. The eventful one occurred near the 4th of July. I had brought two boxes of bang snaps to the creek. The man was initially wary of the little fireworks, but quickly came to appreciate their miniature pyrotechnics. He took the box I gave him gratefully, even taking the empty box, likely for the wood shavings, which are excellent tinder. During the use of the bang snaps, I had scared a turtle into the water and to the opposite bank. It sat there watching us from the far shore, if you're squeamish about animal stuff, this is probably a part you should skip. The man, after stowing the bang snaps in the bucket, noticed the turtle. 
With little thought, he scooped up a smooth stone and threw it with force and accuracy into the turtle. He then waded over to retrieve the slider, which struggled meekly in his grasp, one leg knocked off clean. On my side of the river, he took from the bucket a new piece of stone. One side was rounded and fit in his hand. The other came to a flinty cutting edge. Working with deft experience, the man began chopping the live turtle above its neck, pulling up on the shell top. I'll spare you the rest of the details, but the thing struggled and it was horrible to witness. The man rinsed the shell in the river and offered it to me. In wordless horror, I ran. That evening, I came back to shuffle the dead turtle into the flowering waters of the creek. The shell itself was nowhere to be found. This experience did not deter me from going to the creek or the man from visiting again. However, sometimes he would try to call me away from the creek with thumps and whistles. I would tell him I heard him and refused to move. On some occasions, he would join me. On others, he would leave. The last time we met, we were sitting under the tree sharing cowtails. From the woods, there came whistling and the staccato knocking of a woodpecker. The man looked up and whistled back. There were a few more such exchanges before he stood, collected his bucket, and beckoned for me to follow. I was curious and I felt comfortable with the man as a guide so I did as I was asked. He took me to the bald, a direct path this time, periodically stopping to call or respond to the other in the woods. Waiting for us at the bald was a woman and a child. The woman was dressed the same as the man, topless and wrapped around the waist. She was dirty with long hair and a wiry frame. The child was in a similar state, wearing a sack that went to their knees. The man sat on the ground and the woman joined him, sitting in his lap but leaning forward so that her elbows rested on her crossed knees. She had dark brown eyes that were fixed to me. The other child would not look up. I didn't know what to do and I didn't speak. The other kid lifted their sack to wipe at their nose. The man made a noise and drummed on the woman's back. The kid looked at them, still hanging her head hair covering her face. The woman yammered and swatted at what I now figured was a girl lazily, the man echoing her noises, slapping skin to skin once more. At this bizarre scene, the girl stumbled toward me, stopping close enough that I could smell her and hear her wheezing breath. She was thin but not emaciated and slightly taller than me should she have straightened up. The man and woman fussed some more and the girl leaned close and pressed her cheek to mine. Her hair was in between us, greasy and cold. She made no move to embrace me, no move at all, only pressing limply against me and breathing so loud that it was all I could hear. During this time, the woman had approached. She pulled the girl back by her shoulder with one hand and delivered a flurry of slaps to the crown of the girl's head. The woman then gathered the girl's hair into one hand, using the other to sweep back her bangs. The girl was then made to look at me, face bare. One side of her jaw was bulged out, smooth skin over a lemon-shaped bump. Her mouth was twisted by this deformity, her nose faced to one side as if affixed sideways and leaked a trail of clear snot. One eye was bulged and roomy, the other startlingly regular. It looked at me, blank and dark brown. The woman gave the girl's head a little shake, spat off to the side and then cooed like a dove as she smiled at me. I fled. There was commotion behind me. I think the girl was pushed to the ground. I did not look back and they did not pursue. My flight ended at my grandparents' house, my absence unnoticed. I chose not to tell anyone what had happened, wanting to forget and not wanting to get into trouble again, not thinking about the girl, the couple, and what might have been intended for me. I spent that August inside whenever I visited my grandparents. I begged not to be taken, claiming that it was boring and lonely, 
Sometimes when I sat on the porch or went from the car to the house, I'd catch a snippet of a bird call on the wind or the distant tapping of wood and hurry inside. My grandma could tell something was wrong and made an effort to entertain me in town. My grandpa cared in his own way, involving me in his errands as he never had before. Eventually, school started. Classes and friends eased me away from the thoughts of the dirty man and the people in the clearing. Time did the rest. I think now that all of the people in the clearing were a family, but their features, white skin, brown eyes, brown hair, are common enough that they all could have been unrelated. They knew each other's signs and signals. They used their own words. I know that the Smokies are full of tales of feral people, wild men, and superstition. I also know that they are full of people living in unlikely ways in unlikely places, and that those real people call others kin. And that, through the chain of human connection, even a recluse living in a rundown shack is someone's somebody. I guess I'm asking if the people in my story are somebody, someone too, or if they're known, if their behavior rings any bells, belies any known intention. I figure that wherever this tale goes, maybe somebody will know who they are, and hopefully you won't discount this tale out of hand. Either way, now that I've remembered everything about that time period, I doubt I'll ever forget it again. My parents recently bought a farm last year in Australia and have been building a property on it for their retirement. It's right beside a national park and reasonably close to the next property over. The only thing that sucks is that we have no cell service, besides the top paddock where they're building their house. Not too dodgy, right? Well, I'm a university student, 21-year-old female in my second year of nursing, and I frequently come up to the farm to help them out with their livestock and whatnot. At first, everything was fine. We had a small two-bedroom cabin in the lower paddock that I stayed in every time I came up. My room had a large window that faced the national park, and at night, when it was pitch black, it would really freak me out a bit, but nothing serious. Sure, we had the usual noises of foxes and livestock at nighttime, but nothing out of the ordinary. Things really ramped up when I had to stay there alone to feed the livestock for a few days while my parents were back in the city. I went about the usual chores, feeding the sheep, keeping an eye on our lambs and checking in at the building site to keep an eye on everything. I went into town to get some dinner at the local pub, and by the time I got home, it was roughly 10 p.m. I would usually take my car up to the top paddock at night to call my friends, check social media, and so on. My car was lit up by internal navigation systems which meant that I couldn't really see outside the car besides whatever my headlights lit up. I was midway through my social media scrolling when I thought I saw something black flash across the paddocks where my headlights were facing. I drove my car in a quick circle to use my car's headlights as a massive torch, but I didn't see anything. No reflections of cattle's eyes like I normally do, or the usual fox or rabbit there was nothing. I tried not to pay too much attention to it, and I went back to my social media scroll. Until I accidentally pressed my brakes, which allowed my brake lights to flood the paddock behind my car with an eerie red light. The same black flash that I had seen through my front windshield flickered out of the corner of my eye in the rearview mirror. Now I was suspicious. I turned off the music I'd been listening to and just sat for a second, trying to assure myself I was just tired. After a few seconds of silence, I was relieved and was about to turn my car on to go back to the cabin. And that's when I heard what I can only describe as claws on my rear windshield. Tap, tap, scratch. 
I have never sped as fast as I did back to the cabin that night. That night, I couldn't shake the feeling of something watching me from the forest. You know that sort of tingling sensation of something staring into the back of your head? After tossing and turning, I put up a newspaper in front of my window, the one that faces the woods, until it was completely covered. The feeling immediately went away. Still, it's safe to say that sleep did not come easily. The following night, I chose to go to the top paddock while it was still reasonably light. All was pretty peaceful, and I had all but forgotten about the previous night's events. I was admiring the gorgeous pink sunset when I saw a flash of green in the sky travel for a split second and then disappear. Now listen, I'm not one for UFOs, but I know it wasn't a helicopter because it was light enough to see the sky and the stars weren't even out yet. I thought it was cool, so I called one of my friends who's a massive skeptic about everything paranormal. Of course, she thought I was nuts and proceeded to give me crap for it. It started to get a bit dark for my liking, so I went back to the cabin and cooked some dinner. All was fine, until I went to sleep, the newspaper from the night before still clinging to my window. I woke up at around 2 a.m. to a sound. I went to take a look on foot with my spotlight. Now, usually, when you bring a very bright light and irritate the sheep, who were already going nuts, you hear about it. Keyword being, usually. I walked over to the paddock and started scanning with my spotlight, and I didn't see anything. The sheep were bleating like crazy, but none were injured or even remotely in a corner of the paddock, huddled together like they usually do when there's a fox or a predator. That was, until they all went silent. One second they were so loud that they echoed around the hills, and the next, it was dead silent. Now I was truly scared. I raised my rifle and started looking around, feeling like everything around me had its eyes on me. It was then that I heard a thump of something heavy being dropped on the ground, heavy enough for me to feel the vibration in my feet. I booked it back to the cabin and locked everything behind me. I was pacing around, double-checking the doors and windows when I heard it. It sounded like humming, but it was distorted and there were footsteps with it. These footsteps were not human though. It's like something was limping and then quickly recovering. Step, 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 around the cabin and stopping at my bedroom window. I curled to the ground, gripping my rifle until my fingers were frozen in place. And that's how I fell asleep that night. I left first thing in the morning without even looking to see if there were footprints or anything else. If anyone has any clue what's going on, or what this thing is, and can tell me what I can do, let me know, because I haven't been able to go back to my parents' farm ever since. In order to really convey how scared I was when this happened, I'm gonna have to back up and give you a little context. For starters, I've told the whole story to maybe a handful of my closest friends, and the only family I've ever told is my twin sister. Even then, it only came up because they initiated conversations about similar topics regarding the paranormal. If I can help it, I'd rather not talk about it in real life. But here, on the wilds of the internet though, I guess I feel a little bit safer. It's also worth noting that I've included several instances that may or may not be related. Whether or not they truly are is a matter of personal speculation, but they are all paranormal nonetheless. If I had to pinpoint where it all began, I would say it was 2008, when I stayed home alone pretty much all summer. 
My sisters attended the Boys and Girls Club, and my parents worked all day. I was just a 13-year-old boy then, so staying home alone was pretty much the greatest thing I could think of. All I had on the agenda every day was eating junk food, playing video games, and doing whatever small chores I was assigned. Not a bad way to spend a summer. And it wasn't. For a few weeks, anyhow. When things started, though, they started small. Every couple of days, my mom would come home pissed off when she saw both of our dogs outside. We lived in North Alabama, so summer was hot and swampy. Because of that, we tended to keep the dogs inside until they needed to be let out to do their business, but it would never be any more than about 10 minutes. I loved those dogs, so I adhered to the 10-minute rule very strictly. It was also why I was so confused to see them outside on those days. I definitely did not let them out. Sure, I can be forgetful sometimes. Maybe one or two of those times I really did just have a brain fart. But I was 100% sure that most of those times I never let those dogs out. When I told that to my mom, she looked kind of concerned. Then I started hearing things. With freshly installed hardwood floors, I was familiar with the sound of them settling when the AC kicked on. It would be one or two popping sounds, then it would stop, until the AC turned off again. Rinse and repeat. Nothing crazy about that. One day, while I was binge playing old Nintendo games, I heard the boards settling again. But this time, it wasn't because of the AC. And instead of one or two pops, there were several dozen, moving around. They went up and down the hallway, like somebody was pacing around. I paused my game and I listened to them. Thinking maybe my mom or my stepdad were back early from work, I went out to see them, and make sure the dogs were back inside so I wouldn't get chewed out again. But nobody was home. I shrugged it off as the floorboards just being particularly active that day, and I went back to playing my game once more. About an hour passed before the sounds repeated. The same quiet little footsteps. I paused my game again, and I listened harder this time. Another sound surfaced on top of the steps. It was kind of like trying to hear somebody else's phone call from across the room. You know there's a conversation going on, but you can't quite make out what it's about. I went to look again, this time going all the way across the house and into my parents' room. Still nobody. Then I thought, well, maybe the conversation was coming from outside in the neighborhood. I brought the dogs out back with me, and they went and did their business while I waited on the porch. From what I could tell, it was just another stiff, silent summer day. This particular thing happened a few more times, and it always made me feel really uneasy. It was even worse when I told my mom about it. She replied, Oh good, you hear it too. Then she went on to tell me not to tell my stepdad, because he was very religious and for some reason didn't believe in any of this stuff. Things settled down after summer was over and they stayed that way for a while. I had school to keep me occupied, and other than a few small instances, we had two quiet years. 2010 was the year things picked up a lot more. While my twin and my girlfriend at the time were hanging out in her room, they started messing around taking dumb pictures with digital cameras. Now, my twin's room was the coldest in the house, and nobody could ever figure out why. It also used to belong to my older sister. Both times either of them moved into the room, their demeanor would change over the course of a few months. Where my older sister became more manic, throwing tantrums with growing frequency, my twin was starting to get depressed sleeping all the time and always being fairly disconnected. While all three women in the house suffered from manic depression, bipolar disorder, and sometimes both, there was a very noticeable difference when my sisters occupied the room. In that digital camera my twin was playing around with, there was a picture on it that we didn't find for weeks after the fact that showed my girlfriend at the time and a really weird, smoky, veil-like presence in the room with them. Neither of them smoked, and the room never smelled like anything, so we weren't allowed to have candles in our room either. 
I'm still kicking myself for not saving that photo somewhere, because I think it might have been a good piece of evidence. On top of the apparition caught on my camera, my mother told me of an instance where footsteps walked from the kitchen and into the study where she worked on some stuff for her job. When the steps entered the room, she heard a voice whisper, ouch, very clearly into her ear. The next few experiences were things only I witnessed. They are, by and large, the more extreme parts of what I now guess to be a haunting, and they started in the summer of the same year, with my first episode of sleep paralysis. I had known about the phenomenon before it happened to me. My mom was a sufferer of frequent night terrors and the occasional paralysis. I also had a friend with narcolepsy that told me about it at school. The first time it happened to me, I wasn't too unsettled. It was on a weekend, and I drifted off watching Netflix. The next thing I knew, I was wide awake, and a few episodes of the show had gone by. I reached for a bottle of water by my bed, but I found that I couldn't move at all. It was strange, and almost calm. I just kind of accepted what was happening, and I let it run its course. It eventually did. I got up, had a drink of water, went to the bathroom, and then went back to bed. A few days after the paralysis, things started moving around on their own. Another day spent home alone, I was once again playing video games and avoiding any responsibilities. As I had tried giving up soda that year, I almost always had a cup on my desk, filled either with orange juice or empty. There was rarely an in-between. This cup, however, just fell over in front of my eyes. There was no slant on the desk or anything like that. Nothing other than the cup was on it. It just tipped over, like someone had smacked it over. While I thought it was odd, I set it back upright and went on with my gaming. I had settled that it was some kind of trick of gravity, which in hindsight sounds way more ridiculous than a poltergeist. This was immediately followed by the sound of a bird hitting my window, my light bulb exploding overhead, and the cup once again tipping over. Unable to rationalize it this time, I scrambled out of my room and into the kitchen, where my stepdad was eating. As I said earlier, my mom asked me not to talk to him about anything paranormal, but I was pretty shook up by what I had just seen. He asked me if I was alright. I told him that a bird had flown into my window and kind of scared the crap out of me, to which he laughed. I didn't sleep very well that night. The last and most extreme incident I had at that house happened just about a week later, my second episode of a sleep paralysis. It was a Sunday morning and I could hear my family moving about the house to get ready. It didn't take me long to prepare myself, so I tended to sleep in an extra 15 minutes. As I fell back to sleep, a familiar feeling came over me. Unable to speak, I couldn't call for help. A weight on my chest made it difficult to breathe. I was incapable of moving. Thinking it would pass like last time, I just waited. It became evident very quickly that this was not going to be like last time. What little daylight there was coming in through the curtains turned blood red. Instead of the calm I had during the first episode, I grew very unsettled. It was dark now, and the room looked like one of those photo development rooms in terms of color. My door opened on its own. A figure stood there, just looked like a silhouette, all dark and shrouded. It wore what appeared to be a robe made of thick fur, and kept its hood drawn over. Even though my room was normally comfortable, I felt the temperature drop. I could see my own breath, and the breath of this figure. It just kept staring at me. Something about it felt evil like it was waiting to do something awful to me. I tried to yell and make it go away. I even attempted to invoke the name of Christ, but I couldn't speak or breathe enough to do so. The blood red changed to pitch black. The figure disappeared into it, but a pair of dark red eyes pierced through me from where it stood. I then saw two numbers sort of fly at me. 13 and three. That's when the paralysis ended, I got up, and I went to church. I've since lost my faith and I'm no longer religious, 
Just what I saw that morning is still a mystery to me. But I did follow up on those two numbers that same morning in church. Psalm chapter 13, verse 3, reads in the King James Version, quote, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Needless to say, I got chills, and I still do every time I tell the story. In this tale, Reddit user expert maybe 5106 tells an eclectic mix of tales that happened at their haunted house. Here are the stories. My house has been haunted all my life. It started in the apartment I lived in as a kid, but it followed me to where I'm currently living. In the past 10 years, I've experienced more paranormal activity than most people have in their lives. It started with an attachment I had from using a Ouija board at 11 years old. Since I have so many paranormal experiences to share, I'm going to limit this story to the things that have taken place in my current home, with a focus on the most significant things to take place here over the years. To preface this, I'd like to say that I'm a 21-year-old female, but when I moved into my current home, I was 13. I was living with both of my parents, four cats, and a dog. Now it's just myself, my dad, my girlfriend, three cats, and a dog living here. The history of the house isn't overly important. We bought it from a family, the woman that lived in the house had been moved to a hospice where she'd passed away, and her kids were selling her condo. Her name was Helen. That is as much significant history as there is to my current home. Outside of that, it seems that the entities in our home aren't necessarily attached to the location as much as they are attached to us. A little background on the spirits in my house. I know Helen is here. She has been heard by multiple people. She has a distinct old lady perfume smell and a calming feel that comes along with her. We also have an unknown number of spirits or entities in the basement. I have a hard time explaining them, because I don't know if there are multiple male human spirits, or one inhuman spirit making it seem like more than one. But whatever it is, it feels dark and masculine, if that makes sense. Helen mainly stays upstairs, and whatever is dark typically stays in the basement. The main floor is typically more poltergeist-type activity. That being said, on to some specific experiences. I'm going to start with the most asked about thing that has ever happened to me. Anyone who knows me or hears about this asks me about it. So, one day I was probably around 14. I was in my bed late at night, responding to Snapchat streaks, but being a teen laying in bed, makeup probably off, I didn't feel like sending pictures of my face or really putting any effort in but I also didn't want to just send a black screen. So I was taking pictures of my bedroom door because our hall light was on. After snapping and sending a few photos, my camera started to struggle to focus. It wouldn't take the picture because it just kept trying to focus. Finally, the picture took and a dark black figure was peering in at me in the photo. It was out of focus, of course, but I freaked out. I looked up and saw nothing, so I snapped another photo, and that one came out clear, and there was no figure. At that time, I'd say that was the beginning of things taking a turn for the worst. A few days passed, and I had gotten three scratches down my back in the shower. My aunt had heard about what I was experiencing, and had a friend who was a Wiccan priest or something come over. I will say, I wasn't necessarily open-minded to Wicca. It seemed like BS to me at first, but this man had told me that there are ways that we can open portals between our worlds and others. Sometimes intentionally, but not always. He told me that candles give off a pure white light, but when set in front of a mirror, 
that light doubles and turns impure or dark. It's hard to explain, but as I understood it, a candle alone equals good, and a candle in front of a mirror equals bad. He said if you have a candle in front of a mirror and look into that, it can open a portal to darker dimensions. Again, as he was first telling me this, I was thinking that it was BS. But then I remembered. Just days before I had seen the figure in my bedroom, I had taken a photo sitting in front of my bedroom mirror with a candle darn near in my lap. He told me to throw a sheet over the mirror without looking into it and get rid of it or remove it, whatever I had to do. My dad did so, and the second the sheet covered the mirror, the power went out only in my bedroom. The rest of the house was fine. That was when I started to take this Wicca stuff more seriously. A little while passed and things seemed a little bit less dark or aggressive, but something was definitely still there. That's when the event occurred that caused us to call a priest to come bless our home and myself. I had been home alone one day and had an experience that is hard for me to explain. Other people will simply say that I was possessed for a few hours, but for me, it's more confusing than that. I have a lapse in time, in memory, where people are telling me that I did things that I don't remember doing. I remember being on FaceTime with my best friend. I had walked into my upstairs bathroom, which is weirdly a hot spot for activity in the house, the same room that I got scratched in. After walking into the bathroom, I don't remember anything else until hours later. So what I'm telling you from here until I snapped out of it was told to me by witnesses. My best friend said that while on FaceTime, the lights began to flicker in the bathroom and I just stopped talking and it was like I was staring up ahead past my phone. My friend asked me what was wrong and I responded with, I can't leave, there's someone blocking the door. Right away she knew something wasn't right and told me to just go out, but I guess I ended up hanging up the phone. We had another friend who lived like two blocks away from me, so my best friend called her and told her that she needed to go check on me. When she got to my house, she looked for me everywhere. Upstairs, main floor, basement, every room, but I was nowhere to be found. Just as she was coming down the stairs to leave, she saw me standing in the middle of the main floor. If you walked into my house, you couldn't have missed me. So she asked me where I'd come from and that she'd been looking for me. She said I responded so calmly and eerily that it wasn't even like it was me talking. I told her I had been in the bathroom and she said, no, you weren't. I just looked in there. Once she said that, she said that I completely changed and she could tell that it like enraged me or something. I told her that she needed to leave and apparently I even said, you aren't welcome here. Being a 14 year old girl talking to one of her best friends, that definitely wasn't like me. She tried to argue over leaving, but apparently the more she did, the more aggressive I got about telling her to get out. So out of fear, she left and she and my friends just kept trying to call and text me to snap me out of it. Three hours passed and no one knows what I was up to. But I posted a picture on my Snapchat story of myself in the mirror that was covered, you know, the portal mirror, with the caption saying something about it being time to stop being scared or stop running or something super creepy. The next thing I remember is sitting on the couch, and the best way I can describe it is this. It felt like waking up from a nap, except that I didn't remember falling asleep or even going to sit on the couch. After that, we did a little bit more research and we talked with the Wiccan priest. I ended up finding out that I had an attachment that I created, like I said, with that Ouija board at 11, and then I just strengthened it with the mirror portal. I was blessed and so was the house, and for a long time things were better. My house, though, is still extremely haunted, 
and I could share a lot more about it. Little things here and there, like hearing a deep guttural growl coming from the basement stairs, my dog not being willing to go in the basement, hearing voices being touched, objects moving, stuff like that. But this story is about the craziest stuff that's happened to me. This happened about two years ago, nearing the end of September. My aunt and her friend decided to fly up to New York from Panama to enjoy a mini vacation with my parents and I. Although many strange and paranormal experiences have happened to me ever since I was little, this event stayed with me and affected me more than the other experiences. A lot of things have happened to my family members, especially my aunt and her friend but that's for later. So it was around 10.30 at night. Keep in mind that my old neighborhood was a very calm and quiet place. Since I live near the countryside, not much action happens in the neighborhoods. The neighbors were either elderly or young couples with smaller children, none that really caused trouble around the neighborhood. There were only about 20 to 25 houses in the entire neighborhood that I lived in. The three of us decided to stay up late and watch scary movies while my parents slept upstairs in their room. My aunt's friend was sitting near the slide doors leading to the backyard while my aunt and I were sitting in the bigger couch near the front door. I was sitting on the left side where the door faced and my aunt sat on the right side of me, which meant I was closest to the front door. We spent about 10 minutes debating on which movie we should watch. After those 10 minutes, we finally chose to watch Odd Thomas, which wasn't really a scary movie, but it was about a guy who could see spirits and demons. We were only two minutes into the movie when I had the sudden urge to look at the door. I glanced back at my aunt and her friend, only to see them staring at the door as well. I looked back at the door for about five seconds and then a loud bang came, then another one following after, and then a third. All three bangs came from the front door. It was like five people had just body slammed into the door three times. I thought it was going to fly off its frame. My first instinct was to run to the kitchen and grab a knife. But as I was about to do that, my aunt grabbed my shirt and told me to stay down. As I looked to my right, I saw my aunt's friend with her knees to her chest, rocking herself back and forth, while my aunt just kept her gaze toward the door. While all three of us kept our attention on the door, next to it there were two small rectangular windows on either side. The right window had a small curtain, and the left was being covered with a small decorative tree. The small curtain had a gap in between, because it was glued onto the windows from the top area to the bottom, leaving the middle part loose. At the moment of the bangs, it caused the middle area of the curtain to puff up slowly and then quickly press against the window, leaving it wrinkled. After that, we were all silent. All of us were terrified. My aunt denied being scared, but at that moment, I could see nothing but fear in her face. I wanted to run upstairs to get my parents, but I was too afraid to go up the stairs because it was right in front of the door. All I could do was text and call them, but they were too deep in their sleep to hear the phones ring. My aunt told the two of us to calm down and dismissed it as wind. We all knew that it couldn't have been, but in order to stay calm, she made up that excuse. It was totally cliche. The next morning, I told my mother about the previous events. She brushed it off, saying that it must have been a bear or a deer. Another cliche thing to say. We both went outside to inspect and found my mom's decorations near the front of the door thrown off to the side. There were no scratch marks or bumps on the door. Everything seemed normal, except her decorations laying to the side. When the three of us looked at the door, 
the night of the event, there wasn't anything that could have caught our attention. The woods were 40 meters away from the house, and we would have heard the trees moving with the wind if it was that, but we heard nothing. It was so strange how we all felt this sudden urge to look at the door at that time. It was like we all collectively knew that something was about to happen. The bangs were extremely loud and caused me to jump up from the couch. It couldn't have been kids playing a prank on us because I had been living there for about three years and nothing like that had ever happened. Plus I knew the neighbors well enough to know that they would never do such a thing. There were exactly three bangs, one after the other, and one could have honestly caused the door to fly out of place, but thank God it didn't. What about the curtain? The only explanation that we could come up with was that the impact of the bangs created the wind, causing the curtain to react that way. But why did it inflate slowly, as if the bangs were rapid, and then suddenly cause it to go against the window so fast after they were over? My aunt thinks that the wind must have been knocked off its course, and that's why we didn't hear the trees moving, and it created huge columns of wind that must have caused the doors to move so much. The gust of wind must have gotten inside the house from the cracks of the door, leading to the curtain being puffed up. Personally, it doesn't make sense, and it sounds like total BS to me. She also mentioned that she saw a shadow outside, but she doesn't have an explanation for that. I didn't see the shadow, though. My mother came up with an excuse as well. She said it must have been a deer or a bear. But why would a deer or a bear bang their head or body into a door? Like I said previously, there were no scratch marks to prove that it was an animal. No animal could have caused those three loud bangs. We've had deer sightings in that neighborhood before, but none have ever exhibited that kind of strange behavior. If anything, they run away from you back into the woods. Bears are out of the question. Not once has there ever been a sighting of them around where I am. I should also mention that we had the lights from outside on, so why would an animal come that close to a house, especially a door, that's clearly being illuminated by a light? Like I said before, the animals in this area are pretty skittish and are generally out of the question. As I mentioned, my aunt along with my mother have had many unexplained experiences and they do believe in the paranormal. I think the only reason they tried to make up an excuse for this situation was to prevent me from becoming paranoid and afraid. It's pretty late for that now though, since I've had my fair share of experiences as well. My aunt's friend has seen some things too. My aunt told me that when her friend was younger, she suffered really badly from night terrors. She said that she saw things, demonic identities as she described them. She would wake up screaming and crying. It was traumatizing for her. Her family had always been religious and they prayed for her every night and slowly those things haunting her went away as she grew up. That really creeped me out and led me to believe that she might have brought or attracted that thing to my house. Or maybe it could have been something else. Whatever it was, I hope it never happens to me again. And if you know what it was, let me know. Make of this story what you will, but it happened. Back in 2009, Ireland was going through the recession, but I still managed to buy a house. It was a nice little cottage, and it suited me perfectly as I was a single man. I did shift work, so it was nights and days, days and nights. Initially, I thought it was because I wasn't getting enough sleep, but things started to happen within the house that I couldn't explain. For instance, one night I was doing some ironing. I put a towel on the railing in the bathroom and went back into the kitchen to get some more clothes to hang and put away. I came back up and the towel that I had put on the bathroom rail was strewn across the bedroom floor. 
My first thought was that there was somebody in the house with me, so I ran back into the kitchen and grabbed the frying pan. It was a small house, so there was really nowhere for someone to hide. After a while, I reasoned that it couldn't have been an intruder, because the door was locked and all of the windows were shut. It scared the life out of me, but I convinced myself that I just wasn't paying attention and that maybe I did leave my towel in the middle of the room, even though I knew that I didn't. But things got worse as time went on and couldn't be dismissed so easily. It got to the stage where I was actually afraid of being in my own home. For instance, coming in from a particular night at work, there was a light switch on in the hallway by the doorway. I'd have to switch that on before I'd even open the door fully. I was so terrified that I wouldn't even look into the darkness. Sometimes when I would open the door at nighttime, there would be a gust of wind coming from the house to greet me when no windows were open and there was no way for that to really happen. It eventually got to the stage where I was beginning to wonder if I was losing my mind. This went on for months, things going missing, curtains being closed when I left a room and being partially open when I came back in minutes later. The final straw was when I actually saw something. I arrived home one night at about three o'clock in the morning after being at work. I opened the hall door and switched on the light. Just to give you a picture of the layout of the house, it was quite small. There was a hallway and down the end of the hallway was a doorway to a bathroom. The bathroom was out the back and the kitchen was to the left. This night in particular, I switched on the light and opened the door fully to be greeted by, all I can say is it was a big man's shadow and this thing was standing at the end of the hall. Now, how it was a shadow is beyond me because there were three spotlights running down the hall and they lit up everywhere. But this shadow stood under the light and it was facing me. Every hair on my body stood on edge. The fright and the fear and the panic was so intense. I just roared out, leave me alone. Just leave me the F alone. And with that, whatever it was turned sideways and I could see the whole profile of his face. There was a massive bang and a chair was sent flying up the hallway toward me. I legged it out of the house, got back in my car and traveled back up to my parents' house. I was so distraught. I had a brother living in our parents' house at the time and he thought I'd been in an accident or something. I tried to explain to him as best I could what had happened. I hadn't said anything to anybody about the goings on at the house. I'd been living there for about six months and it had been going on all that time. Almost every day something happened. Being terrified in your own home is a horrible feeling. My brother and I drove back down to the house the following day we found the chair that had been thrown at me in the hallway, on top of the kitchen table. I had a bottle of water in the fridge, and I took it out and placed it on the kitchen table. As my brother and I were talking, the bottle just burst. It was like somebody had shaken a Coke can and opened it. It just went everywhere. Every surface of the kitchen seemed to have water on it. I sold the house six months later. During the months between putting the house up for sale and eventually selling it, strange things continued to happen within the house, like things going missing and curtains being moved. Thankfully though, I never saw the apparition again. One night I was lying in bed, it was about one o'clock in the morning, and coming from the back of the house, I heard a woman's voice say, no doctor please. Petrified, I jumped out of bed and turned on all the lights. I searched everywhere. I checked that the door was locked. It was, and the windows were all shut. The television wasn't plugged in, because sometimes it turned on by itself. Same for the radio, which I also left unplugged. I'll never forget the sadness in her voice and the way she said it. 
It wasn't, no doctor, please help me. It was, no doctor, please help me. Like, for some reason, she couldn't trust the doctor, or she couldn't afford one. I was so glad to be out of that house when I finally sold it. When I was living there, I asked a neighbor, and he told me that the couple who I'd bought the house off of had been complaining about hearing things in the house, at least the wife had been. I don't know what I saw or heard, but I do know that whatever it was, it was definitely something that was within the house, because I've never experienced anything like that again. I don't know whether the couple who bought the house off of me experienced anything. I couldn't say. After all these years, I still don't really talk about this with people, as I don't want them to think I'm crazy. But I do know that this happened to me. A little bit of background about myself. I've worked my entire adult life in the Pacific Northwest woods, over 15 years in total, with about seven years of that being for the park service at Olympic National Park. Many, many experiences over the years could warrant the title of creepy, but this one in particular has always stuck with me. While working for the park service, one of my jobs was that of a restoration carpenter. We would travel to old backcountry historical cabins, emergency shelters, homesteads, and chalets, tasked with repairing and restoring them to their original historically accurate states. This was a wonderful and demanding job. I'd spend eight days at a time living off the beaten path, usually deep in the backcountry. Sometimes we'd be flown in supplies. Sometimes we'd use llamas or mules to pack our gear all the while sleeping in thinly walled single tents, cooking over a fire or whisper light stove, using the same tools and techniques the original homesteaders had at their disposal in the late 1800s to construct and survive in this unforgiving environment. One late fall, I was assigned to work near Lake Ozette at an old homestead off the trail near the constructed boardwalk. For those unfamiliar with the area, Lake Ozette is eight miles long and three miles wide. It sits as the largest unaltered natural lake in Washington. Lake Ozette has a long and rich history of Native American culture. The Macaw Tribal Center in Nia Bay houses discoveries found in the area dating back 2,000 years, along with a local village that was well preserved over 300 years ago by a mudslide that left most of the artifacts intact. The Ozette Loop Trail, which the homestead was directly adjacent to, is approximately 9.4 miles through and through. The man-made boardwalk takes you under giant cedar groves and meanders through huge patches of chest-high salal before delivering you to Alstrom's Prairie, about two and a half miles from the trailhead. Alstrom's Prairie, a giant, soggy meadow, was once farmed by two Swedish immigrants. They constructed a small cabin and some outbuildings on the 150-acre bog. With cattle, sheep, vegetable gardens, and the help of a little Swedish ingenuity, they managed to etch out lives for themselves here over 50 years. Over time, the forest, as it always does, decided to take back what was once its own. The now decades-long abandoned farm was hardly recognizable. Our job was to beat back the encroaching forest, put new windows in the main cabin, pipe in a new stove, apply fresh paint, and fix up portions of the semi-dilapidated barn. The ultimate goal being to allow guided tours to take place sometime in the future. For about three weeks, we stayed at the Ozette bunkhouse while working at Alstrom's. This was good duty for us. We weren't sleeping under the rain, our beds were warm, our hike was short, and the terrain was not difficult. We even had a TV. The bunkhouse was located near the highway and ranger station. We would hike the five-mile loop every day, bringing with us boards, tools, paint, and everything else we needed on our backs. 
These were full 10 plus hour days, usually starting in the morning around 7 o'clock and beginning our evening return hike back to the bunkhouse around 5. At one point during the fall, there were four of us working this project, but at the time of this event, there were only two of us remaining. Most of the hard work had already been finished. We needed to hike a few last boards into the prairie to complete a portion of the woodshed before we called the job done. I volunteered to be the pack mule for the day, my only job being to carry as many boards as I could muster in each trip to the prairie before returning to the ranger station for the next load. It was late in the season for hikers at this point, and the weather had turned. We'd be lucky to see two to three people a day going the loop. After around my fourth or fifth trip, I was pretty wiped. It was getting late in the evening now, around four o'clock, and my coworker had called it a day. I thought I could get one more trip in before it got too dark, my rationale being that the more trips I did that day, the less I'd have to do the next. We passed on the trail, I told him my intentions, and I continued on. I delivered the last of the boards for the day, took a look around the prairie as the sun began to tuck behind the trees, and started my hour-long hike back to the ranger station. The lighting on the boardwalk was quite low at this point, the cedars blocking most of the ambient light left by the setting sun, and made visibility quite diminished. I'm not a nervous hiker, and I failed to spook easily, having solo hiked for weeks on end in the backcountry. I've been stalked by cougars, confronted by Kodiak bears in Alaska, and I've even ran into a few hillbillies over the years. Not the good kind. As I left the prairie that evening, the hair on my neck stood on end. Goosebumps erupted on my forearms. An uneasy feeling swept over me, and suddenly I wanted to walk faster, then jog, then sprint. I didn't. Instead, I convinced myself I'd been reading too many novels before bedtime. I walked another five minutes or so, before I started to hear something faint. Something that sounded like music. Impossible, I told myself. I'm the only one out here. And I'm still at least two miles from civilization. And that civilization, in reality, was the only other soul out there, my coworker. Sure enough, though, I heard music. More specifically, a piano. It started out so faintly that I had to stop moving and actually try to hear it, the steps on the wooden boardwalk being too loud. Every time I paused, it became unmistakable, and it got louder. I stood there, sun now fully hidden behind the horizon, in total silence other than this piano. I became aware that there were no longer the sounds of other life. No birds, no insects, no wind, no rustling of leaves or underbrush. Absolutely nothing other than the piano. As if everything was being weighted down by a fog of emptiness of some kind. I've encountered this dead time before in the woods. Certain places have it, but this was different somehow. Unique to this place unique to this moment in time. I tried to focus on the keys, but I couldn't recognize the composition. Unsurprising, as I mostly listened to Metallica and Korn at the time. It was playing with a purpose. It was controlled, in tune, thoughtful. It was a song, and somehow, I felt that it was meant just for me in that moment. I started walking again, almost on cue. The music got louder. As my pace increased, so did the tempo of the keys, still in tune, never faltering. It reached a climax, the perfect combination of my haste, my dread, my heartbeat, and the tempo of this music. And then, as quickly as it had started, the piano stopped, whooshed away in the fraction of a moment. It didn't trail off, it didn't fade into extinction, it was just gone. Suddenly, everything that was absent was swept away as if by a gust of wind. The stillness was gone. The gloom, the stagnation and weight of everything was lifted. My next step on the boardwalk was once again in reality. 
the evening was just as absent of light as before, but it felt like life somehow was once again injected back into the forest. The woods seemed normal again. I didn't hear the piano again that night, and I haven't since. I told my co-worker every detail when I reached the bunkhouse, and he showed no sign of disbelief. We didn't talk about it again until years later, when something similar happened to another Park Service employee. When I told my grandfather about what happened, as he was a retired park ranger who had worked nearby at Mora, the next station over, without the least bit of hesitation, he asked, Did you hear the bagpipes along with it, or was it just the piano this time? It seems, as I've learned and experienced since then, that there is a lot more to that place, a lot more to the Olympics in general, than anyone really knows or is willing to admit. I figured I would share my experience living in a 200-year-old cabin that was definitely haunted. So all of these things happened over a span of three years. It started in 2012. A childhood friend from years back asked me if I would be her roommate. I needed to get out of my parents and she needed a roommate, so it seemed like a good situation. Nestled in a suburban area was this cabin. It dates back to sometime in the 1700s. The road the cabin is off of bears the same name as the original family that owned the house. They owned a large portion of the land that's now one of the largest cities in the U.S. Search American Colonial Cabin and you'll see a bunch of images that look just like it. We originally think that it was used as slave quarters, as this was tobacco country, and then later found out that it was a stable house later on. The stable house theory definitely checks out, as our dog dug up a horseshoe once. I still have it. The night we moved in, I knew the place had something eerie about it. There were no doors to the upstairs room, my room, and no doors to the downstairs bedroom. Her bedroom was an addition that somebody had added in the 80s. The previous owners also added a much needed kitchen and bathroom, as the original layout didn't have either. Now that you have a decent imagery of what I was working with, I'll start the story. So when moving in, I immediately felt a feeling of being watched. The house always felt dark, cold, and damp, much like a cellar. Par for the course with that type of house, but there was something else. It started with scratching. Every night that I would be in bed, I would wake up to this scratching directly underneath my bed by my head. At first I thought it was mice, but when I listened to it long enough, I realized that the scratching was long and drawn out, like a foot long pull, then repeated. I just covered my head, muffled my ears, and closed my eyes. I was a 23 year old man that felt like I was cowering, but I wasn't about to tussle with wood scratching spirits. Well, one night, I heard the scratching start. Normally, I would have been asleep at this time, but I was up late, and that's when I heard it. It started on the ceiling on the far side of my room, and then it went down the wall, and then it scratched its way to directly underneath me. After a while, the scratching went across the room and back to the wall, and then gone. Here's why it's not mice. My walls were solid wood, as the inside logs were the same as the outside. Like I said, it was an old log cabin. There were no spaces anywhere for something to crawl, like when you have insulation and stuff like that. I got scared and I started sleeping downstairs. My roommate, now my wife, asked what was up and I told her. She said the same stuff was going on when she was home alone. This was all in the first week, by the way. Here's the creepiest part. 
When we moved in, I had to unscrew all of the screws that the previous renter had put into the windows. I had to unscrew one of the exterior doors that he had screwed shut. We had to clean out weird rabbit food, we think, from the oven. We had to write, doesn't live here, on the hundreds of mail order catalogs that the previous renter received. We always joked that the guy was a shut-in Satanist, but now I'm not sure if we're too far off. We both started sleeping downstairs in the living room, and felt comfortable in numbers. The eerie feeling was easier to deal with when somebody was with you. Until one night. I had a dream that a dark force was approaching me. It was in third person, as if I was watching myself sleep. The entity started to loom over my head, and all the while I felt a pressure building up in my head and a high pitch ringing in my ears. It got so intense that I sprang up from my sleep and I looked around the room. About a second later, the TV shut off. Just cut off. We'd been having problems with the TV randomly turning on and off, but this time it was far too coincidental to be brushed off like everything else. Also, I knew I went to bed with the TV turned off. I had turned it off myself. So why was it on in the first place? We started sleeping in her room after that night. She told me that nothing really happened in there. Maybe because it was an addition, I don't know. Well, our ghost played matchmaker, and now we're trying for a kid after being married for five years, so that part worked out, I guess. Anyway, once I was upstairs reading, and as I was falling asleep, my window started to open and shut. I was already at my wit's end with the spirit, so the next day I set up the same situation. Same thing. Funny that it never does that when I'm not in there. I ended up yelling at it, telling it to leave us alone and that I was tired of it. And holy smokes, it worked. Kind of, for a while. Then when I was home alone, alarm clocks started going off. As soon as my wife would leave, drawers would open, there would be banging on the front door, and these alarm clocks would go off. Over time, it just stopped, slowed down, and ultimately fizzled into nothing. I guess as I matured there, it stopped messing with me. Who knows? Today, my in-laws live there. They were my landlords. And the home is cute, homey, and warm. I spend time there alone, and I don't feel any malice. Weird experience. I would do it all over again if I had to, though. Can't argue with results. So, I'm a pretty skeptical person when it comes to the paranormal, albeit having a vested interest in the tales and evidence. I'm the kind of person who browses ghost hunter videos on YouTube and stories on Reddit. I've also visited plenty of purportedly haunted locations in the US, including but not limited to places like the Omni Parker House, the Molly Brown House, the Whaley House, Alcatraz at Night, the Winchester House more than once, and none of them have yielded any sort of evidence. A part of me wants to believe, but is also terrified at the prospect of witnessing something. I was mostly a non-believer, up until a couple of months ago. In short, I had wanted to plan a surprise party and getaway for my girlfriend's 30th birthday. She had mentioned wanting to hit the slopes. It was January, so it was still winter time at this point. I organized this months ahead and had invited some of her closest friends to join. I ended up renting an Airbnb cabin that had enough rooms to house 10 people, or five couples. One entire lower floor basement level with two beds, a room on the first floor, and three rooms upstairs. Also adding that this cabin was in a beautiful rural neighborhood in Tahoe, California with tons of cabins next door, down the street, adjacent, etc. So there's plenty of housing around us. Nothing peculiar about it. And there are other people staying around. 
Of course, my girlfriend and I take the master bedroom upstairs, and right across the hall is another couple in one room, and my girlfriend's cousin by herself in the third room next door. All rooms are taken, and the middle floor is a lively area with games, a fireplace, and a foosball table. These details are somewhat relevant and important later in the story. The first night was a night of merry drinking and games. To celebrate the occasion, we had decorated the living area and blown up balloons to be loosely strewn about the large and cozy living room and the family room where we imbibed. It was almost uneventful with respect to weird happenings, except toward the end of the night, balloons would randomly pop at odd intervals. Someone in our group suggested that it was the balloons getting attracted toward the heater vents and popping. I was dismissive of this because not all of them that popped were congregated near vents. I just took note. I didn't want to argue or suggest anything weird at this point. After we all retired for the night, and all the lights were off, we could hear balloons popping downstairs at random intervals that reverberated through the silent house. This happened between 2 and 3.30 in the morning. The next morning, there were still plenty of healthy balloons strewn about. Fast forward to night two. After we returned from snow activities, we prepped for drinking and the usual. After a full day's worth of shredding the snow, we're all collectively tired a bit earlier than the previous night, and we decide to retire around 11.30 to midnight. Here's where I personally experienced things that got me feeling irked. Since it was cold, I decided to go downstairs to turn on the thermostat or heater. Our couple friends across the hall had their door slightly open ajar, the lights were on, and the bathroom was in use. As I'm going downstairs in the dark stairwell, I hear the floorboards behind me creak. I figure it was my friend coming out to follow me for a cup of water or to go to the kitchen. As I walk across the living room and stop at the thermostat, the lights are still off at this point and the creaks continue. And then I hear it stop a few feet behind me near the kitchen. The kitchen lights don't turn on and I hear nothing else. Feeling like he was waiting behind me and I was being watched, I said, what's up dude, need something? I turn around and nobody is there. I've only ever read about this dreadful feeling of being watched and it is indeed every bit as dreadful upon realization in person. A minute ago, I swore someone followed me down. I was taken aback and my skeptical self once again took note and spoke nothing of it. I went back upstairs. About 30 minutes pass and it's still cold. At this point, everyone is asleep and I decide to turn up the thermostat a couple of notches, nothing crazy. I turn on the upstairs hallway light bright enough to light the steps and see from downstairs. I proceeded to head downstairs and stop once again at the thermostat. No floorboard creaks except for my own this time. As I'm turning up the thermostat and thinking to myself how odd that creaking was the first time, a noise broke my train of thought. I hear the ball from the foosball table, several feet away near the fireplace, audibly roll across its surface and hit one of the side walls. Nobody is around and I am certainly too far away to touch it. I froze in fear and hastily went back upstairs. Somehow I went back to sleep, not even knowing how to mentally process the increasingly evident occurrences. I eventually fall asleep under the pretense that nothing is definitive enough for me to be conclusively sure that this cabin is haunted. I don't mention or wake anyone up about my experiences. The next morning as we leave and drive back home, the balloons were brought up by my girlfriend's friend and couple who stayed across the hall. I took this as an opening to talk about my experiences and I disclosed them. At this point, my girlfriend's friend goes pale, gets really serious, and tells us that the previous night she was still wide awake when she noticed a dark figure standing at the foot of her bed. She states that she went into panic mode 
after blinking and realizing that it wasn't a dream or a hallucination. She shook her boyfriend awake, the guy that I thought had followed me down the stairs earlier that night, only to have it disappear when he woke up. This, by far, coupled with my experiences, is undeniable evidence. I myself was wide-eyed upon hearing this solid piece of information. My girlfriend's cousin, who stayed in the room next to us, then mentions that she heard what sounded like breathing in her room, but dismissed it as naturally occurring sounds of the walls of the cabin. These events stand alone could be nominal and may be explained, but collectively, it's really hard to deny that something was present and amiss. I'm hoping that this is the extent of my run-ins with the paranormal, because I don't want to experience anything like this again. The universe has made this skeptic more of a believer. I am a 23-year-old female, and my husband is a 23-year-old male, and recently we moved in with some roommates. They are James, male 26, Danielle, female 25, and their young daughter Sarah. We went from living in a decent-sized city to living in the middle of nowhere, about an hour away. For context, we live in the south of the US, so it's rural, woodsy nowhere. We're really good friends with our roommates, and husband and I knew beforehand that they had both experienced some paranormal goings-on before we made the decision to move in. To be honest, I think husband and I forgot all about the paranormal stuff just before we moved. Everything was great when we were settling. We all got along really well, and it was so amazing to be in a place where we had our own space and were on equal ground with our roomies. Then one night, about a month later, husband, James, and I are all lounging in the living room area. Sarah was asleep in her room, as it was late. We're talking about the paranormal. Around 11.30 p.m., James has to go pick up Danielle from work. She works the late shift, about a half an hour away from us. As James is getting ready to leave, he mentions skinwalkers. Now, husband and I don't use this word. For those of you who don't know, speaking aloud the word skinwalker or wendigo is sometimes believed to attract these deadly creatures to you. Husband and I had strange and horrifying experiences at the last place we lived after one of us made the mistake of saying it aloud. So we don't say it anymore. Our code word for it is flesh pedestrian, if you're curious. As soon as James said it, I gasped. He laughed it off. But right before he left, he noticed something through the blinds on the back door of the house. He mentioned that he thought there was somebody in the backyard. In truth, we don't really have a backyard. The back of the house is right up against the edge of the woods, but we just call it the backyard. Husband and I, thinking that he's messing with us, laugh it off. Quickly, though, we can see from James's face that he is not. We rush to look through the blinds, and sure as heck, there's something in the trees. It was incredibly hard to see, but it was a very, very tall and thin figure, darting quickly between the trees. It kept itself completely shrouded in the black shadows, and we couldn't make out any other features. James rushes outside, thinking that it's somebody on the property. Husband and I follow, not wanting him to be alone. I stay on the porch while husband rushes down the steps to follow James as he goes behind the house. The second he leaves my eyesight, James immediately turns around and shakes his head at husband. He tells us that as soon as he got to the edge of the trees, he heard a low voice saying, turn around. I come from a pagan background. My mother is Wiccan, and my husband is also pagan. As James leaves, the husband and I finish our cigarettes. 
I immediately set out to bless the entire house with sacred oils and blessed salts. I had already done this as soon as we had unpacked the last of our things, but I felt it necessary to do again. I went so far as to bless the entire porch as well. As husband and I are doing this, James texts me that he doesn't feel safe and that something isn't right. When I ask him what he means, he writes that just a few miles up the road, a naked man came charging out of the woods and stopped at the edge of the road. When he locked eyes with James, he simply pointed at the car and kept doing so until he was no longer visible in the rearview mirror. We tried to rationalize that it could be one of many non-paranormal scenarios. We thought it might be a prank, but that didn't quite make sense. It was the beginning of a very cold winter, and it was only about 20 degrees out. It would have been a lot of effort and discomfort for this man to pull a prank like this on passing drivers. Then we wondered if the man needed help or was possibly in danger. But James was sure that this man did not look at all like he was in distress. If he was, the man would have yelled or tried flagging down the car instead of just pointing at it. The conclusion we came to, for the time being, was that he was most likely on some substances. We don't live in the safest of places, and hard substances are very common around here. Then James texted that he had picked up Danielle, and more weird things were happening. I asked him to elaborate, but he said that he would explain it all when they both got home. As their car pulled up in the driveway, husband and I went outside to meet them, but the two of them quickly got out of the car and rushed toward the house, telling us that we all needed to get inside immediately. When inside, James explained that right before he got to Danielle's place of work, he saw something in a cow field that he can't explain. It was tall taller than any human could possibly be, and much taller than the thing that we had already seen behind the house. From what he could tell in the dark, it was gray, and it was running, running faster than he was driving at 60 miles per hour, on all fours. And then it ran into the woods out of sight. When he was driving back with Danielle, before James could explain everything that had already happened, she got a sinking feeling in her gut and made James lock all the car doors. A literal second after James complied, the same creature he had just seen was once again sprinting alongside the car. It was much closer to the road than it had just been minutes before, but it dashed again into the trees before they could get a really good look at it. We were all a bit shaken. It was now close to 1 a.m. and none of us could explain anything that had already happened. We tried to brush it all off, and we probably could have, if it was just one thing that had transpired instead of several. We made the awful decision to go back outside for a smoke, the kind of decision that only idiots in horror movies would make, I know. And that's when things got really weird. Off to our right, there's a small strip of woods that separates our property from our landlord's property where he lives with his daughter, son-in-law, and granddaughters. In those trees, we notice three sets of eyes. They're glowing yellow-green, and they're just staring at us. Husband asks James if it could be deer, as we do tend to see a lot of those around, but we all knew that whatever those eyes belonged to were far taller than deer could be. Then, to our left, there's more, you guessed it, woods. From that direction, in the pitch dark, I swear I heard a little girl laugh. It wasn't boisterous or loud, more like the snicker that a child makes when they're trying to suppress their laughter. Danielle and husband didn't hear it, but James did. Now we're looking at the big tree to our left that stands just before the edge of the woods, and notice that there's this big black mass behind it as though something was crouched next to the tree. We all try to rationalize that it's just a big bundle of leaves, but I don't think any of us really believed that. James and husband both dart back inside for a moment, and when they come back out, James is holding a hatchet, 
and husband is holding his crossbow. Without saying anything to Danielle or I, they step off the porch and walk toward our left, where the little girl laughed. Later, they told us that they thought a child was in trouble and they wanted to help. While Danielle and I were on the porch, trying to figure out what the heck was happening, we see something a few yards away. Down the driveway, there's a huge tree in the middle of the property. Out of our peripheral, we swore that we saw something duck from behind the tree. We kept looking at the tree, and yes, there was something poking its head up from behind the trunk, pulling back very quickly as soon as it realized we were staring at it. At this point, Danielle and I wanted to get inside. We're both shivering from fear and cold, and we just wanted this night to be over. But while Danielle and I were in a match of paranormal peekaboo, husband and James had their own very weird experience. For context, I have Tourette's syndrome. This means that I say and do things completely out of my control, and some of my verbal tics are just strange sounds. Some of those sounds include blowing raspberries or popping my lips, which are my two most common verbal tics at the moment. As James and husband are inching closer to the trees, they both hear footsteps through the grass and leaves within the trees. Both of them were too frightened to call out to whoever they thought was in there. Then they hear shuffling. The problem is though, they each hear shuffling coming from different directions that the other doesn't hear. James was walking to the left, husband to the right. James hears shuffling coming from the right, but husband doesn't hear it. But husband hears it coming from the left and James doesn't hear it. So they turn toward each other with their weapons drawn. In their confusion, while they're facing each other, they hear someone running in the woods, full on sprinting through the trees, heading directly toward them. And then it just stops. They take a step back and watch to see if anybody comes out of the woods. No one. But then they hear something in the woods. They hear me in the woods right in front of them. They heard both of my verbal tics, but the problem was I was standing on the porch behind them. Without turning around, husband calls to me and asks if I just had a tick. I told him no. They back away from the woods without taking their eyes off of that spot until they're close enough to sprint into the house, pulling Danielle and I with them. Inside, Danielle and I are able to tell them about the thing behind the tree. And James and husband are able to tell us about how something mimicked my tics to a T. For the rest of the night, we didn't go back outside. We would all, against our better judgment, peek through the blinds out the back door when we passed it. There was still something in the woods every single time that one of us looked. I didn't get any sleep. Come morning time, husband and I checked all the places that we had seen or heard something, and there was no sign of anyone or anything. I asked my mother what she thought it might be. In her opinion, it was likely something related to a mimic spirit, a spirit that warps reality to feed on fear, but not having enough power to really hurt anybody. She said that it couldn't be a skinwalker because there were too many things happening in too many different places all at once. Skinwalkers are solitary and territorial things, so it couldn't have been multiple of them. But just one mimic could do all the things we experienced. We still hear the occasional giggle in the dark, get a bang or a knock at our back door. We still even see the thing behind the big tree in the driveway almost every night. But that night was something else. I've seen some things in my life, but never, never have I gone through about three hours of nonstop activity. I've since burned sage all throughout the house and the entire perimeter of the property, as well as using the rest of my salt and oil around the entire house. Husband and I even did a late night EVP session at all of the spots that things had happened that night, but we didn't get a single response to any of our questions. I don't know for sure if it was a mimic spirit, or if I can fully rule out a skinwalker. I don't even really know if the thing was dangerous or not. 
But one thing's for sure. I will never forget that night. My life was always crazy, but never did I think it was this crazy. This is my story. It was a summer day in 2011. I was 10 and my dad had gotten with his ex-girlfriend. That's a story for a different time. She had two boys. One was a year younger and the other one was older. I had a little brother as well. Now that you know the family, let me give you a little bit of background to this bone chilling story. My dad was searching for a house to rent after breaking things off with my biological mother, and he found this house, and what's crazy is that my name is Ashley, and it was off of Ashland Street. It seemed to be very cheap for the area. It was in a gated community, so of course it seemed very comfortable and safe. I mean, at least you'd think so. I moved with my dad into this house with his ex-girlfriend and her two boys, so there were four kids all together. We'll name them Kobe, the year younger, and Jerry, the older one, and then my little brother, Brandon. I have changed their names for privacy. It was an older house, so nothing brand new was built, but it was definitely pretty cheap. I mean, for a gated high middle-class neighborhood. We moved in. I don't remember the exact date, but it was in the summertime. I live in Vegas, so the heat is sometimes unbearable. One day it can be 99, and the next it's 104. My dad wakes me up and is really excited about moving out and just being free. My biological mother was a freeloader and a real piece of work. My dad and I picked up all our boxes and we went to the house. Now this is the first time that I was seeing it. But of course, my dad did a tour with the landlord. So I went through the place, picking my bedroom and all the fun things you do when you move into a brand new house. I shared a room with my baby brother, Brandon. He was like four or five at the time, so really young. I got the room I wanted, I guess out of the three I could have picked. It was a four bedroom, three bathroom house, two upstairs and one downstairs. The first night wasn't anything out of the ordinary. We got Little Caesars pizza and watched Cops, my dad's favorite TV show. We went to bed and woke up like normal and went on about our day. Again, still really normal, nothing crazy. The second night was just as normal. It was about a week into living in the house when things started to happen. It was almost like the ghosts wanted to make sure we stayed or something. How sweet. So it was more like night eight, and I was walking up the stairs. I was alone in the house, and the stairs had carpet. I walked up them, and I swear I kept hearing somebody walking behind me. But every time I would turn around, nothing would be there. I just kind of kept it to myself, and told myself I was just paranoid for being at the new house by myself. I was the type of kid that was scared of the dark, and I still get scared easily to this day. I actually hate Halloween for that very reason. But these strange things just kept happening. The first spirit sighting was Kobe's birthday. He got a new spyware truck thing, where you can put a camera on the toy truck and go around the house. It's kind of like a GoPro. Well, we decided to pull a prank on Jerry, so we put the camera in his room to prank him. He was asleep, so he would wake up and freak out that there was a camera. I mean, we were all under 12, so it was really funny to us, but that's not all I caught. I know the typical white woman in a white robe thing, I get it, but it was true. All we could see was a silhouette of a young woman, probably in her late 20s or early 30s, standing over him. Of course, as the two young boys were so sweet, they had me go up to check myself. So of course I went upstairs, a little spooked, but trying not to overthink it. And I went into his room. 
Jerry was still asleep, and there was no woman in there. So I came downstairs and told myself that there's probably a glitch in the camera that just made it seem like somebody was there. So we all let it go. As some of you probably know, when you move into a house, especially an older one, the floor creaks, and you might hear bumps in the night just because the furniture is settling, but only squeaks and creaks for a day or two. We kept hearing this noise, almost like somebody was walking up and down the stairs all the time. But again, we all just put it out of our heads and said that it was the house settling. Maybe something fell. No matter what, we would try to find an explanation for the situation. But over time, it just got worse. My dad had signed an 18-month lease agreement, but we only stayed there for four. Because this is when things got absolutely crazy. I went off to school. I was in the fifth grade. I had to repeat the second grade, hence why I was in the fifth grade at 10 years old. Anyway, my school was definitely a walkable distance, so I walked to school and back home. I got home one day and my dad's girlfriend was at work, and so was my dad. Kobe and Jerry were at their grandma's and Brandon was still in school, so I was all alone in the house. When I walked in, it was like something out of a horror movie. Picture this. You get home from a stressful day at school, and when you open the door, it literally looks like somebody has robbed the place. The stove was on. Yes, the stove, like literal fire, was on. Of course, my immediate reaction was to call my dad and tell him what was going on. As I got into the kitchen, all the cabinet doors were open, and most of the plates were on the ground, shattered. There was glass everywhere, even on the carpet. Thank God we didn't have any animals at the time. My dad, of course, got home with the cops, and the cops came in and did an investigation, all to find out that there was no foul play, so there was nothing anybody could really do. So, of course, my dad's now ex-girlfriend blames me, but I told her that I didn't do it, that I came home to this. Unfortunately, my dad played right into her crap and believed her, so I was grounded for breaking her plates and causing a fire. I was so mad, but I was 10. What was I going to do, run away? I kept trying to convince my dad that I didn't do this, but pretty soon, he wouldn't need any convincing. While we were all downstairs playing and talking one day, upstairs in my parents' bedroom, there were three loud booms, all at one after the other. Just boom, boom, boom. My dad and his now ex and myself all ran up the stairs to find that my parents' bed was broken. It almost looked like somebody had jumped on it really hard, and that's how it broke. The mattress was caved into the bed frame. I just looked at my dad with a cocky attitude and said, so did I do that too? My dad actually apologized to me that night, but not his girlfriend. She never liked me, but that was another story, like I said. Under the staircase, we had storage. The door to that slammed, but the AC unit was close by the door. So I just thought that maybe somebody had left it open and the wind had pushed it shut. It wasn't a very heavy door. The next night was definitely one of the scariest nights of my life. It was around 8 p.m. and we were all settling down for the night. I had school the next morning as everybody was going to bed. It was around 10 going on 11. As I was about to sit on the bed, I heard two knocks on the door. I could see a shadowy impression of feet under the door. So when I opened it, it was confusing to see nobody there. I closed it again, thinking that it had to be one of my brothers playing a mean trick on me. Again, I scare easily, so that was their thing. I heard the knocks again, and like the first time, I opened it. But nothing was there, and I didn't hear anybody run away. I went to Kobe's room. He was fast asleep. Then I went to Jerry's room, but he was still awake. He told me he didn't knock or anything, and that he'd been in his room the whole entire time, but I didn't really believe him. I had no choice to just go back to my room and try to relax. Probably about another hour went by, 
with nothing, no knocking or anything. But just as I had closed my eyes, I heard it again. I stood right by my door for about 10 minutes until the knocking happened again, and I immediately opened the door. Absolutely nothing. And then, in the silent darkness, I heard a giggle. I looked around the corner, and there was nothing there. Everybody was asleep, and nobody would have had time to get back to their bedroom. I just went to bed. I wanted it to be over so badly. The next morning, I tried to tell my dad what was happening, but he said I was just dreaming. I looked at him and said, so is the kitchen, and the fire, and the bed. That was all a dream too, right? Because we're all either having some really crazy Jumanji stuff happening, or there's more to it. My dad just shrugged it all off and told me to get ready for school, so I did. Probably about another week later, I ended up staying the night at a friend's house. I'll call her Emma, just again for privacy reasons. So after school, I took the bus back to Emma's house. I decided to confide in her about what had been going on. Her mother was a medium, so I guess she could like speak to the souls that hadn't crossed over or something. Or as she would say, departed. When I came in close contact with her, she looked at me with fear in her eyes. It was like she knew what was going on before I even told her. She told me that I had a very negative soul attached to me. It was a female soul. And all I could think was maybe it was my dad's ex or even my biological mother. Two really horrible females. But she said that it wasn't anybody I knew closely. And that's when I started to piece everything together. The woman standing over the bed, the fire, the bed breaking, the knocking, the giggling. It somehow all made sense in some way. This spirit was stuck. But my question was, how did she get there in the first place? My dad picked me up the morning after, and I discussed with him what I had kind of put together. He said maybe the landlord would know more. So I told my dad to give him a call and tell him the pipe was loose or something so he could come over and have a conversation. You know, trick him, I guess. If he doesn't want to go into detail about it, he's definitely not going to over the phone. My dad agreed, and a few hours later, the landlord arrived. My dad called me downstairs, and we decided to go over everything with him. From the fire, to the glass, to the bed breaking, to the woman standing over the bed. All the color drained from his face, and I immediately knew that he knew something. As we were all talking downstairs in the living room, there was this mirror on the wall in front of us over the television. We're sitting on the couch, and as I looked up, I saw a lady wearing a very tall, almost like black witch hat, and she had very long gray hair. She just looked off, like I knew from somewhere, but didn't at the same time. Of course, I reacted very startled, and my dad told me to relax. Like, yeah, Dad, let me just relax while all this stuff keeps happening. Why don't I just tell the ghost to make us a campfire as well? He didn't find it funny and sent me to my room. The landlord eventually left and fewer questions were answered. It was like he didn't want to say anything. Like, our house almost blew up into flames and there was glass all over the kitchen. This isn't the time for secrets. Anyway... We looked up the address on a background search for properties, and we only found two things that could have been connected to this haunting. The first thing was that the entire neighborhood had been built on a Native American burial ground, but that seemed a little cliche, so we kept digging. And then we found something even sadder. A young couple was there. They had lived there once. They had two children. One day, out of nowhere, the dad came home drunk. He shot his wife and two kids and then set the house on fire and shot himself. Unfortunately, the house did burn to the ground and their remains were never found, so nobody knew who they were. It made total sense. The fire that started, the loud booms, the knocking. It was a sick memory that I'll never forget. I really hope that family rests in peace. At least the wife and the kids. I can't imagine being taken out like that by your own father and husband. Anyway, that was the haunted house on Ashland Street. 
I have never been back since we moved out, and I'll never go back again. This happened when I was around nine or 10. I was staying the night at my friend Catherine's for the first time. We met the summer before and we'd been inseparable ever since. Cat lived in this old two-story house surrounded by woods and dirt road. The house itself gave me an uneasy feeling when I first saw it. The shutters were falling off. The paint on the house seemed to be fading. It was an old piece of crap now that I think about it, but at the time, I was excited. I remember walking in after staring at the house for what seemed like 20 minutes. Surprisingly, the inside was a lot nicer than the outside, so I pushed that uneasy feeling down and just shrugged it off as nerves. I remember the smell of the house. I can't pinpoint it, but it was different, like walking into a musty room. I started to walk around, just to explore my surroundings, but I noticed Kat's mom watching me. I simply smiled and waved, but she just stood there, staring at me, wide-eyed. I had never met her before, but why was she staring at me like that? Suddenly, Kat flew around the corner and tackled me. We both fell and started to giggle. I noticed Kat's mom out of the corner of my eye start to turn around and walk off, and she was gone. Fast forward a couple of hours, Kat and I are laying on a beanbag in her room watching Children of the Corn, which, by the way, was one of my favorite movies at the time. I grew up watching horror movies, mostly Stephen King or any movie that my mom was watching at the time. Not her decision, but mine, because I love the feeling that a good horror movie gives you. She felt the same way, and that's why we clicked so much. Anyway, we were sitting here watching this movie, and suddenly the door opposite us slams closed. We both jumped and giggled and brushed it off because, well, we were kids. Until the second time, when it creaked open and slammed again, not seconds after the first time. Now I'm sitting there staring at this door, trying to figure out how in the world it's opening and closing by itself. In the midst of all that, the only other person in this house is Kat's mom, which I figured out earlier in the day was also just a tad creepy. Do you think it's just your mom? I asked, but she just shook her head. Are you sure? I asked again, but this time she said something that gave me the chills and still does. She said, my mom isn't home. It's just me and you, silly. I just stared at her, trying to wrap my head around what she had just said. Who leaves their nine-year-old home alone with a friend in a two-story house? Where's your mom? I asked her. She's at work. I giggled, thinking that she was just trying to trick me. No, she's at work. She only works for a couple of hours, so she leaves me here because she trusts me. At this point, I'm just looking at her, and she noticed this look of worry on my face. What's wrong? She asked. I said, if your mom is at work, then who was that lady staring at me earlier? As I said this, we heard what seemed like footsteps at the time, but thinking about it now, it sounded more like shuffling in one spot above us. I'm completely scared at this point, Every hair on my neck is standing on end, and I just want to leave. I started to get up when Kat pulled me back down and asked me if I heard that noise. I nodded. It was silent again, until the footsteps were back, but louder and faster. We both stared up at the ceiling, and she grabbed my hand. This happens every day, she whispered. I looked over at her, and I could see true fear on her face. The footsteps stopped, and she looked at me, her face flushed white. Is there an attic? I asked. She pointed up toward the ceiling. Well, maybe it's just squirrels or birds, I kept thinking over and over. 
You ever notice when you're really quiet, that's when you can hear almost everything around you? Imagine if you're sitting in a house with your best friend alone at 10 years old, and you hear the giggle of a three-year-old child. Mind you, she has no siblings. We were completely alone. Kat was just as scared as I was. I remember thinking that I just wanted to get out of this house. I grabbed her and ran out the door. At least we would feel safer and less scared outside the house than we would in it. Want to hear a story? Kat asked, pulling my mind back into reality. I nodded. Well, this house used to be a daycare. There was this lady that would watch the kids, and one day she just locked them all in the attic. And then she hung herself from a rope in the kitchen. They all died because the kids were hungry and thirsty, and no one found them for months afterwards in this house. My heart started to pound, my eyes wide with fear, and I just looked at her. It's true, she said. I've seen them, the little kids, every day, but I've never seen the lady. But you have, earlier. After she told me this, I don't remember much else except running out the door of her room and making it outside. Cat followed, begging me to stay, but I just had to get out. My stomach felt like knots. I felt as though I had walked into a horror movie, and I just wished the day had never happened. Fast forward years later, that was the last day I had ever seen or heard from Kat. I remember her always coming to play outside at my dad's during the day. I remember what she looked like. I never remembered meeting her parents or seeing them out in public. I'm now 27, and I can't seem to find any proof that she exists. All my friends that I was friends with then, I'm still friends with now, even after all these years. But why not her? I think her scary story might have had some flaws, but I still wonder what happened in that house. I've driven by there maybe 15 times, and I still wonder if maybe she was one of the ones that never made it out. I'm 22, currently in the military, and I was an army brat until I was 12. I moved all the time, overseas twice and to 10 different states. I lived a very unusually unstable life because of this. My first life memory that I can recall, I was six. My father was stationed in Fort Sill. We lived in Lawton and this tiny brick house, very old and creepy. I recall going to take a bath before I went to bed, and I saw this odd sort of organic, amoeba-shaped, fluorescent, transparent green thing just a few feet above the bathroom tile. It floated out and disappeared. I was genuinely unconcerned and thought that I was tired. I go to bed, and in the middle of the night, this thing woke me up and had me follow it down the hallway. It leads me to the living area, where I kid you not, the whole house is full of fluorescent, transparent green people, dressed in like 1800 type clothing. I'm six at the time, so how do I even know what period clothing looks like? I couldn't tell you. I was older when I finally saw an old Western movie and recognized the clothes. These people looked at me, watched me intently, and were very still. One man stood up and began walking toward me. I remember leaving and going back to bed, scared as heck and pulling the blankets over my head. Enter the rest of my life until around the time I turned 20. From this day on, every night for several years, I would have the same dream about these things. I would ignore it. I never again followed the thing if it came for me. I didn't want to know what would happen. I was an odd, quiet kid, and I guess I just accepted that it would be this way. I didn't tell my parents for a very long time. When I got used to the dreams, and the thing, 
I firmly believed it began manifesting itself in different ways. For instance, if I left my bedroom and shut the door behind me, the door would unlatch and pop back open, as if somebody was behind me and needed to open the door again to follow me. My father can even confirm this to this day, and he's a complete skeptic. My belongings always moved around and would be found in odd places. The lights would be on, the doors would open. It drove my parents nuts. My best friend, we'll call her T, dubbed this very masculine presence of mine, Ed. T and I have been friends for eight years now, and she definitely had to accept Ed as well. As I got older and began driving, Ed would ride in the back seat of my car. I could hear him adjust in his seat, or the occasional arm resting on the door. It sounded as if somebody was just casually riding in the back seat. Once I was driving to a nearby town at night and I got tired. I almost veered off the road, but something shook my shoulder and woke me up. Maybe Ed is evil or just incredibly protective. For example, we had a rabid dog in our neighborhood once that I encountered while on a walk. This dog, foaming at the mouth, came up to me. Once it got close, it's like he got hit hard by something. Not enough to really hurt him, but just enough to get him to go away. He ducked and kind of yelped and scampered off quickly. I could never see the source of what this was. Another occasion, I had gotten mad at Ed for moving some of my things and while going to the fridge during dinner, my whole family watched the light fixture above my head explode and shatter. Right as I said, Ed needs to get the heck out of my life. Luckily, I was the only one hurt and I only needed two stitches. T has some interesting stories as well, as Ed didn't always want her around. Ed only got really scary whenever we moved, or really when I moved. When I packed my things, that's when it got bad. By bad, I mean whenever we were getting ready to move again, things began happening to slow down the process. When we went from Sill to Vilsack, Germany, the power in our house repeatedly went out. Two of my boxes opened and unpacked themselves onto the floor, and our house was broken into and many things were stolen. This would become a pattern every single time we started to move. On top of that, every time we arrived somewhere new, I could feel that Ed wasn't anywhere near us from about three days to two weeks. And then he would show up. It was almost as though he had to do his own traveling to catch up. For whatever reason, Ed left me in March of 2017. I lived in an old house in Montana, in downtown Helena, a very historic mining town. The house was built in 1889. It was a duplex. I rented one unit and I lived there alone for much of the time. I had a boyfriend who I dated for a long time and we lived together for some time. He knew of Ed and while he never wanted to discuss it, he was also not really bothered by it. The day we broke up and the day he moved out and never came back, I sat in the living room crying, and I said out loud to Ed that I needed to be alone. I basically begged him to leave. I heard an odd noise. It was like a choked cry, maybe a cough or a sigh, I couldn't really place it. And then things suddenly felt empty and quiet, like I had more space. I remember never feeling this way except for those short times after a move when Ed wasn't there. That's how I knew Ed had left. Ed has never returned. It's been years now, and part of me still wonders if this terrifying thing will one day come back. I never say his name out loud. I don't bring him up, and no one that knows of him says a thing. We all just know. I lived with this thing for a long, long time. He followed me to basic training too. I often wonder what Ed was. He held power over me, preferred me to treat him in a certain way. If I ever spoke badly of him, he retaliated. Although I only did that by accident a time or two. On other occasions, he protected me. 
I know how crazy all of this sounds. That's why only a handful of people in my personal life ever knew about Ed. All of us still really wonder what in the world he was. I've been dying to get this story off my chest for years to people who don't think I'm crazy, as it's rather maddening. Before I begin, I don't believe in things like Bigfoot, werewolves, ghosts, supernatural or paranormal stuff in general, but that doesn't mean that I'm able to explain what happened this night. This was a long time ago. I was a teenager. My parents were not very strict, so I had a lot of freedom. I had two friends, and they had their own friends as well. And one of my friend's parents owned this huge part of a forest. My friends, their friends, and I went deep into the woods with a bunch of supplies, and we started making our own treehouse and forts. It was a big part of my childhood, building stuff with my friends, and this place became our sanctuary for a long time, where we'd spend a lot of our time away from the adults. This event happened years after we built the place initially, and also after we rebuilt it because one time it got destroyed. But that's another interesting story for a different time. This is the backstory for all of the events that I'm about to recall. One friend and I spent the night at our sanctuary that we had built, which none of us have ever done before. We only hung out there and then went home. We all planned to spend the night together because it would be fun. Most of our friends weren't allowed to spend the night there, though, because of parents and other things, and one chickened out because he was afraid. So it ended up just being me and one other person, my close friend's cousin. We weren't really close at the time, and we fought a lot, but surprisingly we got along well that night. We spent most of the day swinging from trees, climbing them and hanging out on this tire rope swing while talking. It was a normal day. And then we laid down for rest at about 9 p.m. About 10 minutes after laying down in bed in our sleeping bags, talking to each other under our makeshift tents, we heard rustling. I sat up and saw a very tall silhouette of something that looked to be like a human but was transparent. I could see right through it. I squinted and froze, and it very quickly climbed this tall tree and as I was looking at it, it disappeared. I was in complete disbelief and shock. I had no idea what I had just seen, if I had seen it at all or if I had hallucinated. I wasn't scared in the moment, just perplexed. Being young and worried though, I said to my friend that we should leave and not wanting it to hear me, I got close to his ear and just said, there's something in the woods looking at us. After I said that, I saw his facial expression turn to fear, so we got up and started walking down the path out of the woods, calmly. I didn't want to sprint because it might chase, and I also wasn't even sure I'd seen anything. I just didn't want to take any chances. Very shortly after we left, we both got this weird feeling of deja vu and confusion, like we'd been hit with hard drugs or something, except we don't do drugs, and we had only eaten food that we brought from our house. There are also no hallucinogenic plants in our part of the country. Nothing like that. Everything was so slow, and I felt disoriented. But we continued to walk in this direction for quite a while, stumbling in the darkness because of our mental state. I realized that we should have been out of the forest by now. I knew that this was the way out, 110% because I'd been going in and out of this place for years, even in the dark. Yet, I didn't recognize all the trees around us, just the path. It was like our surroundings were changing. My friend randomly yells, yeah, I'm coming, as I'm looking in the opposite direction from him. I turned around, very confused, and asked him why he said that. He said that his mom was calling his name to help lead him out of the forest. I heard nothing. I told him that I didn't hear anything, and he looked at me like I was insane and walked off the path and into the forest. I grabbed his arm and pulled him back, 
because I didn't want him to get lost. That's when my friend sees the transparent thing that I saw earlier, sitting perched on a tree branch in the direction that his mom was calling him from. He points it out to me. Its transparency is almost like a heat wave effect. We stared at it for 10 seconds in total disbelief. It looked like a transparent being, but we were trying to discern if it was something else and we were just imagining it being alive because there was no movement. But then it hunched down like it was trying to stalk or be stealthy. And very quickly, it climbed up a tree a little more and then went to the next one and then the next one getting closer to us. We can't hear it at all. It's completely silent. And its silence was exacerbated by the fact that all the other creatures had also gone completely silent. And it was only in that moment that I had really started to realize that. Not a single bug or animal had made a sound since we started leaving camp. This is when our curiosity turned into fear. And once again, we began to see it move. Once it got above us though, the only thing we could hear was the crunching of the branch as its weight was put down on it. Every little sound that was made was so distinct because it was so quiet and remote. We couldn't see anything because the tops of the trees are so dark. We actually started running, terrified, not worrying about being calm anymore. We heard noises in the trees above us and finally it faded away ahead of us as if it had gone ahead but the sound was a lot quieter than if a normal animal had been running through the treetops. It sounded as if this thing was very light, but it wasn't very small, so that made no sense. We still kept running forward, despite it sounding like it had gone ahead, and we ended up back at the place that we started. Many, many minutes of walking, and we were back at this place after running for like 20 seconds. It was impossible. But instead of staying on the ground, we climbed to the top of the treehouse with our items as quickly as possible and closed the door, wedging a small piece of plywood on it to keep it shut. We heard something climbing up and extremely odd noises as well, almost like the mimicking noises of rain and wind, but there was no water seeping into our treehouse and there would have been had it been raining and it wasn't wet. This persisted for about a minute and then we didn't hear from it again. I'm pretty sure at that point it had left, but we spent the rest of the night there until the sun came up anyway, just in case. When he checked his iPod touch for the first time, right after we closed the door, it was 5 a.m. We started laying on the ground at 9 p.m. Eight hours had passed and what felt to us like no more than 40 minutes of time. Hours after we could start to see the sun through the treehouse slats, we went home. I no longer talked to this friend, but after this incident, we discussed it and we told everything from both of our points of view and it all jived. We randomly brought it up to each other every few months and relived it, making sure that we were still on the same page about what happened and that we both remembered. I never spent the night out there again and I didn't really even let myself stay out there past 5 p.m. for a very long time. In November of 2017, I was in the end stages of my pregnancy. Our apartment was heated by a gas fireplace and stupidly, the carbon monoxide detector was in an adjacent room with the door closed. It wasn't until the door opened that my husband and I were aware that I was slowly being poisoned. I was sent to the hospital. While on oxygen, I went into labor and thus began a very horrible ordeal. I could elaborate, but I'm skipping it for now. Anyway, three things happened. Number one, my daughter was born. Number two, something latched onto me while I was in the ER for the poisoning. And number three, my husband took a job out of state to support us while getting his career going. Week one after leaving the hospital. The whole time I'm in the maternity wing, I'm having issues sleeping. Insomnia is common for me, so I didn't think of it too much. 
However, every time I started to sleep, I would wake up from a panic attack. This went on for the week that I was there and about a week after coming home. Eventually, I was able to start sleeping, but then things started to happen. I lived in the apartment for three years prior with no incidents, but onwards of week two coming home from the hospital, a lot of things started happening. I kept a journal and I've written it out here. So this is exactly what happened and how I felt about it at the time. November 22nd, 2017. Whispering coming from the audio baby monitor. This is a common occurrence from this point forward. December 8th. First unusual cold spot. Living room was always about 20 degrees warmer than the rest of the apartment, but suddenly it was freezing in one spot of the room. Never cold there again. December 11th. The baby mobile's batteries drained rapidly. This also became common. First set of batteries last a month. All following batteries died within 72 hours. Was eventually moved to my mother's house, where the mobile operated as intended. January 3rd, 2018. Never felt comfortable being alone in the house. Felt cold no matter where I was. Started living in my mother's house to avoid being in my apartment. February 17th. Mother's landlord threatens to up my mother's rent if I don't leave. I return home. Was greeted with a horrible stench and was forced to clean my whole house top to bottom to get rid of it. Daughter begins to scream in her sleep. This occurs about once a week. I can't wake her, but she's screaming. Doctors find nothing wrong. April 1st, husband returns home. Everything stops happening. I feel like I'm crazy because no one has witnessed this but me. He gets a job at home. Everything seems fine. We live happily. August 6th, while outside on the balcony, the door handle that I had just used with no problem breaks, trapping me outside. While trying to climb down from the second floor, I fall, break my back, and end up hospitalized. My aunt moves in to help with my daughter while I recover. Months later, my aunt confesses from day one of being there that she felt like somebody was watching her and was often cold. I was drugged up for two months while recovering, so I don't have much to say. October 27th. We decide to move my daughter into her own bedroom before her birthday. We had the baby monitor, a blanket, and a bag sitting on the coffee table when we all stepped outside, my husband, my aunt, my daughter, and I, to see our friend in the parking lot. When we returned, the baby monitor was sitting on the floor, three feet away in an upright position. This is when my husband believed me about what I'd said while he was gone, and my aunt confesses her issues listed above. October 29th, a doll that had been sitting on a shelf in my daughter's room is sitting upright in the middle of the living room the next morning. My daughter could not reach it, nor leave her crib. My aunt was sleeping on the couch and heard nobody in the night. November 2018 to July 2019. I'm grouping this together because there's too much stuff in the journal, but basically the house went haywire. I have several days where multiple entries occur. Thumping, lights flickering, bad odors, cold spots, toys turning on by themselves, objects moving, whispering, and my daughter develops nightmares on an almost nightly basis. March 9th, our friend W comes to visit. In a very disturbing way to greet her, the word hello is written on the bathroom mirror from a marker that originated from a separate room. This isn't her first dealings with hauntings, so she replies with, hello, who are you? Later, it replied with, Rick. June 14th. Our friend L asks to use our apartment to host a party for some MLM she was a part of. 30 plus people show up throughout the night. One, who has never set foot in our apartment prior, commented that the bathroom light kept turning on and off the whole night, even when no one was in there. June 29th. 
my mother and her boyfriend come to visit. Everyone was drinking and goofing off. Suddenly, the boyfriend demands to go home and leaves without explanation. Later, my mother informs me that he saw a black mass floating around the ceiling, hovering around me, and moving like it was pulling something out of me. He convinces my mom to have a cleansing done. July 1st, evening. My mother, with the aid of her boyfriend and guidance from his friend, performed a cleansing, drawing everything out of the main door. My daughter screamed the whole time this was happening, but immediately fell asleep once it was done. The house felt still, like frozen in time until sunrise. July 2nd, morning. A black handprint was found on the roof of the outside stairs. I lived in a multifamily home, and the stairs to the second floor were outside because the second floor is a separate apartment. From then on, we didn't have anything else happen. We moved out in June of 2020. Two months after, my daughter asked me why we no longer lived in the old house. I told her why, and that we weren't moving back there. She replied with, Good. Mr. Black was scary. He wanted to eat my face. I grew up in an apartment complex for the first six years or so. It's been so long that I don't really remember it, but I know that I lived in an apartment complex near Meyer. We ended up moving into my grandmother's house with her after my grandfather passed away, and I remember some disturbances at a young age. The first time I ever had something paranormal happen was when I was helping my mom and grandma clean out my grandpa's old room. So then my mother and I could use it as our room. I was scared to be alone as a kid, so I slept in my mom's room. They had separate rooms. My grandma had converted one of the living rooms into her bedroom. One day, we were taking a break from cleaning the room. We were hanging out in my grandma's room, and I can't remember what it was exactly. Still, my mom asked me to go to my grandpa's room to grab something that she'd forgotten. It may have been a drink, as I walk toward his room, I hear the most ghostly moan I have ever heard in my life. It was almost like something out of Scooby-Doo. I ran back to my mom and grandma, and they said that I was just being silly. The typical answer that a child would always get from adults after telling a story like that. And my mom was an atheist who tried to explain and debunk everything she could. Occasionally, I would hear stuff see shadows, and feel like someone was watching me. Still, I was never genuinely bothered by anything. My grandma would have liked to think that it was my grandpa just messing around, but I was never really sure. I just knew that things were happening that I couldn't explain, and I didn't like it. As a kid, I loved horror games. I loved watching scary movies and stuff like Ghost Hunters, which did scare me and kept me up some nights. Still, it was always interesting to me because I believed my house was haunted, but I liked to pretend that it wasn't so I could sleep at night. My mom died November 5th of 2006, and ever since that day, things got weird, and the feelings of being watched, noises, and shadows increased, but nothing really significant. I thought it was because my grandma had like six cats, so they were probably just messing things up. One night in particular that I remember was when my friend came over to spend the night. We played video games, and he in particular loved to talk to me about his dreams, because they were so creative and vivid that they could have been comic books. Well, we went to sleep, and before that I closed my bedroom door, because one of the cats would always come in the room and wake us up by licking plastic for like an hour straight. Almost suddenly, out of a dead sleep, I woke up. No reason behind it, I just did. I'm drawn to look at the bedroom door as it slowly opens, 
and an almost pitch black cloud hovers into my room, staying close to the ceiling. As that's happening, my friend is yelling in his sleep, no, stop. At this time, not only am I scared beyond belief, but I have the strangest, most eerie feeling that I have ever felt. I was so afraid, but simultaneously so tired that I just covered my face with my blanket. I eventually passed out and woke up the next day. Everything is seemingly normal. I asked my friend about that night and he said he didn't see, feel, or hear anything. When I asked him about his dream, he said, I actually can't remember it. That struck me as absolutely wild because this guy would always tell me about how cool his dreams were. I mean, he remembered all of them. There were other things I can remember. My dad one night said that he was intoxicated and opened his door to go upstairs to grab some food out of the fridge when he said he ran into my mom as he walked out of the door and as he stumbled back and looked, he said nobody was there. But from his face and how sobering of an experience it was, I couldn't see how he would make that up. However, all of us would occasionally hear my mom's voice calling out to us, and I would freeze and look in every direction, trying to find where it came from. Fast forward to about 2013, a year or so before I eventually moved out of the house. My grandmother's health and brain were deteriorating rapidly until she finally called 911 and went to the ER, where she was diagnosed with brain and lung cancer almost identical to what my mom had when she passed. After what seemed to be a month, she passed away. And ever since that day, that house was not the same. It was odd before then, but after that, it went from 20 to 100. Stuff being knocked over, voices echoing from the hallways and basement, loud voices talking from other rooms when you were alone in the house, people coughing right in your ear, shadows walking down the hall, doors being slammed in the basement. The list goes on and on. I had a friend move into my house who always told me that when he went downstairs to shower, somebody would shake the bathroom door handle while he was in there. He said that he would open it multiple times to find nobody on the other side. However, he was still trying to figure out how I was doing it until one day he realized that I wasn't, because I had another friend come over to my house because he wanted help dyeing his hair. The friend who had his hair dyed went downstairs to take a shower, and when he came back upstairs, my buddy and I were playing video games. He walked in and said, okay, how the heck did you guys get up here so fast without making a noise? We were puzzled as heck, until he told us that somebody kept shaking the door handle. My other friend went pale and told him exactly what had been happening to him. At that point, we were all pretty freaked out and left the house for a bit. He stopped coming over as much and honestly, I don't blame him. He vowed to never shower at my home again. Between hearing doors in the basement and seeing shadows, my dad kept telling me that when he was home alone, he would just hear my mom and grandma screaming his name from other parts of the house, which he says drove him back into alcoholism. If you're squeamish about animals, you might want to skip this next sentence. But one morning, I woke up to find my grandma's last cat had died shortly before we moved out. When I say the intensity of these encounters got worse, I mean it. All my friends that came over just said the house did not feel right, and they didn't feel welcome. We would always hear voices or cats meowing, even though by this point all of the cats had passed. I would go into my basement before work and open all of the doors, and when I would get home, I would check to find that pretty much all of the doors were closed when no one could have been in the house. This is all just my perspective. My friends, and roommate especially, have their own crazy stories that still get me to this day, no matter how many times I hear them. Ever since I've moved out and into a new apartment and now a trailer, I have experienced nothing at all 
and it's been a nice change of pace. I honestly hope to never experience anything paranormal ever again. I am not new to the paranormal, and strange things happen to me from time to time. I'm an empath, so I think that makes me more open than most. My earliest experience that I can remember took place when I was about 10 years old. A bit of backstory. When I was eight years old, we moved from Cheshire, England to Secunda in South Africa. It was during the time of apartheid in South Africa in the early 80s. The way of life there was very different to what I had grown up with in rural England. My dad had always wanted to live in the sunshine and he landed a job at Sassel. The company he was working for in Cheshire was laying people off at an ever-increasing pace, as were many other local factories, and I think he was worried about being next. We had been living in Secunda for two years when we moved to Van Nykirk Street a lovely big house that my mother fell in love with. It was the first house we had owned since moving to South Africa. So we packed our meager belongings collected over the last two years and moved from the smaller house Sassel had provided us closer to the center of town. We had a lovely lady who was our nanny and maid named Julie. She had started to work for us about two weeks after we arrived in South Africa and she stayed with us for many years. In those days, it was normal to have help in the house. The houses even came with small bedrooms and a toilet in the back garden, known as a kaya. These rooms were not connected to the main house, so the worker could come and go and have privacy. Many of the local house workers lived in the more rural areas, so they lived in town during the week. Julie moved with us to the new house. She was also thrilled at the move, as her room at the new house was bigger and had a bath with a shower. Julie at this point had worked for us for a few years and took care of myself and my little sister while my mother worked full time at a local hotel. Julie was Zulu. The Zulu tribe are a very superstitious people and to this day make use of a sangoma or a witch doctor to cure illnesses and curse people, paying the sangoma for the privilege. Julie used to tell my sister and I about the bad spirits she believed in and the stories of the Tokoloshi, the evil dwarf devil that used to climb onto young women's beds and have his way with them, making them have kids and then leaving them to raise the spawn. Lovely. To prevent herself from becoming a victim to this creature, she had her bed up on bricks so that he couldn't climb onto it. Most young women of childbearing age did this, at least if they believed in this thing. One morning, she walked into the kitchen looking very shaken. My mother sat her down and gave her a mug of sweet tea and asked her what was wrong. She blurted out that she had had no sleep that night and that evil spirits were haunting this house. My mother pressed her and once she had calmed down, she told my mother the story. The previous night before bed, she was writing a letter to her family by candlelight. Julie always had candles burning, and my mother was very conscious that one day she would burn down the kaya. While she was writing, her candle went out. She assumed it was a breeze, so she got up and put a spare blanket across the bottom of the door. The kaya did not have any windows, and it was made of solid breeze block. So the crack under the door would be the only source for the breeze. She decided to leave the big light on to finish her letter. It was then that she was startled by the flushing of the toilet. It just flushed all by itself. She didn't dare go into the bathroom, but apparently the toilet flushed at least twice an hour all night until about 6 a.m. when it finally stopped. My mother said she would call a plumber to look at the toilet told Julie to take the day off and just sleep. Julie went off to the neighbor's maid's kaya as she did not want to go back to sleep in her own bed. My mother had an emergency plumber out later that day who said there was absolutely nothing wrong with the toilet. 
He said he had no clue how it was even possible that it had flushed by itself. Over the next few days, Julie calmed down enough to move back to her room. The toilet still flushed, and now and then the taps on the bath would turn on by themselves. My mother told Julie that it was probably a plumbing issue, and that it wasn't an ancestor or an angry or evil spirit. All was calm until Julie woke up one morning to find her room wrecked. Her clothes were scattered around, ornaments broken. She had slept through all of it. At first, she suspected her room had been broken into while she slept. But when she went to the door, it was still locked and bolted from the inside. Julie refused to stay there after that and moved a few things into her friend's Kaya next door. About a week later, a large crack appeared in the wall of the main house. My father was concerned that the house would fall on us with the speed that it appeared and called the surveyor to come out and take a look. He determined that the foundations of the house were faulty and that they needed to be stabilized. Basically, a trench was to be dug all the way around the house and concrete poured in to reinforce the house. The work was urgent, so it started the following week. This was when things started to happen in the main house. Shoes would go missing and appear outside, in a trench, as would keys. The fridge blew up, followed closely by the washing machine. Our two dogs would bark at thin air, the hairs on their backs up. The toilet in the main house started flushing by itself too. It was then that my dad joked that we had a ghost with the runs. We heard voices in the garden and would go outside and see nothing. As the trenches were dug deeper, the reason for all the problems came to light. Out of the holes, the workers hauled broken bits of headstone and human bones. In fear, the workers refused to dig more and left the site. The headstones that were pulled up were shiny, smashed, large pieces of marble, not pitted as you would expect them to look having been underground for a while. I personally don't remember there being any writing on them. I remember thinking that they would have been great for tap dancing on until my mother caught me and told me off. The police were called and our house was officially declared a crime scene. The bones were taken away to be tested. The local press heard about the story and it made the front page of the local paper. My sister and I, posing with a large piece of the gravestone near the trenches, graced the covers. The police sent a team to dig up the rest of the garden and locate all that they could. My mother told me that they found pieces of several skeletons. About a month later, we were given the all clear to fill in the foundation trenches and all the gravestones and all of the bones were taken away by the council. The local police chief told us that Secunda was built over three farms. It was built by the factory for the employees. In those days, farms had family burial plots on them and the generations of the families who ran the farm were buried there. When the farms were purchased, they apparently collected up all the graves and buried them in one hole. Our house was built on top of it. The police assured us that the remains they collected were relocated to consecrated ground and buried with respect, and that headstones stating the family names of the original owners of the farms would be put there. After that, the strange happening stopped. I hope those souls found rest in the end. We stayed in the house another year after that, but Julie never did come back to the house. Instead, she left and started her own business with the help of my mother. When we moved, she came back to live with us again, her bed still on bricks. So let me start by saying that my brother and I are extremely experienced desert campers, and we have lived near deserts pretty much our whole lives. I have never in my 20 years of life ever for one second believed in anything paranormal or anything to do with evil spirits. Unlike my brother, who has always sensed presences and been able to see mostly what we call jinn, also known as demons. 
Last night, though, things changed for me, and it marks the last time that we'll be camping alone in the desert. We've always had the same place we like to go whenever we want to camp with minimal effort. Our day started as normal as ever, but as we got closer and closer to our destination, I saw my brother's mood completely shift. When I asked what was wrong, he just shrugged me off and told me to just keep driving. When we arrived, I felt completely fine, but my brother was still unusually quiet. It was around 1 p.m. at that point, and we were planning on leaving at about 12 to 1 in the morning. Because of the heat, we made the terrible decision to set up under a few trees and a source of water, which in the Middle Eastern culture where we live is where the jinns live at night. Not that I believed in that at the time, of course. However, we still set up our camp and continued on as normal. Now, my brother always says that when he feels a presence, or several in this case, he gets extremely unlucky. First, he almost dropped a box of coals on his foot. Then he spilled an entire bottle of coke on his phone. Then he dropped it into the sand and proceeded to smash his elbow on the edge of the chair he was sitting on. His elbow is now very swollen. And last, but certainly not least, when he was looking through one of our boxes, he felt something cold and sharp right against his arm. He realized it was an unsheathed knife, which we packed with its case the previous night before. And later he said that it felt like something had pushed his hand into it, right where his veins are. All of these events consecutively occurred within a matter of a few hours, which made us both uneasy, and I, for the life of me, could not figure out why he was suddenly so unlucky. As I was starting to question his clumsiness, a random couple appeared out of nowhere, informing us that they were stuck in the sand and needed help. We drive a land cruiser and they had a Nissan Altima, so we didn't expect to encounter as many issues as we did. We first dug them out without any issues, but as we pushed them out of the sand, it got stuck again. If you know anything about dune bashing or desert camping, then you understand the physics behind how wheels get stuck in sand, and the way this Nissan was stuck was incredibly unusual. It was literally stuck somewhere with plenty of space available for grip, and later my brother said that as we were digging them out of the sand, that's when he really started to feel like an evil presence was around us. But he didn't want to say anything and ruin the trip and freak me out. We ended up having to tow them out of the sand, which again was much harder than it should have been. First, our tow strap broke off of their bumper. The tow strap cost $200 and was fine, but their bumper was slightly damaged. Then we almost got stuck ourselves in a 20 minute job that took more like 90 which again was extremely unusual, and with hindsight just the beginning of all the crap to come. When we came back to our camp, we noticed how everything around us had gotten unusually quiet. The area we were in has hundreds of birds around, and as far as we have seen, three cats who sometimes pay us a visit. But there wasn't a single noise at all, other than our fire, which was dying out unusually quickly. It had gotten dark so fast that we had to scramble to build a fire to cook our dinner before we were asked to help the couple. And I had noticed the silence, but it didn't bother me. My brother suddenly grabbed my hand as we were sitting down to eat and said with clear fear in his voice that we should get going as quickly as possible, that he didn't feel safe. To ease both of our minds, we prayed. We are both Christian, so... Of course, we thought it would help, but I think it accelerated everything that happened and just made whatever was there angry. We quickly finished our dinner and me being the skeptic, I was completely fine staying there, but I wanted to humor my brother. But that's when I started getting the nagging feeling that it was time to pack up and leave. It hit me like a wave and I was quite taken aback by the feeling. So I voiced it to my brother and he agreed that we should pack up right away and leave. We started packing up at a normal pace, like we were just tired and wanted to go. 
and that's when we heard a sound very close to us, on the opposite side of the pond, which wasn't that big, that I could only describe as the sound of death itself. It seemed to go on for several minutes, and when I say that we looked at each other in absolute fear, I genuinely mean it. I was about to have a heart attack right then and there. At that point, after being frozen for a few minutes, and quite reasonably so, after hearing that bellowing screech so close to us, we turned on the car, drove it back so we could see better with the headlamps, and just started throwing everything into the car without much care, but with a whole lot of urgency. After the screaming, everything hit the fan. First it was the sound of twigs snapping and footsteps all around us. Then it was the shadows behind the trees. I tried everything to get those shadows to change shape. Walking around the trees and moving lights, but nothing. It looked like there were people just staring at us the whole time. You could really feel it too. We genuinely felt like we were not alone and that we weren't with friendly entities either. We also noticed that all three cats were huddled right behind our car, away from the trees. So they were not the ones snapping the twigs. At that moment, I was really hoping they were going to move so I could get us out of there safely. And thankfully, when we slowly started to reverse, they took a hint. But they looked absolutely terrified and were just staring at the trees too. It felt like whatever was there was getting closer. I've never felt anything like it. It was a gut feeling. It was just one of those natural instincts you can't ignore. Thankfully, we were able to pack up quickly. Our tent was very close to the trees though, so that was a nerve wracking experience. And while we were packing, it was still very silent. It's very normal for the birds around that area to continue making sounds until two or three in the morning. And at this point, it was about 8 p.m., so highly unusual. I personally think I was most terrified as I was driving back onto the main dirt path to leave the desert. I know cars very well. I know how they drive in the sand. And I know our car especially well, because we've had it for so long. I could instantly tell that the steering was off and completely fighting against me. This fixed itself the second we were on the highway. The sounds of twigs snapping was still all around us, and it was loud enough to be heard over the sound of the car. On the path was what seemed like every bird in the area, just standing there and staring at us until we got close enough to force them to walk, not even fly, away. At one point, my brother just grabbed my shoulder and told me very sternly to just keep looking in front of me and under no circumstances to look through his window. It was the tone of voice that told me to listen to him for the love of God. We were in a part of the desert where we had to pretty much drive through the whole of the accessible areas to get onto the highway again, and there wasn't a single person around us. The only thing we saw was a very clearly abandoned Toyota, positioned behind a small dune and hidden by the trees but was far enough from our campsite to easily rule out as the source of the original screech. The worst thing I saw as we were closing to the exit was that we saw in the middle of the path, staring directly at us, a deer. A deer. I have only seen one deer in 16 years of living here, and that was in someone's garden as a pet. It's safe to say that I was in complete shock the deer was just not moving at all until I got close enough that we could practically smell the thing before it slowly walked off the path while looking right at us. We quickly moved past the deer and again my brother, with a grasp of my shoulder and a stern voice, said to keep my eyes right on the road. I asked him later as we got onto the highway what it was that he kept seeing and he very reluctantly told me that he kept seeing large figures around us any time we went through a bend, and they were all either pointing right at us or ahead of us. I'm glad he didn't tell me at the time because I probably would have crapped myself. We still hadn't encountered anyone, but we still very clearly heard sounds all around us. 
And again, not the usual bird or cat, but big, unrelenting sounds. When I saw the exit, I was as happy as I have ever been. But that quickly faded when once again, we saw another deer standing right in the middle of the road, slowly walking away and looking right at us. But this time, it didn't really look like a deer. It was more like a kangaroo mixed with a deer. And its eyes were milky. It looked rotten and horrible. I didn't much care. I just stepped on the gas. And fortunately, it got out of the way in time. When you exit the desert, you can either turn right onto a long stretch of highway, or you can go left and go through a small town, then take the back streets to a parallel highway. As I was about to turn right, my brother once again, with that same tone of voice, said to go to the town. Later, he said once again that he saw a line of figures pointing ahead of us, so if we would have gone the other way, we probably wouldn't have made it home in one piece. Thankfully, as we made it farther and farther away and closer to our home, the gut feeling of being watched was going away. And of course, having never experienced something like this before, I was distraught and wanted to talk about it. My brother told me as we were going home that because we were alone, the djinn wanted to mess with us, that they wanted to scare us and most likely cause us harm. And that the way they get you into such rural places is to force you to stop and then do whatever they want, which makes sense as to why there were so many animals blocking our path. He also said that they caused bad luck, and he could feel them the second we entered the desert, which explains his clumsiness all day, and the car that got stuck in such an unusual manner. Because he's my younger brother by three years, any time he had ever told me about this sort of thing before, I always just dismissed it as him scaring himself. I can excuse the sounds we heard and the shadows we saw last night. I can excuse the gut feeling as just being scared, but I cannot excuse the two deer we saw staring right at us, and I cannot excuse the car just randomly fighting against me as I was driving. The deer completely freaked me out, as did the tone of my brother's voice. It's safe to say we're not going camping there again, and it's also safe to say that I will never dismiss my brother when it comes to this kind of thing again. I'm so thankful to God that he was there and that we made it home safely. Not Deer For my college screenwriting class, we were split into groups four students each for a group project. The assignment was to select a myth or legend to base a 10 to 15 page screenplay on. My group thought it would be interesting to choose a cryptid for the project rather than a well-known historical myth or legend. Our teacher cleared us for the idea and we started brainstorming. Of course, we didn't want to do the most well-known cryptids like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot so we started looking up some lesser known ones. One of the ones that somebody pitched was known as the Knot Deer, in some cases the Night Deer. According to people's stories, it looked almost exactly like a large deer, but something felt horribly off. Only when they drove away did they realize what was specifically wrong about it. Still, even before they understood exactly what was going on, Every story mentioned the overwhelming sense of wrongness. Quoting someone else's personal account, quote, It was a deer in the way that a graveyard is a playground. You can treat it as such, I guess, but it won't feel the same. End quote. Lo and behold, after a bit of research, I found out it was located in North Carolina. Not only that, but it was just over an hour away. Just about every written or publicized story of the Knot Deer supposedly took place in Boone, North Carolina and its surrounding areas. I informed the group of what I had discovered and, being spontaneous as I am, 
told him I would be driving out to the location that very night. I figured I probably wouldn't come across anything, even though I was legitimately curious. At the very least, it was something interesting to do, and I'd be able to accurately describe the location and ambience of the area to the main screenwriter. I wasn't able to convince the other three members of my group to go with me. They all had their legitimate reasons, and since I made the decision to go so suddenly, I understood why none of them wanted to go with me on the trip. Still, I had nothing else to do that night, and I had been itching for more travel ever since the entire pandemic started. I filled my roommate in on everything and asked if he wanted to go with me. At first, he told me that he would just consider it, but as I was getting ready to go, he told me that he had decided to tag along. One of his main reasons for doing so was that he felt like he had to go with me. I shrugged it off, not thinking much of what he said. After filling up my car with some extra gas and buying a couple of snacks for the road, I plugged Boone, North Carolina into my GPS, and I headed out. My roommate and I were pretty relaxed for the majority of the ride there. We joked around, listened to all sorts of music through the radio and CD player, and had some of whatever snacks we had bought earlier. Eventually, we got close to Boone. That's when we started to feel like something was off. It wasn't a feeling strong enough to make us want to turn around, but it was worth mentioning to each other. When we got into the city, it was just about what we imagined. Gas stations, car dealerships, dollar stores, and small cafes. All of them were closed at the time, with our arrival in Boone being at around 9.10 p.m., but all of them were well lit and unintimidating. My roommate told me that we should probably head back at about 9.30, and that he would let me know when that time came around. I agreed with him since I didn't want to spend too long searching for an experience. Needless to say, when we didn't come across anything by 9.30, he decided to let us keep going for another half hour. The clock in my car's dash had been broken for a while now, and I couldn't look at my phone while I was driving, so I was totally reliant on him for the time. Had I known that we were going to be driving in the area past 9.30, I probably would have mentioned it and turned around sooner. Had I done that, I would have completely missed the experience we ended up having. I'm still unsure whether or not that would have been a good thing. We ended up in Tennessee by 9.50. That's when things started to get really bad. At this point, we rarely came across any other cars on the highway. We took the first exit we saw and ended up driving along more mountainous, forested roads. This meant that there were lots of tall, dark trees, almost no streetlights, and twisting roads that forced you to slow down. My roommate said he started to feel bad about the whole situation, and I agreed wholeheartedly. Still, there was nowhere to turn, so we continued going straight, since that was really the only option for the time being. A few different times, we got a serious sense of dread, but usually that feeling disappeared by the time we got onto the next section of the road. There were a couple of times that the both of us had started to tear up, not because we were sad or upset, but because it felt so wrong to be there, like it was somewhere we were not supposed to be. The feeling of dread was very particular too, it wasn't feeling bad in the sense of depression or anxiety. The best way to describe it is just that sense of wrongness. It came in waves, not sticking around for a long time, but not going away entirely either. By this point, my GPS had stopped working entirely. Both my roommate's phone and my phone said that they had full bars, but mine simply refused to connect to anything. Luckily, his GPS still worked fine, so he plugged in the directions for home. It continued taking us down that road for a while longer. The area started to become much more forested as we went on, and the road started to twist and turn much more than it had before. Basically, we had come across the exact area where you would expect a monster to be. 
We started to feel really, really bad. I don't think I can express the feeling well enough with words, but it was the worst we had felt so far. But we knew something wasn't right. We both felt like we just weren't supposed to be there, and we felt like we had to get out. Since my roommate started getting truly spooked, that put me on edge even more, since he never gets scared by anything. There wasn't much we could do about it, though. The GPS still wanted us to follow the road, so we both awaited its next directions, eager to get on the highway back home. The sense of dread still came and went with every other segment of road that we crossed. Eventually, the GPS wanted us to turn. My roommate told me to turn right on that road. I knew he meant to turn right onto the road and follow it straight ahead, but for some reason I figured we should just turn around and backtrack. I started slowing down, and we both started to feel the absolute worst we'd ever felt. Like, things are very wrong and something was about to happen. My roommate said that my eyes were glazed over, and I kept saying something along the lines of, I just need to turn around right here. Over and over. The more I said it, the quieter I got. Until it was just, I just need to turn around right here. Keep in mind that I am normally a fairly loud person, and I had been loud the entire drive up until this point. I pulled off onto a gravel dip on the side of the road. Along the gravel dip was a thin chicken wire fence, shiny and silver. Back on the road behind us was a wall of dirt and rock. We were surrounded by tall, dark trees that blocked most of the night sky. Even with the headlights on, it was very difficult to see far ahead. He said very forcefully that we couldn't stop and we needed to keep going because he felt really bad, but I wasn't listening to him. I wasn't quite processing what he was saying, and for some reason I was having a difficult time hearing him at all. After he realized he wasn't getting through to me, he broke into a literal shout and told me that we had to get out of there. We could not stop, and we could not go back that way. It took him using his road rage voice to snap me out of it and get me to speed down the road. The only word I can use to describe what I felt in that moment was absolute terror. Even as I was slowing down, I felt it get worse and worse until it was almost overwhelming. I only realized that after we had gotten out of the area and back onto the highway. As we passed through the area and started getting into the city again, the looming sense of dread started to fade away. By the time we got onto the main highway, we felt safe again. But in the moment that I pulled off onto the gravel dip on the road, where I had almost stopped the car entirely, that was the most terrifying experience I've ever had in my life. I would bet my life savings that had we turned around, we would have seen something that we never wanted to. Both of us admitted to tearing up as we drove off from that spot. I was much more shaken up than my roommate was, and it took me a little while to fully process what had actually happened. I think it's safe to say that even though I didn't explicitly see anything for myself, I found exactly what I was looking for. Back in the mid-80s, we were traveling through Tennessee on our way to visit friends in Texas. My mom was driving. I, a teenager at the time, was navigating by using a paper map. These were the days before cell phones and GPS. We made it past Nashville on I-40 pretty late at night. We're maybe an hour outside the city. I'm charting our progress, old school with pencil and paper. We pass an exit, and I mark it. A minute later, a summer thunderstorm hit. Visibility dropped to nothing. All traffic slowed to a crawl, and we decided to pull off at the next possible exit and just find a motel to spend the night, because there was no way we were making any significant progress in this storm. Slow, white-knuckle driving ensued. 
An exit loomed up on the right. No signage that we could see in the downpour, but we took it. At the top of the exit ramp, we turned right toward a brilliantly lit up gas station. The left turn was onto an overpass crossing I-40. No lights from that side of the interstate. At this point, we were on a dinky little road. To our right, there was the gas station, which we were rapidly passing. To our left and back behind some trees was what looked like a motel, but you couldn't make out the sign very well in the rain. We drove past the gas station before we realized that the road just ended up ahead. The gas station was the only building on this side of the road. It went from one and a half lane paved to one lane gravel. We could only see a short way ahead. Tire track, dirt, and grass all over the space of maybe 20 yards. Now we were past the gas station. There was only one turnoff from this road and it was on our left. We took it and tried to back up and turn around to get back to the gas station. Unfortunately, the paved slope of that narrow driveway sized turnoff led steeply down into a huge mud pit. No backing up off of it. Mom put the car into low gear, turned hard, and headed back for the gravel road through the mud. We almost made it out, but we got mired. The front passenger tire caught on the corner of an exposed concrete storm drain, maybe three feet from the road. We got out of the car and into the rain and mud, and we walked to the gas station. The place was spotless, super bright, and had two young men behind the counter. What sounded like one of Elvis's songs was playing on the radio inside. The attendant's first words on seeing us walk in were, did you get stuck in the mud? And they said it super enthusiastically, like a way too happy greeting, like a Disney staffer welcoming you as you walked into the park for the very first time, that kind of happy to see you. Also, these night shift clerks were dressed in suits that looked about 30 years out of date. The whole place was kind of creepy. We admitted we had gotten stuck and we asked if there was a tow truck company we could call. They pulled out a phone book, again, this was before cell phones or the internet, and started talking to each other. It wasn't a Nashville phone book though, some little township, a population that couldn't have been more than a hundred from the handful of white pages. But the book had dozens of yellow pages of nothing but tow truck companies. If you're unfamiliar, white pages were people and yellow pages were companies. There were literally hundreds of tow truck companies for this town too small to appear on the map. The attendants had a friendly debate about whose turn it was to come get a car out of the mud. They decided to skip over the company who was theoretically next because there had been some sort of problem with them the last time they were called out for a tow. They made a decision about who to call and let mom use their phone. More weirdness, creepiness intensifies. It was still storming, though less now. The tow truck arrived maybe five minutes later. Brilliant white, not a speck of dirt or a drop of mud on it. I have seen vehicles in a new car lot that were dirtier than this thing. Two young men in the truck were also dressed like they had just stepped out of the 1950s. Freshly polished patent leather shoes without a drop of mud on them. Starched white shirts, paper hats, bow ties. We hiked across the street and next door to the mud pit where our car was stuck. The tow truck guys were horrified. They almost got out of the mud, they said to each other repeatedly. The subtext from their shocked tone was clear. No one must ever, ever escape the mud pit on their own. These people would have to take some sort of action to make sure no one else got as close as we did to escaping. They towed our car out. Easy peasy. We all went back to the gas station and paid the tow truck drivers for their service. The drivers let the gas station attendants know that my mom and I almost made it out of the mud on our own. The attendants were horrified and shocked by this. By now we were getting really big uncanny valley vibes from all four of these men. And not just them. The whole place was too clean, too brightly lit, too strangely out of date. 
It was a surprisingly good facsimile of a small town rest stop populated by real humans, just in the wrong decade. Almost perfect, in fact. We were definitely in creepy town. If these guys were human, there was something seriously off about them. If they weren't, they almost had their ordinary human act down pat. The tow truck drivers went off and the attendants turned all super friendly again and asked my mom and I if we were going to stay the night in the hotel across the road. They got so excited that we might spend the night here. They talked about how great it was. Mom and I made non-committal noises and returned to the car. On our way back, I said, we are not staying here tonight. She agreed wholeheartedly. The rain is finally letting up, so we were really excited to get back out on the road. We drove straight back out onto the interstate. Didn't pass go, didn't collect $200, didn't even go near the Creepy Towns Motel parking lot. We drove down I-40 to the very next exit. It was maybe five miles. We pulled off and spent the night in a kind of crappy but refreshingly ordinary motel. At least it's not the Bates Motel, we joked. The rest of the trip went really well. Several days later, on the way home, my mom and I decided we really wanted to see this creepy town in the light of day. I mean, it couldn't have been that weird, could it? Heading back up I-40, we passed the exit where we actually did spend the night on the way down. We could see the hotel, the exit number matched the notes, everything. Then we started looking for the next exit, the exit to creepy town. Should have been about five miles along with an overpass. Five miles pass. No exit. No overpass. Five more miles later before we find the next exit off of I-40. It's the one I had marked as being right before the storm first hit. In short, creepy town doesn't exist. The exit doesn't exist. The gas station doesn't exist. I've traveled I-40 many times since, often remarking, hey, there's that non-existent exit where the weird storm hit and we went to Creepy Town. And then there's the exit where we actually did spend the night. To this day, and we've looked multiple times, we have never found Creepy Town exit. In fact, we've never found a single exit between those two points ever again. I have no explanation. Thank <laughs> you.